cure for this blasted pestilence. I need only a handful of live subjects to complete my research. The Plague Doctor's emphatic pleas fell on deaf ears, as a stone-faced researcher took notes on his latest pontifications. The Doctor, whom these clods had reduced so rudely to a mere number, SCP-049, banged his gloved fist up against the wall. And to think he once thought of these men as intellectual equals, fellow travelers on the road to scientific enlightenment. What a positively sick joke. Before the doctor got another chance to appeal for his right to experiment, the researcher left him alone once more. A truly sad state of affairs. Nobody appreciated a true scientist in this day and age. It was sure to be another day of languishing alone in this cell, wishing he had the capacity to do more. So he was surprised as anyone when the alarm started going off, and the door of his cell swung open automatically. The Plague Doctor stepped out of his cell and into the hall, where many other humanoid anomalies were roaming, confused as to why they'd been suddenly released, what was happening. As it turned out, what was happening was one of the most brutal Chaos Insurgency raids the staff of Site-19 had ever seen. It had been planned immaculately. You see, guards rotate semi-regularly at Site-19 due to the high-pressure nature of the job. Lots of deaths and mental breakdowns, as you probably correctly predicted. Even the administrative staff of the SCP Foundation are only human. Well, mostly anyway. So they're not immune to little oversights here and there. And it's in those oversights that expertly trained Chaos Insurgency infiltration agents make their living. No less than 15 of them had been working undercover in Site-19 for just over two weeks. And they did a fine job of lowering the metaphorical drawbridge for a heavily armed invasion force. The guards who weren't plants were quickly murdered by the infiltrators, and even some of the on-site task forces were quickly overwhelmed and gunned down by the high-precision rifles of the Chaos Insurgency's finest. While the frontliners were distracted by the sudden assault, the infiltrators found their way to the site's security control room and massacred everyone inside. Opening every single door in the site was as simple as putting in a few stolen key codes and flipping a few carefully remembered switches. Consequently, while Foundation agents and Chaos Insurgency mercenaries clashed sabers, high-priority anomalies like SCP-049 simply wandered the facility, watching the calamity unfold within. The Foundation was beset on all sides, shot at by heavily armed maniacs, and attacked from within by the numerous roaming anomalous entities that were eager to get their hands on Foundation personnel. Definitely not an ideal situation, to say the least. The Plague Doctor only had one thing on his mind, though. Hmm, this definitely won't do my research any good. Unless I can escape and find my way to a suitable laboratory. Oh, now there's an idea. But his scientific fantasies were soon interrupted by a Chaos Insurgency soldier swinging the butt of his M4 carbine into his avian exoskull with a supremely unpleasant crack. The doctor was dazed by it momentarily, the pain coming at him like a thunderclap, but the insurgent never got the chance to take another swing. Before the insurgent could do anything, the plague doctor lunged out with practice speed, grasping him by the throat. Immediately everything went black, and the insurgent's limp corpse collapsed to the ground. Serves him right, the doctor internally mused. Soldiers attacking medics is violating even the most basic rules of gentlemanly warfare. Then another flash of immense pain, as a different rifle butt collided with the back of his head. The doctor fell to one knee, feeling dizzy, but before he could retaliate, he felt the two sharp prongs of a cattle prod pressing up against his neck. The sudden rush of electricity surged through his neck, sending his muscles into a wave of involuntary spasms. The insurgents crowding around him chimed in with their own agonizing cattle prods, relentlessly shocking him until the flashes of white-hot pain soon became an oppressive blanket of total dark. Even on his most cantankerous days, the SCP Foundation had never treated him like this. When he eventually came to, he was still in darkness, standing upright, with high-tech shackles holding every limb in place. It was beyond uncomfortable for the poor Plague Doctor, but it succeeded in the task of keeping him under control. He couldn't move an inch. There were muffled voices beyond the dark, beyond the confines of this new containment, the modulated gas mask voices of insurgents and something else, faintly accented, oddly familiar, 
but he couldn't quite place it. Soon the voices were replaced by another sound, the grinding of crowbars levering nails out of cheap wood. With a creaking tumble, a rectangle of bright light opened up in front of him, populated by a number of silhouettes. On either side were chaos insurgents in familiar tactical garb, and in between them stood a tall, well-groomed man with an expensive-looking purple smoking jacket and a pencil mustache. For a few fractions of a second, his face was a portrait of excitement. But as he took in the sight of the plague doctor standing before him, all the joy drained from his snooty countenance. What the hell am I looking at here? The man in the smoking jacket said. The doctor, indignant at such a response from the man who'd presumably ordered his assault, rasped, A man of science, good sir. The man in the smoking jacket ignored him and continued to berate the chaos insurgents with an odd level of confidence for someone reprimanding trained, cold-blooded killers. I wanted SCP-650, the startling statue, not this clownish Ren Faire cosplayer. What the hell did I pay you ruffians for? I was told you chaos insurgents were the very best at this, and for your hefty price, I expect excellence. The rant continued much like this, leaving everyone in attendance, the insurgents, the plague doctor, feeling thoroughly exhausted by him and unable to do anything about it. You see, this wasn't just any chaos insurgency client, your average tin pot dictator or arms dealer, you know the type. This was the one and only Pascal Leggett, one of the most famous or rather infamous anart collectors in the game. He'd been a founding person of interest for years due to his dealings with the Chaos Insurgency and Marshall Carter and Dark Limited, all to the end of expanding his Anart collection, but his vast wealth and connections had always shielded him from Foundation probes. For those unfamiliar with the subculture, Anart, short for anomalous art, is exactly what it sounds like. Artistic projects with anomalous properties to give it that extra kick. One of the most popular groups of interest dealing in Anart is the iconic Are We Cool Yet? which, incidentally, had recently excommunicated Pascal Leggett for being an exceedingly wealthy, uptight square who really didn't represent the Collective's rebellious ethos. And considering his response was to pay the Chaos Insurgency to raid Site-19 for a few pieces for his own private collection, costing him millions of dollars and both groups many lives, it was safe to say he wasn't taking it well. Look, we got you that other statue and that thing killed four of our best guys, so how about we just call it even? said one of the insurgents. I'm sure you can have fun with bird brain here too. Pascal tutted and reluctantly dismissed the hired guns. Having the plague doctor here definitely wasn't ideal, especially considering he wanted to host the ultimate Anart exhibition to put Are We Cool Yet Worthless Somme Nu Devernu Magnifique to shame. But he would make do with what he had. Perhaps he could say that 049 was a commentary on the ever-present nature of disease in mankind's life and our forever archaic approach to it. Yes. Yes, that would do nicely. Needless to say, the Plague Doctor was infuriated by all this. The violence against his person, the kidnapping, the disrespect, and most of all, the interruption to his precious research, especially considering how close he'd gotten to finding a cure for the pestilence. But instead, he was soon spirited by a legion of heavily armed goons from his wooden box to a glass one in one of Leggett's many opulent hallways. There were other glass cases on either side of him, and more on the other side of the hall, all too reinforced for the Plague Doctor to even smash through it on his own. Damn it. Leggett's own private Anart exhibition, probably wedged between his oversized dining room and his jewel-encrusted crapper. Occasionally, Pascal himself would jaunt down the hallway to gaze upon his new, stolen Anart pieces, and of course the Plague Doctor would try his best to reason with him. I am a patient man, Monsieur Leggett, but this is simply barbaric. By what right do you imprison me here? Is your intention to deprive the world, the entire human race, of my valuable medical breakthroughs? Could you live with that on your conscience, good sir? There was never any meaningful response. The Plague Doctor soon learned that Pascal Leggett didn't like his art interactive. It was simply meant to languish away in a glass box, being watched, being passively looked at. Those chaos insurgency louts hadn't even bothered to bring his notebook or medical bag so he was without the tools to even perform his experiments. As loathed as he was to admit it, this was even worse than being locked up by the SCP Foundation. But all this wasn't entirely unfamiliar. There was something in the glass box across from the Plague Doctor that he vaguely recognized back from Site-19. He'd never seen it up close, but he'd heard researchers speaking about it, and even seen a few pictures. 
and such a strange construction it was. A peculiar haphazard sculpture made from concrete, rebar, and spray paint. Quite ugly, in this humble doctor's opinion, but there was something oddly entrancing about it. And for reasons beyond the doctor's recollection, four of Leggett's men stood around the glass box in where it was being stored, always watching. The men were frequently switched in and out, as though they were watching in shifts, always fixing their gaze on its peculiar, malformed body. Maybe it was all the electrical shocks and knocks to the head, but he just couldn't remember why Pascal was having the piece so carefully observed. But he knew on some primal level that the secret to this would perhaps be the key to his own escape, if only he could remember. Still, time passed. Pascal drifted in and out, sometimes with guests. The plague doctor had learned not to speak. These animals could not be reasoned with. As a scientist, he would instead carefully observe until his observations bore fruit. He noticed that Pascal's guests, all people who looked equally as wealthy and pompous as Pascal himself, all seemed to look right over him, and instead focus on the ugly statue across the hall, still forever observed by any four of Pascal's men. Some of them looked actively nervous, just being in its presence. Curious, the plague doctor made a mental note of this, just as he did when Pascal gave his guests a reassuring pat on the shoulder and told them, Please calm yourself. It's harmless while my personnel are keeping an eye on it. Little by little, the plague doctor's memories of his infamous neighbor had begun to return. He knew what he must do to escape. Now all he needed to do was wait for the perfect moment. Soon enough, Pascal's mansion was filled with a bevy of Anart snobs from hither and yarn, a private soiree to show off his new collection. They wandered the halls in three-piece tuxedos and designer ballroom dresses, sipping champagne from imported crystal. All such lovely, refined, high-society people, and if the good doctor's plan went off as he intended, they would all be such lovely, refined, high-society corpses. The plague doctor waited until, mercifully, he and the four members of personnel watching the sculpture were the only ones left in the hallway. He'd been so good, so patient, that none of the men guarding the sculpture at present had ever heard him make a noise. He was so invisible to them that, in all likelihood, they probably didn't even notice he could make a sound. And that worked for his purposes just fine. Though in any case, if he wanted this to work, he would need to time his plan perfectly. Even a fraction of a second out of place and the whole thing would have dire consequences. Still, the doctor was still a Frenchman at heart. And as a Frenchman, he knew he would rather die nobly in the process of escape than remain captured by this worthless buffoon. He'd be sure to take as many of these men down with him in the process as he was able. The plague doctor exhaled deeply, drawing a lungful of air, then bellowed as loud as he possibly could. The sudden, unexpected noise was so shocking that it jogged the four watchers almost reflexively to turn and look at him. And in the split second that they did, the plague doctor closed his eyes. In the dark, time seemed to move slower. Perhaps due to the doctor's keen focus, cultivated over many a century, he listened carefully to the sequence of sounds. Glass shattering, four choked gasps in sequence, four brutal crunches, then, nanoseconds later, more glass shattering. The plague doctor's eyes snapped open just in time. Just as predicted, the sculpture, being entirely unobserved, had smashed through its glass case, murdering all four members of personnel by snapping their necks, and then smashed through his own glass case to do the same to him. The plague doctor had cut it so close, in fact, that he opened his eyes to the face of the sculpture staring into his own, its concrete limbs wrapped around his neck. Very good timing indeed. With a sigh of relief, the plague doctor slipped out of the sculpture's concrete grasp and back down the hallway, keeping his gaze fixed on the sculpture the entire time. He had heard it decimate Pascal's men. He certainly didn't fancy undergoing the same fate. The second the plague doctor backed around the corner, rendering the sculpture, or as the SCP Foundation called it, SCP-173 out of sight, he could hear terrified screaming coming from the other end of the hall. He was not a sadistic man, but the plague doctor would be lying if he told you he didn't take just a little bit of pleasure in hearing that sound. Somewhere else in the vast mansion of Pascal Leggett, the sculpture was slaughtering its way through servants and party guests, while the plague doctor searched for some kind of exit. Anyone who dared get in his way was given a swift and merciless touch of death, sending their body unceremoniously to the ground. 
anyone in his way was preventing him from finding a cure for the pestilence, and thus endangering countless lives. It was, of course, regrettable to have to kill anyone, but some sacrifices must be made for the greater good of mankind. Well, it's not necessarily always regrettable, per se. On his way out while the murderous rampage of SCP-173 seemed to distract anyone of note, the Plague Doctor just so happened to encounter a fleeing Pascal Leggett, hoping to find some kind of escape himself. It seemed that now fate was on his side once more. To have his jailer right here in the palm of his hand would be such a perfect parting gift. Funnily enough, Pascal was far more talkative to him now. He rattled off a rapid-fire series of threats, bribes, and pleas, claiming in the end that he never meant any harm. He was the one who freed the Plague Doctor from the SCP Foundation. They were on the same side here. All this was for the art. No offense was ever intended. Pascal Leggett simply lived for art. Then die for it, good sir, the Plague Doctor said. And with a single touch, Pascal's eyes rolled up into the back of his head, and he fell to the ground, dead. It was one of the few non-scientific deaths that he felt truly no guilt for. After some time searching, the screams around the rest of the mansion eventually went silent. That did wonders for his focus. It didn't take long for the Plague Doctor to locate an exit, a fine mahogany door with elaborate adornments befitting a man as gaudy as Pascal and began strolling towards it, his chest swollen with pride and a sense of accomplishment. Then he blinked, and a few feet in front of him stood the sculpture. It was there so suddenly that the Plague Doctor fell backwards in shock, but he devoted everything to keeping an eye on that monstrosity. With everyone else in the mansion presumably dead at this point, it had now come back for him. It stood there staring silently, ready to exact the terrible price for freeing it as soon as the Doctor dared to blink. The Plague Doctor began crawling backwards down the hall, just wanting to put some distance between himself and the sculpture. As the seconds passed, he could feel his eyes drying out until the inevitable blink. The sculpture was standing right in front of him now, gazing down, almost mocking. It had closed the distance so quickly. If the Plague Doctor blinked again, he was sure that his eyes would never open again. All it had to do was wait as the seconds passed, and the Doctor began to feel his eyes drying up again. That subtle sting quickly grew into a nagging pain that could not be denied. Sooner or later, he was going to have to. Bang! The front door flew open, and in an instant the hallway was filled with heavily armed troops, all wearing the familiar black and gray of the SCP Foundation. The Plague Doctor had never been so relieved to see the organization that had kept him locked up for so many decades. For once, they'd saved him from something even worse. Of course, the sculpture didn't say anything. But the disappointment of losing that one more victim seemed to radiate off of it like a lingering bad smell. The Plague Doctor willingly gave himself up, and heavy machinery was brought in to pick up SCP-173, with the help of the iPods to make sure it didn't try any funny business in transit. Pascal had gotten away with his shady dealings for years, but the brazen attack he funded against Site-19 was now enough for the Foundation to track him down. When his corpse was found in the halls of his own home with no obvious cause of death, we can happily tell you that nobody was disappointed. By the evening, the Plague Doctor was happy to be back in his cell. His research could continue here, and in time he knew that the personnel of the SCP Foundation would listen to reason and comply with his demands. After all, science marches on, regardless of who chooses to march with it. But he would forever feel a little nervous in Site-19 after that, knowing the concrete monster he was sharing the building with. He hoped that if ever there was another containment breach involving that thing, that it didn't feel like paying him a visit for old time's sake. It's the late 90s, and an Air Canada flight experiences severe malfunctions while traveling from London to Vancouver. The pilots are unable to do anything and the plane crashes into the woods of northern Alberta. The crash was devastating. Only 10 of the nearly 300 people on board are alive. And even though they survived the initial disaster, their battle for life has only just begun. It's late autumn in northern Canada, and there's no telling when help will arrive, if at all. If the survivors want to make it through the night, they need to find shelter, and fast. As they trudge through the freezing woods, the group finds a path that looks like it might lead them to civilization. After all, if there was a path in the woods, 
That meant they were probably in a national park. And if they were in a national park, there had to be a ranger station around somewhere where they could warm up and call for help. They didn't have many other options, so they followed the path which opened up to a clearing. But instead of finding a ranger station or campground, they found something none of them could have expected. It was a pond, but there was something off about it. As they got closer, they saw that this strange pond wasn't filled with water, but blood. The survivors were horrified. That couldn't really be blood, could it? It must have been a weird algae or chemical reaction. But one member of the group, a man named Thomas Dean, who had been on his way back to his hometown of Prince George, British Columbia, thought there was something strangely familiar about this. He remembered being a boy and going to visit family in Alberta, and hearing an urban legend from the older local kids. According to the stories, somewhere out in the wilderness, in the northern part of the province, there was a pond full of human blood. And what made it even worse was that some said the pond was a gateway to hell. The SCP Foundation was also aware of this legend, and had been trying to pinpoint the exact source of it for decades prior to the Air Canada crash. They would finally receive definite confirmation of the blood pond when Foundation personnel intercepted a radio transmission from a ranger station located within the Wood Buffalo National Park. It was the survivors of the crash who had managed to make it through the night, and they were about to be escorted out of the park by rangers. The Foundation mobilized quickly to cordon off the pond, as at the time they were unsure of what potentially harmful properties the pond might have had. They set up Watch Station Epsilon 38 and put staff on guard to deter travelers from the area. The pond was given the designation of SCP-354 and classed as Euclid. Foundation scientists made a number of interesting discoveries about SCP-354 when they collected samples for testing. First, the pond was not in fact full of blood, merely an inorganic liquid that closely resembles blood in color and consistency. Second, and even stranger than the red liquid, is that the pond doesn't seem to have any definite banks or a bottom. Instead, the liquid in the pond increases in density as the radius away from the center increases. The liquid congeals at the edges, becoming more solid and blending into the surrounding soil. It also becomes thicker as one descends deeper into the pool, and a bottom of the pond has not yet been reached, if it even exists. Initially, the Foundation found no signs of life within the blood pond, but that would all change at 2.03 p.m. on the day following the opening of Watch Station Epsilon 38. When the science team noticed an unusual level of activity on the pond's surface, security footage feed showed a shape rising out of the pond, followed by a deafening shriek. After that, the feed was cut and Foundation lost all communication with Watch Station Epsilon 38. Fearing the worst, a mobile task force was dispatched to the location. When they got there, all personnel at the Watch Station had been killed by what could only be described as a gigantic bat. The task force was able to neutralize the entity, and as soon as they could, the Foundation moved in to increase security around the SCP, creating Area 354 and installing a permanent security detail. After this point, the pond started to regularly spit out a variety of monstrous entities, almost as if it was reacting to the SCP Foundation's increased security measures. After SCP-354-1, the giant bat, came SCP-354-2. 354-2 was an echidna-like monster the size of a bear that was virtually bulletproof but unable to escape Area 354. The Foundation neutralized this anomaly with napalm. SCP-354-3 was a floating black sphere capable of firing deadly beams of concentrated energy. The area's head scientist was able to hit it with a sledgehammer, causing the sphere to malfunction and self-destruct before it was able to escape the area. The Foundation wasn't as lucky with SCP-354-4. This creature was a reptilian humanoid that stood roughly 15 feet tall and was unable to be put down with gunfire. This was the first creature from the pond to successfully escape containment, and was only able to be neutralized when the Foundation sent in Mobile Task Force Omega-7, also known as Pandora's Box. The data on pond incursions is partially corrupted, so a complete list of creatures is not available. But some of the other monsters that came out of the blood pond include a killer robot, a set of gigantic tentacles that drag several D-Class personnel into the pond, a pair of panther-like creatures, one made of ice and the other of magma, that ignored Foundation staff and instead fought each other, and one seemingly normal human man who was executed as soon as he emerged from the pond. 
Tests on his body revealed that he was, in fact, totally normal and would have posed no threat. These anomalies came out of the pond at fairly regular intervals for several months before the pond went silent for an unprecedented 22 months. The head scientist at the time noted, I suspect this means one of two things. Either the red pool has died or powered down, or whatever the correct term for it is, or is charging up for something big to come through. O5 believes the former is the most likely explanation, and has recalled 30% of our total personnel and cut 25% of our funding. While I can only hope that they are correct, if the latter situation is true, we're soon to face some terrible monstrosity and we won't have anywhere near the force necessary to deal with it. I worry for all of our safety. His words would prove eerily prophetic following the events of Exploratory Mission 354 Alpha. The Foundation's research and development team built a specialized craft to explore the pond. Because of the strange properties of the pond's density, the craft was essentially made to be both a submarine for parts of the pond where the contents were liquid and a drill for when the liquid congealed into a semi-solid towards the bottom. The exploration team consisted of Agent Swanson, Agent Turquoise, Agent 86, Dr. J. MacArthur, Chris Simmons, Leroy Tucker, and a pilot named Martin. With the team assembled, the ship was sent down into the pond. Nothing eventful happened for the first two days of the mission, but at 4.30 a.m. on the third day, gravity suddenly reversed for the crew of the ship. This seemed to indicate that they were approaching the halfway point, though what would be on the other side, nobody could say. On the fourth day, the ship surfaced, proving definitely that the pond was in fact some sort of portal. The crew looked out of the portholes to see the darkness of night above them. While sensors outside the ship detected nothing harmful in the atmosphere around them, the crew were wary of exiting the craft. The other side of the pond was nothing like the world the crew knew. For one thing, the night lasted for 28 hours before dawn came, and when the sun finally rose, it was much larger and redder than the Earth's sun. Under the light of the strange red star, the crew could see that the pond on this side was massive compared to what they've come into, more like a large lake. Surrounding the lake was sand and rocks that were covered in a kind of moss that disappeared under sunlight and regrew during the night. The team left the ship and started to explore. During their time in this strange world, they found that the day lasted just a few hours shorter than the night, meaning that whatever planet they were on had a roughly 43-hour long rotation as opposed to our own planet's 24. The team found a number of anomalous elements on their expedition, including razor-sharp grass that can puncture skin and streams of liquid carbon dioxide. They heard some loud roars in the distance once or twice, but other than that, the planet was eerily silent, with seemingly no animal life and not even wind. When it rained, the soil remained dry, and based on that, the scientists theorized the plants in this world were more efficient at absorbing moisture. On the 25th day, the team ran into a huge metal wall that appeared to be artificially constructed. Luckily, Leroy Tucker, a quick-thinking researcher, was able to rig a blowtorch from camping supplies and melt a hole through the metal. On the other side, there was finally wind and odd black grass. That's the extent of what is known about the other side of the wall. Because the expedition logs are heavily corrupted after that point, but we know that whatever was in there wasn't good, because the team never returned. Strangely, there's no record of any names mentioned in the ship's log, almost as if being killed on the other side completely erased them from history. No other expeditions into the pond were launched after that. On an undisclosed date, a year following the discovery of the Blood Pond and construction of Area 354, the site was completely evacuated, and power was cut to the area. Mobile Task Force Data 12 was dispatched to investigate the cause of the evacuation, but before contact could be established, the area's on-site nuclear warhead was detonated, completely destroying the site. MTF Theta-12 was then attacked by a convoy made up of D-Class and other low-ranking staff who had evacuated Area 354. It was apparent that there had been some kind of mutiny within the site, and that a dissolution of the chain of command had led to its evacuation and destruction. The convoy totally annihilated MTF Theta-12, and no further contact with the former personnel of Area 354 has been made since. Following the site's detonation, a new site was constructed called simply the Red Pool Containment Site. Unlike the previous facility, which focused on research and neutralization, the new site is entirely concerned with containment. The shift in directive came as a response to the pond's apparent reactive nature, 
Each creature that emerged from the pond seemed to be in retaliation to the Foundation's actions, and it was theorized by some that the mutiny at Area 354 was triggered by some kind of psychic attack from the pond itself. An interview in the SCP file on 354 reveals that there was one more disastrous attempt to control and understand the blood pond. According to an interview with a Foundation agent, the head doctor proposed a scheme to drain the blood pond using a system of pumps and hoses. All non-essential personnel were evacuated in case of emergency, leaving only the pump technicians, D-class personnel, and a few agents for security. However, as soon as the pump was scheduled to be turned on, everyone at the site experienced a mass dissociative episode. The agent described the feeling they all experienced as like being in a dream and suddenly realizing that you're asleep. He said, Everything stopped being real. It was like we had to escape right now. When asked what happened when the pump was turned on, he simply explained that it wouldn't let them. This interview confirmed the theory that the pond is not only capable of releasing monsters out into our world, but also that it's capable of powerful but much more subtle psychological attacks. This suggests a chilling possibility, that the pond isn't just blindly reacting to being attacked, but it's fully sentient, and the actions of the SCP Foundation have only served to annoy it. And worst, studies of the pond's banks have proved evidence that the area of congealed liquid around the perimeter of the pond has been steadily expanding. That's right, the pond is getting bigger. The last thing the Foundation agent stationed at the site said before being dragged out of the interview and sedated was, It gets bigger and stronger every day, and now we've made it angry. A veteran worker of the SCP Foundation sits at his terminal performing one of the most critical tasks in the entire organization, creating a file for an as-yet undescribed SCP. But there's something terribly wrong. His eyes are glazed over, his mouth hangs open. Is this a zombie or a trained Foundation researcher? What is going on? Like any large international organization, it takes more than just the exciting, action-filled jobs to keep the wheels turning at the SCP Foundation. Sure, the head researchers, guards, mobile task force soldiers, and members of the O5 Command get all the praise, but a legion of number crunchers, cleaners, and paper pushers are equally important. One such person was archivist Walter Bainbridge, who had been tasked with digitizing some of the older records that the Foundation had on file. It was when he was innocently recording the details on SCP-050 through 060 that he first came under the strange and startling effects of SCP-055. But the most peculiar part, as with all incidents of SCP-055's anomalous effects taking hold, is that Walter had no idea any of it was happening. In his new digitized filing system, he first took note of SCP-053, Euclid class, also known as the young girl. This anomaly was a seemingly normal human female child who provoked homicidal insanity in those directly exposed to her. Then SCP-054, safe class, a non-aggressive humanoid female made entirely of, as well as biologically and chemically identical to regular spring water. Next, SCP-056, Euclid class, a being that changes form to suit its environment, but only when all observers lose focus of it. And then, SCP-057, safe class, an underground chamber that crushes the humans who walk within. It was at this point that Walter received a concerned message from one of his superiors at Site-19, Mr. Kovach. The message praised the thorough digitization of the other anomalies' records, but was confused about why Walter had left out any mention of SCP-055. Immediately, Walter was embarrassed. How could he have forgotten SCP-055, that iconic anomaly known for… well, he couldn't quite say off the top of his head, but he'd be sure to look into it. A quick trip to the Site-19 archive showed him that there was actually quite a hefty file on the nature of SCP-055 which must have been the result of a huge number of studies. What struck him as strange was that all the files were filled out in pen rather than being typed up like a traditional file. The majority of these notes were written in shorthand, too, as though they were frantically taken during the tests themselves on extremely short notice. There weren't even any redactions. Walter made a mental note of what he had seen put the file back in its proper place, and headed back to his computer terminal. However, after writing in an almost trance-like state, he looked back on his work to see that he had written an entry on SCP-058, 
a giant evil bovine heart with insect legs and a scorpion stinger. Strange, he thought. That's when Walter got a call from Mr. Kovach on his Foundation Issue phone, and he didn't sound happy. He'd given Walter direct instructions to go back and digitize the files on 055, and instead he'd been working on 058. What was the meaning of this? Walter was typically an extremely loyal and diligent employee, but the verbal barrage from his supervisor had him considering talking back, just this once, and hoping it didn't get him demoted to D-Class and thrown into 682's acid bath for playtime. Walter gulped, picked up some courage, and interrupted Mr. Kovach's rant to ask if he had any idea what SCP-055 actually was. The line went silent for a moment, then his supervisor spoke again, this time with less confidence. Uh, of course I can tell you about SCP-055. Uh, it's a classic, one of the first hundred. How could you forget it's, uh, or, yeah, you know, it's, I think it's the one with, um, Another long pause as Mr. Kovach seemed to search for the words, but instead just trailed off into silence. Knowing that some of the anomalies on file were dangerous mimetic hazards, Walter was worried for a moment that he may have accidentally killed his boss by getting him to think too hard about SCP-055. He asked if Mr. Kovach was okay, and finally got a reply. I'm sorry, I seem to have zoned out for a second there. What were we talking about again? But this time it was Walter who couldn't answer. He had no idea at all what the two of them were discussing just moments ago. He felt disoriented and kind of sick, like they'd taken some low-level amnestics. Mr. Kovach told Walter to get back to his filing duties and they'd speak later. Walter then checked the messages he'd received from Mr. Kovach earlier, and there it was, plain as day. You missed 055. Go back and digitize that before proceeding, Mr. K. But Walter had never even heard of an SCP-055 if such an anomaly even existed. What was going on here? In that moment, Walter realized he was dealing with something much stranger than just a standard digitization job. After all, how could he properly complete his duties if SCP-055 seemed to be impossible to speak, write, or even think about, unless he were directly observing it at that moment? Walter had to know, and ask around the entirety of Site-19 to find the answers if he had to. Sadly for Walter, he was about to embark on a much more challenging task than he could have ever imagined. To paraphrase a supposed quote from Socrates, All I know is that I know nothing, and that's also about the extent of the knowledge we have on SCP-055, also known as the anti-meme and the self-keeping secret. What does it look like? When and how was it obtained by the Foundation? What are its anomalous abilities? Is this thing dangerous? We may never know. Because the only anomalous ability of SCP-055 that we're aware of is the fact that nobody is capable of retaining any information about it. It's crucial to note that whatever 055 is, it isn't invisible or indescribable. Foundation personnel are perfectly capable of entering its containment chamber and observing it without incident. But mere minutes after leaving the chamber, any memories of the particulars of 055 seem to spontaneously erase themselves. Hence, the self-keeping secret. But this didn't deter Walter. Perhaps his greatest advantage was that he didn't know enough about the thing he was investigating to know how futile his mission was. He wanted to know the unknowable, and a pesky issue like impossibility wouldn't stop him. He'd get to whoever he needed to at Site-19 to get the answers he needed. Of course, most people had no knowledge of the mysterious anomaly. The common response he got back from his colleagues was, 055? Do we even have a 055? While the realization of sudden memory loss, or the realization of 055's existence, has been known to cause momentary stress, there are no known long-term physical or mental effects from 055's anomalous abilities. It's a fleeting idea in its purest form, like forgetting why you walked into a room. 055 could be the most harmless object on the Foundation's roster, or the most deadly. Either way, we just don't know. At times, Walter worried he was going insane. 055 and everything related to it was gaslighting him. Was 055 even real? The one thing that proved to him that 055 must have existed is that its containment chamber existed. 
According to the official records kept by the Foundation on the Site-19 containment facilities, 055 is kept in a 5 by 5 by 25 meter square room, constructed of 50-foot thick cement, with a Faraday cage surrounding the cement walls. The report continues that, Access is via a heavy containment door measuring 2 by 2.5 meters, constructed on bearings to ensure door closes and locks automatically unless held open deliberately. 055 cell is one of the few to have no posted security guards, and any personnel working on other SCPs in the area are ordered to remain at least 50 feet from the geometric center of 055 cell, where the anomaly itself is kept. When he tried to explore further why the cell was constructed in this manner, he found that, surprise, surprise, nobody knew. 055 was an anomaly whose containment requirements were so mysterious that it automatically netted itself a Keter class designation. After all, how can you properly contain something you can't even hope to comprehend? There were plenty of rumors about the true nature of 055. Some of the more conspiratorial minds at Site-19 theorized that 055 was actually an autonomous or remotely controlled spy inserted into the site to observe Foundation operations, or even humanity as a whole. If you're on the more paranoid end of the psychological spectrum, this theory makes total sense. An anomaly that's physically impossible to remember, even when writings and pictures on the subject exist, would be a perfect spy. However, this was all ultimately little more than speculation. Walter was barely any further along than when he started. There were multiple points in his investigations where Walter seriously considered giving up. Until finally, he had a major breakthrough. Dr. Bartholomew Hughes and Dr. John Marichek were two scientists that had performed extensive research into 055, and who, Walter hoped, might have the answers he sought about the self-keeping secret. These scientists were the first to discover the anti-memetic nature of 055, performing numerous tests on D-Class personnel to see if it was possible to create feasible written records, sketches, or any other records or impressions that could bypass its anomalous effects. The disorienting, memory-ruining effects of 055 also extend to any materials concerning 055. It seems to be a truly uncrackable code, but Dr. Hughes may have finally found some cracks in the armor. For starters, the fact that we're able to remember that 055 is an anti-memetic is an ironic exception to its anti-memetic qualities. This revelation also inspired another realization from Dr. Hughes. Would it be possible to discover more about 055 from the process of deduction rather than the typical induction? In other words, could they possibly learn about 055 by figuring out all the things it isn't, rather than what it is? Dr. Marichek designed an experiment with Dr. Hughes to explore this theory. They designed the experiment around a simple question, is 055 not spherical? In designing the question to specifically find out what 055 isn't, they hoped to subvert the anomaly's anti-memetic powers. Walter was fascinated by this potential method of getting answers. Marichek and Hughes found that, while the questioning process for those exposed was often arduous and frustrating, they could now definitely say that 055 is not a sphere. It is theoretically possible to discover the true nature of 055 by an almost endless barrage of deductive questions, though whether command would authorize the resources for such extensive testing is still an open question. Walter, in his desperation, begged Marichek and Hughes for clearance to view 055 himself. The curiosity had become too great during his search to just walk away with the single fact that 055 wasn't spherical. He needed to see this thing. And after several weeks of filling out forms and cutting red tape, his wish was finally granted. Walter Bainbridge was allowed a private audience with SCP-055, the subject of his months-long obsession. Outsiders observed that Walter spent just over an hour in the containment chamber, taking photos, drawing sketches, writing down notes, recording audio logs, and reciting memory mnemonics. He was pulling out every stop to counteract the anti-memetic effects of the self-keeping secret. He was adamant that he would not be defeated by his non-spherical nemesis, not after all this time and effort. Once his time in the 055 containment chamber was over, he retired back to his office to finally digitize his exhaustive findings. 
so that his supervisor, Mr. Kovach, would finally get off his back. Walter smiled, took a deep breath, and began to type. SCP-059, Keter Class. This anomaly is a radioactive mineral that emits a unique radiation known as delta radiation. Exposure to this radiation has caused strange fungal growths on the infected... Wait, what was this supposed to be about again? Oh well, it couldn't have been that important. Dr. Dan anxiously paced in his cell. It was the only way he'd been able to occupy himself for the past six months, save for pouring through files and, when he was lucky, being able to oversee another failed termination attempt. He only stopped pacing when, for a brief and horrible moment, he realized that Monster was probably doing the exact same thing in its big metal cube at this very moment. That horrible creature that he'd thrown away his life for a futile shot at killing. Perhaps the whole thing had been a fool's errand. After all, he was formerly a researcher under the employ of the SCP Foundation. Secure. Contain. Protect. They had truly sadistic beasts like SCP-106, The Nightmarish Old Man, and SCP-352 Baba Yaga in containment cells, and there was no plans to terminate either of them. They weren't the Global Occult Coalition for 343's sake. Why did Dr. Dan even want to terminate SCP-096 in the first place? He tried to explain it to them again and again, but his pleas had fallen on deaf ears. In his mind, the impetus for destroying the Shy Guy was terrifyingly clear. It was a monster that killed anyone or anything that looked at its face, even a photograph of it, even a tiny collection of pixels. When its rage state was induced, it seemed that nothing would stop it. It would have an intuitive psychic link to its victim, charge at them at breakneck speed, and only find its zen again once all of them were dead. And if a picture of SCP-096 was leaked onto the internet, it would cause a chain reaction that triggered an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. There were plenty of creatures and entities that the Foundation knew about that could theoretically bring about the apocalypse, but to him, 096 was the most realistic. It preyed upon the inherent curiosity and thirst for knowledge seated in every human heart. The same drive to simply know that led to the creation of the SCP Foundation would be humanity's doom in the face of an SCP-096 outbreak. And if such a thing happened, the Foundation would need to break the masquerade of secrecy to have any hope of saving humanity. In his many feverish nightmares, Dr. Dan had seen it all so clearly. The first photographs of SCP-096's face would be leaked online. Perhaps a few hundred people across the globe would look, in disparate enough locations, that it would be almost impossible for the Foundation to detect and save all of them, as SCP-096 went on its bloody rampage. Of course, as the image proliferated, as images on the internet often do, the purview of 096's violence would only grow. People across the nation would start to take notice, and soon after that, across the world. Mysterious creature causing mass casualties would be the headline on every news desk, because why would anybody want to talk about anything else? Perhaps some foolish reporters would take video footage of the creature. Everyone has a phone these days with high-definition cameras, pictures would be taken and posted. More and more of it would flood the internet. Too many simultaneous moles for even the SCP Foundation to whack. The news would spread. Panic and hysteria would spread. People wouldn't even know what's triggering all this horror if the Foundation didn't go public and tell them that it was the pictures that was killing everyone. And by then, wouldn't it already be too late? The antidote to fear is knowledge. It's why when anything goes wrong, we're refreshing timelines and feeds and news websites for any kind of information. And if you were told an unstoppable monster was killing scores of people and might be coming to a neighborhood near you sometime soon, wouldn't you want a good look at it? Wouldn't you want to know your enemy? Having no idea that the mere act of knowing was what sealed your horrible fate. By Dr. Dan's bleak estimations, if only several million people died as a result of this kind of scenario, it could be considered a positive outcome. He'd seen it all, but no matter how many times he tried to articulate this to his superiors, he wasn't listened to. They didn't take him or the threat that SCP-096 posed seriously. 
Every time he warned of the apocalyptic potential of SCP-096, he was simply told to get back to working on those goggles. It was why he needed to give those naysayers a demonstration. It was why a certain photograph needed to show up in the home of a certain mountaineer. It's why all those people had to die. There was no other way. The deaths of the civilians and the researchers and the mobile task force members were, of course, regrettable. But it was the only way to prevent the deaths of so many more. They gave him what he wanted. Permission to put this gangly time bomb in the ground. Even if the beast's death was inextricably tied to his own execution at the hands of the very employers who authorized him. The world was full of funny little ironies like that. Another one is that even though Dr. Dan now had the authorization and funding to terminate SCP-096, he was discovering that he lacked another important factor, the capability. They tried incinerating it, exposing it to massive amounts of radiation, exposing it to an insane degree of kinetic trauma, the equivalent of being hit by an out-of-control bullet train. They tested every kind of experimental, off-the-books weaponry that they had access to through various research projects. Proton blasts, lasers, high-intensity energy beams, nothing. Even when they fried off every scrap of flesh on the monster's body, its unbreakable skeleton still remained, and in what seemed like no time at all, it'd be back in action. Its very existence seemed to mock him. A guard opened his cell door, staring disdainfully at the disgraced researcher. That same guard had slammed his head against a wall a month earlier. One of his friends had apparently been killed in the legendary 096 containment breach that set this whole sordid thing in motion. Up and at him, scumbag, he said in a gruff, surly voice, training a handgun on the doctor he knew wouldn't fight back. They need you in test chamber six. Dr. Dan allowed himself a small grin imperceptible to the guard who clearly hated his guts. They'd approved his 096 versus 682 cross-test. Marvelous. How marvelous. To all the others, it would seem like just one more entry in a long line of 682 cross-tests. He thought it darkly funny. In his eyes, the Foundation had no hope of ever killing SCP-682. Its defining quality was being impossible to kill and it didn't present nearly the threat to the entire world that 096 posed. Their futile attempts to murder the lizard were little more than a money sink to justify the site's exorbitant funding. But perhaps he could turn this to his benefit. Maybe SCP-682 would hold the secret to actually killing off his nemesis. Within 30 hours, Dr. Dan had his disappointing answer. Both anomalies had undeniably done a real number on each other. And Dr. Dan did take a kind of sick amusement in the mental trauma that SCP-682 had induced in 096. But ultimately, it was all for nothing. 682 had skinned 096 alive and melted off its flesh with acid, but once again, that indestructible skeleton stood firm. This had been the 27th termination attempt since the incident. The 27th failed termination attempt, Dr. Dan mentally corrected himself. 096's skeleton kept defeating them. Even their most ardent attempts to penetrate the bones and destroy the creature within had failed. During a previous attempt, they tried to access the brain by putting a diamond-hard drill into its eye sockets. Of course, it was the drill that actually broke, much to Dr. Dan's seemingly tireless frustration. Needless to say, in the debriefing interview with Dr. Carver, a researcher who once would have considered him a colleague, he wasn't in high spirits. If he managed to kill this thing, then he would always be the hero who made a terrible sacrifice in order to save many more lives. If he didn't kill 096, he was little more than the monster who murdered all those innocent people for nothing. Though you'd never hear him say it out loud. If it wasn't for that damnable, indestructible skeleton, this monster would be long dead already. If only there was some way to break the creature's bones. That's when it hit him. SCP-173, The Sculpture. A Site-19 icon often overlooked because of its more silent but deadly style, but undeniably one of the most frightening and dangerous anomalies out there. It had racked up a truly shocking body count since it was first interred at Site-19 in 1993. 
one broken neck at a time, and it's one of the few creatures out there that even the hard-to-destroy reptile himself is utterly terrified of. Perhaps a monster that practically has a PhD in breaking bones would be the ideal candidate to vandalize the Shy Guy's vertebrae. Once his proposal was greenlit for initial testing, Dr. Dan arranged for the Shy Guy, with a bag over his head of course, to be brought into a testing chamber with the ever-stoic SCP-173. When all of the researchers and guards were safely outside, all it took was a single blink to make all of Dr. Dan's darkest dreams come true. In the nanoseconds his eyes were closed, he heard the most beautiful sounds in the world. A loud, fleshy crunch and a pained howl from 096. He opened his eyes to an equally wondrous sight. 096 doubled over at an unnatural angle. Its spine snapped between the fourth and fifth vertebrae, spinal fluid leaking down the creature's flank. That freaky little sculpture had done it. It had actually damaged the integrity of the Shy Guy's skeleton. It was at that moment that Dr. Dan knew he could kill this thing. Admittedly, there was a containment breach shortly after that when the bag slipped off of 096's head, and it charged through the nearby steel wall, killing multiple people before being subdued and recontained. But when it comes to projects involving Dr. Dan, a mere handful of innocent people being killed sits comfortably within the acceptable margin of error. A day later, Dr. Dan was standing before a crowded boardroom, with agents, researchers, and even a few members of the O5 Council in attendance. He explained his findings to them, and the fact that even more importantly, they may have a way to bring the wretched existence of 096 to an absolute halt. His plans were approved. Not long after, he was putting them into motion. Dr. Dan was surrounded by researchers and heavily armed guards as 173 was escorted into the test chamber with a forklift. 096 was there, still bagged. Off to the side was a giant tub of hydrofluoric acid connected to a hose and injector attachment. If this didn't work, nothing would. Everyone stood back in a safe zone as 173 was released to do its thing. Crunch. Just like the previous time, 096's spine had been successfully snapped. Spinal fluid dribbled down its skin. Everyone had rushed into the chamber. One group kept 173 isolated with their stairs. The other, headed by Dr. Dan, prepared the acid injector and shoved it into the breach in 096's spine. As the acid was pumped by the gallon into 096's bones, the creature let out the most horrifying wail. It kicked and bucked as more acid was pumped in, melting those indestructible bones from within. The creature even began to vomit acid as it panicked, melting the bag off of its own head. Some panicked and averted their gaze. Dr. Dan didn't. He stared directly at the creature's face for the first time as it melted in front of him with nothing short of pure elation. Had he won? Had he actually won? The creature let out a gurgling shriek and the guards opened fire. Their bullets splattered into the monster's melting flesh and bones as it hollered and shrieked. They didn't let up, firing up and down its body, spraying it with white-hot lead. It began to melt and bubble away, expanding into a great, gruesome puddle on the floor beneath them. Dr. Dan laughed like a madman. Even as the guards grabbed him and dragged him away from the foul-smelling, greasy mess, bubbling with chemical life, he just kept laughing. Even though he knew the death of 096 meant an equally swift death of his own, it didn't matter. It had all been for something. The world was saved. It was over. He'd finally won. Have you ever seen something you weren't supposed to? Something that made you feel off? Something you regret? Secrets like these are best kept to yourself, but since you're still alive, whatever you saw wasn't nearly as bad as what Peter Holland saw one fateful night in January of 2015. Peter was an unremarkable man, an office worker, slaving away at the daily grind. And like a lot of people, Peter enjoyed nothing more than coming home after a long, hard day, kicking back and watching some TV. It was this innocent activity that led to Peter's horrifying brush with SCP-5049, altering the course of his otherwise average life forever. The event started at around 10.05pm. 
Peter was channel surfing, glued to the couch in his sparsely furnished apartment. Commercials, commercials, commercials. As far as Peter's tired eyes could see. He paused for a moment to watch the end of an ad for a car he could never hope to afford on his salary. But something stopped him from changing the channel again. The next ad had begun, and it was playing a strange, scratchy jingle that gave Peter an odd sense of unease. But even stranger than that was the text on screen. Demon Dan's Discount Homunculus Depot in baby blue bubble lettering. He forced a smile. This had to be some weird comedy skit or viral marketing campaign, or maybe it was something he drank. But no, this was a real commercial. And things were about to get even weirder. The Peppy logo faded to a concerning sight. A tall humanoid figure dressed like a used car salesman, but one that definitely wasn't human. His skin was dark green and covered in patches of thick fur. He had long fingers with intimidating claws and a grin full of needle-like fangs. It looked almost demonic. And after a few seconds, the demon began to speak. Hey there, folks, it's your man Demon Dan coming at you with the latest and greatest deals from Demon Dan's Discount Homunculus Depot. We've just accepted a shipment of brand new models that would make even the most discerning customers weep with excitement. Let's see what we've got. The creature, apparently named Demon Dan, stepped away from his desk, revealing two long, furry goat legs that ended in large, pointed hooves. Peter now assumed he really was going crazy. But at this point, he was along for the ride. Demon Dan continued his pitch. Looking to make your way through the capitalist hellscape that makes home look cozy? Come try one of our newest businessman models! Dan gestured behind him to where Peter was horrified to see a total of 52 adult male human bodies hanging from a wall. There was something uncanny about them. They seemed almost hollow, like a highly realistic costume or a prop from a horror movie. Peter didn't have much time to think about it, though, as Demon Dan went on. If you're looking for an extra challenge of inequality, the businesswoman model may be a right fit for you. The commercial then revealed a wall of human female bodies strung up in a similar fashion. Now, you may be thinking, but Dan, business sounds hard. I just want to have some fun. And the fine team here at Demon Dan's Discount Homunculus Depot have got you covered. The camera zoomed out to show an area of the store filled with children's decorations and more of these strange, hollowed-out human suits in child sizes to match. And who has more fun than kids? No one, that's who. For a limited time, the purchase of any child size unit comes with a complimentary 50% off coupon for parental units. You just can't say no to a deal like that. Before Peter could process the madness that was unfolding before him, the camera cut again. The store's logo appeared on the screen once more, along with several cuts to locations around the store itself. There were more human bodies, hundreds of them. Demon Dan's sleazy voice rang out over all of it. Here at Demon Dan's Discount Homunculus Depot, we know it's not all fun and games. The bravest among us have a mission to accomplish. The Seven Lords are ever planning their invasion after all, so you're looking for function over form. Well, we've got that in spades down here in the Tactical Services Department. You'll be kicking ass in no time when you're wearing the latest models at the best prices. Seven Lords? Invasion? What did any of this mean? Suddenly, the camera was showing him a new room. Red curtains parted, revealing more of these person suits, several bearing a striking resemblance to real human celebrities. He managed to make out Gucci Mane, Avril Lavigne, Paul McCartney, and Britney Spears before Demon Dan's appearance once again drew his attention. I've got a special treat for you. We're happy to announce the VIP Lookalike Department. We all know how difficult the creation of Homunculus is. It's a fine art that takes years of practice. So when a replacement order on VIPs comes in, every detail needs to be perfect. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. But for the right price, you too can look like famous icons from around the globe. The image of celebrity bodies faded from view, and Peter was left looking at the grinning demon Dan standing behind the front desk of his impossible store once more. He said, there you have it, folks. Come on down to Demon Dan's Discount Homunculus Depot. If you're viewing the advertisement, then you've been selected for entry. Please enter the nearest door for instant deals and upgrade those old duds for one of our newest models. What are you waiting for? Come on down. The logo popped up again, hovering above some bold text that said, Please enter the nearest door. Peter had had enough. 
He switched off the TV. What a horror show, he thought. They should just warn you before they put short horror films on TV like that. He had no idea they could just slip them in among regular commercials. Surely Demon Dan in his store couldn't be real, right? But as his eyes drifted to the door in his room, he didn't feel quite so certain. Well, there was only one way to find out. Peter got up, went over to the door, took a deep breath, and walked through it. Peter Holland was never seen again. Not as himself, anyway. The SCP Foundation has long been aware of this sinister transmission, known as SCP-5049-2, and luckily has found ways to prevent it from claiming more victims. The Foundation Television Analysis Department as well as Webcrawler 40Y40, which is the software the Foundation uses to root out anomalous activity online, are always vigilant for signs of Demon Dan's commercial running. Just observing Demon Dan, who is himself classified as SCP-5049-A, and his ads put you in immediate danger, as they can transform any nearby doors into SCP-5049-1s. Those are interdimensional portals that remain active for around 15 minutes after viewing the ad. So then what specifically is SCP-5049? It's the entire pocket dimension known as Demon Dan's Discount Homunculus Depot a Kettier-class spatial anomaly constantly on the lookout for new human victims, which it transforms into fleshy suits for its demonic clients, which let them blend in around humans. Prior to its discovery by the Foundation, it's likely that Demon Dan and his associates claimed hundreds if not thousands of lives. But sadly, even discovering this anomaly came at a gruesome cost to the Foundation. On February 16th, 2020, the ad played on Safe Storage Warehouse 13's break room television. At the time of the broadcast, four Foundation personnel were present, including security agent William Birkin. Worrying that this was a potential security threat, Agent Birkin investigated the door to a nearby closet. The second he opened it, he was transformed to the storefront of Demon Dan's Discount Homunculus Depot. He saw Demon Dan himself standing at the corner, while four smaller reptilian imps fought over a small flesh suit. Demon Dan scolded them, before turning his attention to Agent Birkin. Tis, 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 you aren't supposed to be here, little man. How naughty. I'm gonna have to have a word with marketing once I'm through with you. Agent Birkin, fearing for his safety, drew his weapon and shot Demon Dan three times. The creature dematerialized before appearing right next to Agent Birkin and disarming him with a swift chop. The unfortunate security agent was then grabbed by the considerably larger Demon Dan and thrown over Dan's shoulder. We know all of this because Agent Birkin's standard issue Foundation body camera recorded the whole terrifying ordeal. Even as Demon Dan dragged the helpless Birkin back into the twisted workshop behind the store. There, Birkin saw what would soon be his own fate right before his eyes. Dan's minions converting human bodies into fleshy suits for their demon clientele. And this unfortunate security officer was next. Dan gave him over to a pair of large sheep-like demons and told them to drain, skin, and declaw him. Birkin's video feed finally cut as the demons pulled out their rusty tools and began to work on him. Of course, the SCP Foundation wouldn't take an attack on one of their operatives, inside one of their facilities, no less, lying down. The unfortunate death of William Birkin allowed the Foundation to refine their methods of intercepting the broadcast of Demon Dan's commercials. They even had a new mobile task force, Mobile Strike Force Kappa-11 or the Baphomet Bashers, specifically to deal with Demon Dan and his cronies. They did more than just prevent him from taking new humans, though. When the Baphomet Bashers teamed up with an A-class clairvoyant entity to improve their efficiency in predicting future broadcasts, they were able to launch sting operations and arrest 21 different demonic customers for interrogation. This impressive strike back finally gave the Foundation some meaningful leverage over Demon Dan. And through the use of their clairvoyant entity, they were able to call a temporary truce and arrange a meeting with Demon Dan himself. Captain Steiner, an agent of the Foundation External Negotiation Department, was the one to interrogate Demon Dan. They sat across from each other at a table, and Demon Dan was clearly tense, frustrated with the way the Foundation had been messing with his business. All of their sting operations were frightening off his customers. In return for letting him continue his work, 
the Foundation wanted Dan to turn over all the information on his bosses and customers, allowing the Foundation to track their movements. When Dan was evasive about whether he'd comply, they tried threatening him. Dan laughed them off. Go ahead, take your best shot, little man. There's a dozen more just like me. You won't stop anything. Finally, he was pressured into giving a yes or no answer as to whether he'd willingly collaborate with the Foundation and act as an informant against his kind. When Demon Dan hinted that he may be willing to comply, he began to make a horrifying gurgling noise and gripped his head in pain. He began speaking in Latin in a voice that wasn't his own, as though the seven demon lords he served were speaking through him. They said, You are a fool, Jailer. To think a pathetic morsel such as this could aid you against us. I have allowed you to toil in your own delusions for far too long. You may have taken advantage of Asimodius all those years ago, but you stop nothing. You hinder nothing. You jail and barter to no avail. Your time is coming. And then Demon Dan's head exploded, which obviously prevented him from giving any incriminating information on those he worked for. Whoever the Demon Lords are, they're certainly the secretive type. You may think that this is the end of Demon Dan's Discount Homunculus Depot and of SCP-5049, but soon another ad ran. It advertised the same products and services out of the same store. The only difference was that this time, a different entity was starring in it. What's in a name? Ancient folklore and fairy tales sometimes tell of the importance of names, that they can hold the power to summon or banish. Whether you buy into the superstition or not, you'd be unwise to ignore the power a name can have, especially if you ever dare to venture into SCP-4000. Why? Use your own name too many times in this extra-dimensional forest, and you may find that what walks out isn't you at all. At least once a year, the Foundation leads an expedition into SCP-4000 to explore this Keter-class dimension. But if you go down to those woods today, then you'd better follow the rules. Remember, the Foundation has implemented these guidelines for your own safety, and it's in your best interests to follow them. First and foremost, when referencing anything inside SCP-4000, be it a person, place, or thing, you cannot, under any circumstances, use names or titles. Communication is key when exploring SCP-4000, and making use of specific descriptors will deter any adverse effects on your journey. For example, you may want to refer to the location of SCP-4000 as the woods where you need to speak carefully, an apt description for such a place. Of course, there is a reason the Foundation doesn't provide a handy flashcard of alternative descriptors for any personnel taking part in the annual mission into SCP-4000. Nothing found there can be referred to with any consistent name, so it's perhaps advisable to look over a thesaurus and expand your vocabulary before visiting SCP-4000, as you'll need to come up with a lot of different ways to refer to the people and creatures around you. But don't worry, the Foundation will be able to train you how to properly refer to SCP-4000 in both written and verbal communication. In a similar vein, the second rule states that no personnel member should respond to their own name while in SCP-4000. Naturally, you and your fellow expedition team will not be alone in the forest you find yourselves in. The denizens of SCP-4000 are perpetually mutating creatures, some appearing to be trustworthy while others are hostile. It is for personnel members' own safety that no consistent names or titles are used to refer to each other in conversation. This has been known to cause personnel returning from SCP-4000 to experience vivid hallucinations, and in some instances has led to the appearances of creatures found in SCP-4000 in our world. Thirdly, when interacting with the life forms residing in SCP-4000, personnel are advised to accept any gifts that they're offered, but are warned to, under no circumstances, consume anything that is given to them while inside the forest. Finally, and above all, do not divulge any name, nickname, codename, alias, or any other personal designation when interacting with any native entities, and disregard any designator that an inhabitant of SCP-4000 attempts to assign to you. Personnel must, however, remain courteous in the presence of any native creature of SCP-4000 and treat these entities with respect and formality. Access to SCP-4000 can only be achieved by performing Procedure 4000 Holloway, a ritual requiring a steady flame in an indoor fireplace 
fueled by only organic kindling. Personnel are required to combine the powdered bones of one male lion, one male red fox, and a baleen whale, and cast these into the fire with a personal possession holding strong sentimental value to the staff member performing 4000 Halloway. Next, personnel are to add three feathers of a bird, such as a raven or crow, and must respond with the correct counterphrases once the fire begins to emit a voice. If these conditions are met and the correct response is given, Foundation personnel will gain access to the entry point of SCP-4000. If any error is made during the course of performing Procedure 4000 Halloway, then under no circumstances should this ritual be repeated. Staff are urged to apologize for any incorrect actions, then refrain from engaging in this procedure in the future. Should Procedure 4000 Halloway be completed successfully, Foundation personnel will find themselves arriving in the access point to SCP-4000, emerging from the mouth of an old well in the center of the forest. Exploration teams sent into SCP-4000 are advised that this dimension does not adhere to the laws of physical space that personnel will be accustomed to. There is a single, confirmed, safe route that must be used when traversing the forest of SCP-4000. A dirt path leading in a circuit both beginning and terminating at the entry point. Previous attempts to map the landscape of SCP-4000 all confirm that the only way to safely exit this dimension is to follow the entire length of the path in one direction until eventually returning to the well. You have been warned. Any attempt to travel back to the direction you came in will result in a loss of contact with the rest of the expedition team. As mentioned, SCP-4000 is home to a number of entities, often noted to be undergoing continuous and dramatic changes in form. These physiological mutations appear to occur whenever these creatures are unobserved, making distinguishing between them difficult. When questioned about the exact nature of these changes, the inhabitants of SCP-4000 claim to have no control over them and express distress and dissatisfaction when said changes occur. Guidelines have been put in place by the Foundation regarding the interactions between personnel and creatures found in the forest, and adhering to the rules regarding the use of consistent names and titles remains vitally important. The native creatures appear semi-humanoid and are reported to be highly temperamental. Should any staff member happen to offend one of these natives, they may be subjected to anything from verbal assault to acts of extreme physical violence from the SCP-4000 resident. If any Foundation personnel further question why there are so many rules when visiting SCP-4000, then they need to look no further than the discoveries and fate of Dr. Eugene Japers, who during his initial expedition to SCP-4000 in 2005 encountered a humanoid native entity whose head resembled a rabbit's. As the pair shared a polite conversation, the rabbit-like creature made an inquiry regarding Dr. Japers' name, asking, how is your name? Keeping to the rules, Dr. Japers did not divulge any name or other form of title to the creature at this time. However, Japers remained courteous and polite during the interaction. The rabbit responded with the following, are you simple? I'm merely asking how your name is. My name has smelt of raspberries lately, I think, or snapdragons perhaps. It's so hard to tell these days, but one makes an effort. In his reply, Dr. Japers made a reference to his own name as having tasted rather tart as of late. Before concluding the conversation with the rabbit entity, upon returning to the SCP-4000 forest three years later, Dr. Japers was met with the same creature and once again engaged in conversation with it. After briefly discussing their previous encounter, Dr. Japers was able to turn their exchange to Toward something the rabbit had mentioned before, about finding it difficult to describe his own name. When asked to clarify this point, the rabbit replied, I can only assume it's because of how long we've been apart, my name and I, that is. It's a good name, a proud name, I'm fairly sure. By this point though, it's probably decayed from its former grandeur, if it even still exists. After this mention of its relationship with its own name, it should be noted that the rabbit referred to Dr. Japers by the title Fellow Scholar. The third and final encounter between Dr. Japers and this entity came in 2013, after the doctor was sent into SCP-4000 with instructions to conduct a more thorough interview with the subject. It was during their third conversation that the rabbit man revealed details of a long forgotten war between human beings and the residents of SCP-4000. Apparently, these creatures, the Fae, do not originate from the forest in which they now reside, and according to the rabbit man's claims, were born in our world. Much as it grieves me to say, we were betrayed, the rabbit explained. We had fought side by side, you know, in the war against that factory. We had done nothing but help them, and what did they do? They destroyed us. They took so many of our lives and all of our names. Some of us fled here when the war was just beginning, but not many, not many. Still though, I don't hate them. It has been assumed by some that the Foundation was directly involved in whatever may have wiped out the Fae, causing them to either retreat or be banished to the forest of SCP-4000. An additional assumption has been made that whatever weapons were used on these creatures is directly responsible for their constantly shifting state, 
rendering them without their own names or identities. Whatever the case may be, it was during their conversation that Dr. Japers, in reference to their second encounter, referred to himself as a fellow scholar to the rabbit in order to coax information from him. However, in doing so, the doctor had unwittingly accepted the title that the native entity had given him. By mistakenly responding to the name fellow scholar, the doctor had broken the rules of interacting with the creatures of SCP-4000. An easy mistake, but a costly one. The doctor would later leave SCP-4000, traversing the safe path back to the well, and Dr. Japers vanished shortly after his exit from SCP-4000. His whereabouts are currently unknown. The Foundation has made several attempts to investigate his untimely disappearance, but to this day, he remains missing, and the fur left on the inside of his expedition gear displayed no strange properties. The single goal, it would seem, of the creatures residing in SCP-4000 is the theft of names. However, this naturally extends far beyond the Dimension's definition of identity theft. Though an unfortunate blunder, Dr. Japers allowed the friendly nature and demeanor of the rabbit entity to trick him into accepting the name Fellow Scholar. By giving Dr. Japers a name, the rabbit was free to steal not only his name, but his very identity. While it is unclear how this transference is achieved by the creatures, it is due to the risk of this that the Foundation employs such strict rules for any research team tasked with traveling to the forest of SCP-4000. Make no mistake, names have more power than we realize, and this is evident in few places more so than SCP-4000. 4000, a pocket dimension where ever-changing survivors of a forgotten massacre exist as identities alone. Remember, a name is a powerful thing, whichever side of the well you find yourself on. Your name binds you to who you are, but if your name becomes someone else's, then one else of yours becomes theirs too. It was July of 2004, and Bill Murray was enjoying the peak of an extremely successful career. Not only had the iconic actor starred in some of the most beloved comedies of the 20th century, including Ghostbusters and Groundhog Day. He'd voiced the main character of the recently released live-action Garfield movie. It'd been a financial success, but it was a critical flop. Not that this bothered Bill. He was happy with the performance. And the paycheck. What he wouldn't be quite as happy about was the horrifying encounter he was about to have with SCP-3166. On July 8th, Bill was enjoying a cold drink on the porch of his luxurious Beverly Hills home. The sky was beginning to darken as the sun set in the west. It was a blissful evening. His wife Jennifer was inside, watching TV. Nothing seemed particularly out of the ordinary, until he noticed a quick flash of orange in the distance. It was almost too fast to register, this large orange shape darting past the corner of his eye. For a second, he entertained the thought that it might have been an escaped tiger, but it was gone too fast to really tell. Bill finished his drink and headed inside. He had enough for one night. The next morning, he got up to read the paper and found the Garfield movie getting slaughtered by the critics. One review stated, No one can accuse Garfield the movie of infidelity to its source. It faithfully conveys the banality of Jim Davis's cartoon. Another called it, A film without energy and without spirit. He put the paper down and ate his breakfast. A few blows to the ego were worth it for the paydays that came with big-budget family films. Just then, his wife came to him with a strange question. Were you walking around downstairs in the middle of the night? No, he hadn't. He'd been sleeping like a baby. Why did she ask? Well, Jennifer said, I heard some rustling downstairs last night. It sounded like something big. He hadn't heard anything, though, and told her it was probably just her imagination. He put it out of his mind and continued about his day. He decided he would keep his eyes peeled for that orange blur again, though. Bill didn't see anything peculiar the rest of the morning and went to a local cafe for lunch. He ordered a coffee and a cream cheese bagel, then made a quick trip to the bathroom while his food was prepared. When Bill returned to his table, though, there was something strange. Instead of a bagel, there was a large heaping of lasagna on the table. What was going on? This cafe didn't even serve lasagna. Bill knew something was terribly wrong. Things only got stranger when Bill came home to find a small tuft of orange fur snagged on the frame of his front door. And it wasn't synthetic fur like you'd see on plush toys or stuffed animals. No, this was real animal fur. Maybe someone was just goofing off or trying to play some weird prank on him. But it didn't feel like it. Deep down, Bill Murray knew that he was in grave danger. Whoever or whatever was behind this, it wanted to hurt him. That night, his worst fears were realized. Bill's wife had left town for the week, and he was headed to the kitchen in the middle of the night for a glass of water. 
when he saw something. A huge figure moving up against the glass door leading to his backyard. The thing was huge, nearly seven feet tall, with a bloated, fur-covered, misshapen body that was pressed up against the door. Its fur was bright, garish orange, a cartoon orange. Strangest of all, though, was the sound it was making. It sounded like it was purring. Bill backed away from the door and then ran back to his room to hide. The whole night he sat cowering as he heard scratching against the walls, like something was trying to get in. He was terrified and too scared to do anything, even move. Finally, as morning broke, the noises seemed to stop. Bill had to do something. He couldn't let this nightmare go on another night. What if things got worse? What if that thing managed to get inside? He called the local police and when they arrived, he explained the incredibly strange situation as best he could. He told them he was being stalked by some kind of huge cat, or at least someone dressed like a huge cat. Also, there was lasagna involved. The officers interviewing him could barely contain their laughter as he told them his story. A giant orange cat? Perhaps, one of them theorized. He angered some kind of obsessive Garfield fan through his involvement in the live-action movie. After all, the original comic had been running for years and had been extremely popular. Who knows what kind of nutjobs were obsessed with seeing only a faithful adaptation of the source material. As the officers departed, Bill was confident that they weren't taking him seriously. He couldn't rely on any of them for protection. Thankfully, from a multi-decade movie career, he had plenty of disposable income and decided to hire a private security team to protect him while he looked into this mystery. He had two trained bodyguards positioned around his home at all times for the next month. They were armed and given the cryptic orders to fire on anything orange. Meanwhile, Bill began to fall down a Garfield rabbit hole. He felt strangely compelled to research all the Garfield media he could find, as though the answer to his terrifying situation was somehow hidden between the lines. Bill explored the entire backlog of thousands of comic strips. He read the books and interviews with Jim Davis. He watched the cartoons and straight-to-DVD animated movies. Ironically, for a guy who'd recently portrayed the lasagna-loving orange cat, Bill had never felt quite so immersed in the character before. He found the strange pathos in the routine of Garfield and his friends. One particular comic really piqued his interest, though. Originally published in October of 1989, the comic began with Garfield being woken up by a strange chill, an almost eerie sensation. The character observed aloud that he didn't feel like he was in his own home. He explored his little home further, trying to find his owner John or his housemaid and sometimes nemesis, Odie, but found nothing. As Garfield remarked on feeling alone, a purple speech box delivered the sinister message. You have no idea how alone you are, Garfield. He then finds that his home looks like it's been abandoned for years. The for sale sign outside is practically ancient. Garfield slowly comes to a horrifying revelation. Everyone really is gone, and his adventures and friends now exist only in his imagination. He's trapped in a prison of his own creation, trying to stave off his endless loneliness in denial about the reality of his situation. The comic ended with a quote directly from Jim Davis himself saying, an imagination is a powerful tool. It can tint memories of the past, shade perceptions of the present, or paint a future so vivid that it can entice or terrify, all depending upon how we conduct ourselves today. As he read those words, hmm. Bill Murray felt a chill down his spine. Why had he wanted to get involved in the Garfield movie in the first place? What had he gotten himself into? Before he could slip any deeper into his own mind, Bill heard a faint, choked scream downstairs. He felt his breath catch in his throat. He was terrified, but needed to see what was happening. He carefully and quietly began to creep down the stairs. At the bottom, he poked his head around a corner, and that's when he saw a member of his security detail lying dead on the floor. His face was blue from asphyxiation. His mouth was stuffed with lasagna. It looked like he had been force-fed to death. Bill wanted to scream, but he couldn't, or maybe knew he shouldn't. Just then, he heard a soft, meaty thumping noise coming from the nearby living room. He didn't know why, but he felt compelled to approach, as if by forces beyond his control. He made his way to the living room, and when he'd got there, he saw where the noise was coming from. Bill's jaw dropped in pure horror. 
There was the other member of his security detail, lying limp and lifeless under a giant orange figure. It was a grotesquely huge creature, wearing what looked to be a kind of crude Garfield outfit made of sewn-together cat pelts. It stank of pasta and rotten meat. In its giant paw, it held a golden trophy, which it was using to pound the security guard's head into mush, while making quiet, cat-like purring noises. The creature suddenly stopped and looked up, locking eyes with Bill. The fear of death came over him. He froze as the giant, freakish Garfield stepped over Donnie's corpse and began to come towards him. Bill turned and ran, but Garfield was gaining on him. Before he could make it to the front door, the creature knocked him over. He was laid out on the ground, looking up at it as it reached into its own body cavity and began to pull out handfuls of lasagna. He was about to shove a wad of the horrible decaying pasta into Bill's mouth when suddenly a ding was heard and the creature stopped. It looked up as if sniffing the air and then suddenly turned and lumbered towards the kitchen. Bill watched as the Garfield monster entered the kitchen where somehow there was a steaming hot fresh lasagna sitting in the open oven. The creature had sensed the presence of external lasagna and felt the compulsion to integrate it into its body, grabbing fistfuls and shoving it into itself. Just then a group of highly trained SCP Foundation personnel burst into the room and subdued the creature. It had been an ambush. The Foundation had been tipped off to the presence of the creature by monitoring the local police department dispatches, and the report of a seven-foot-tall comic book cat terrorizing a Hollywood actor was definitely worth looking into. The monster that had almost taken Bill Murray's life was SCP-3166, a deadly pataphysical being that tends to manifest around people somehow involved in the Garfield intellectual property. It appears whenever the public perception of Garfield falls out of favor, and because Bill had starred in the critically panned Garfield movie, he was currently at the very top of SCP-3166's hit list. Thankfully, he managed to survive his terrifying ordeal, and was administered amnestics by Foundation personnel so that he could return to his normal life. This frightening and mysterious creature has been around since 1989, appearing after the publication of the haunting Garfield comic that Bill had read that very night. It appeared in the office of United Media, who were the publishers of the Garfield comic strip at the time, and began wrecking havoc. Since then, the creature's manifestation has been a constant threat whenever Garfield loses its popularity or audience. As a result, the Foundation has spent years as the funding source behind all Garfield media, and even planting hypnotic mimetics into the comic strips to ensure that there is always a loyal fan base. The fur is indeed real, organic cat fur, albeit an unnaturally orange color. And instead of organs, the creature is filled with lasagna. Worst of all, though, is that testing has revealed that the meat in the lasagna is genetically identical to the flesh of Garfield's creator. Jim Davis. How did this thing come into existence? Perhaps it was Jim's sheer force of imagination that dragged it into being. As he himself said, an imagination is a powerful tool. All in all, it's lucky that Bill Murray was able to survive his encounter and return to his normal life. Well, as normal as life can be for Bill Murray. And if you see Bill Murray, don't bother asking him about SCP-3166. The amnestics were quite effective. And just as he's fond of saying himself, no one will ever believe you. Jay and Michael were a pair of urban exploration YouTubers looking for their big break. You might remember their video exploring the dead mall on the outskirts of your town, or the supposedly haunted 1950s insane asylum out in the sticks. But you certainly won't find these videos anywhere online. After the incident at SCP-823, all of their content was scrubbed away from even the most comprehensive internet archives. Why, you ask? Because these unfortunate urban explorers decided that their big break would be exploring a certain abandoned theme park, and it would be one of the last decisions they ever made. Michael and Jay had heard rumors about the theme park. Its name was lost to time, as was the date of its opening and closing, and the reason it was even abandoned in the first place. Even some of the most hardcore urban explorers didn't dare to tread there. Something about it, a good friend had once told Jay, just didn't feel right. Sometimes if you dare to venture into the forest near the theme park at night, you can still hear music. The jolly, piping tunes of rides and carnival stands still beckoning. 
as if to say, we're still here, come and play. Of course, none of this frightened Jay and Michael. They could already smell the sponsorships from headlamp and compact camera companies. No amount of anxiety would stop them from making their doomed trip to the so-called Carnival of Horrors. It's a terrible shame. If they'd listened to the stories of this place about how unnatural and evil it could be, they might still be alive today. Like all the best urban explorers, they arrived at the woods near the abandoned theme park in the dead of night. They ignored the signs warning them about everything from structural instability to dangerous wild animals to asbestos. Nothing would keep them out. Nothing. They reached the abandoned theme park not long after, though it was a mere shell of its former self. During the several decades of abandonment, nature had reclaimed it. The Ferris wheel was covered in overgrown ivy, and the carnival stands were blanketed with mold. As the duo swept through the grounds with their flashlights and cameras, they saw a faded sign that bore the words, Thriller Chiller, the park's most popular roller coaster. They also took their time to marvel at the exceptionally creepy looking Tunnel of Love, the broken down House of Mirrors, and a huge grinning statue of the park's former mascot, Happy Hippo. This theme park was something out of a nightmare which naturally made it potential video gold. But as the excited duo wandered further into the park, they couldn't help but notice the quiet, tinny carnival music. Music that seemed to be drawing them closer. Michael asked Jay if he could hear the strange, impossible music and felt a chill creep in when he answered that he did. Could all of the stories be true? They were lost in thought, but their legs kept moving. They were getting closer to something now. They could feel a presence. And was that music getting louder? An instant later, though, another sound cut through the silence. Bang! Bang! It echoed out through the still night air. Birds flew from their perches in the trees. Jay and Michael both fell to the ground dead, their heads taken off by the 50 caliber rounds of a highly trained mobile task force sniper on the payroll of the SCP Foundation. Their recording equipment, along with their bodies, were taken and destroyed. Any trace of them were scrubbed from the internet. It may seem a little harsh, but a bullet to the head is much kinder fate than what would have awaited these two if they'd kept walking. That's because the Carnival of Horrors is no dark fairy tale. The rumors are all true, and something really is waiting in the dark. That's why this abandoned theme park is known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-823, a Euclid-class anomaly with a violent history. What's even more unnerving is that the researchers studying 823 have repeatedly implored the O5 Council to increase the park's classification to Ketir and allocate more resources for containment, only to be denied. But after you've heard about the horrors that unfolded there and the danger it poses, you'll probably take the researchers' side. The park is divided into two zones, the Yellow Zone and the Red Zone. There are to be at least six members of Foundation personnel present in the Yellow Zone at all times to ensure that no civilians wander in. Our two urban explorers earn themselves a death sentence not just by wandering into the Yellow Zone, but passing dangerously close to the Red Zone. This is the true epicenter of the park's dangerous, anomalous activity. It's a place so hazardous that anyone entering, whether they're a civilian or a member of Foundation staff, is to be executed at a distance by sniper fire without hesitation. Once upon a time, though nobody knows exactly when, there was a theme park that seemed no different to any other. Eager children and thrill-seeking teens arrived by the busload, ready to stuff their faces with cotton candy and corn dogs, and then reverse the process on a vast array of roller coasters. But even then, during these good times, there was something dark lurking behind the cheerful facade. Little by little, everyone, visitors and employees alike, started falling victim to strange and horrific accidents around the park. Of course, when it comes to theme parks, accidents come with the territory, but none like this. Here are just a handful of the horrific and mysterious deaths that occurred while the park was open. So strap in, because just like a roller coaster, this isn't for the faint of heart. A pair of young lovebirds decided they wanted to enjoy the romance of the Tunnel of Love. The two sat in a swan-shaped boat as they were ferried through darkened passageways. Anyone would assume that they were having a great time, but at some point, terrible shrieks of pain and fear began to echo through the ride. Attendants, confused and terrified, stopped the ride and found that the screaming persisted. Just some stupid teens playing a prank, they figured. 
and started the ride again. But when the swan-shaped boat finally exited the Tunnel of Love, the park employees were greeted to a horrifying sight. The two teens dead, their bodies somehow fused together at multiple points. Another unlucky customer met a gruesome fate inside the House of Mirrors. They entered, but while inside, they were stalked by a mysterious, carnivorous humanoid entity known as Subject 79. The customer was pursued and eventually caught by Subject 79 and brutally dismembered. Some parts of the body were fused to the House of Mirrors interior, while others, like the right arm, were never found. The customer actually survived their ordeal, and whether that's a happy ending is up to you. But it wasn't just the customers at the park who were in danger. A 23-year-old park employee working a summer job collapsed while entertaining children dressed as the park's cheerful mascot, Happy Hippo. It wasn't uncommon for people to get overheated and collapse in the heavy suits on hot days. But one thing was different here. He was screaming, crying, and trying desperately to remove his mask. People rushed to help, but nobody could get the suit off and he was declared dead soon after. When he was eventually cut out of the suit, coroners found that the employee had choked to death. His mouth, trachea, and lungs were filled with a fibrous substance later determined to be identical to the stuffing of his costume. An intense roller coaster known as the Thriller Chiller was a magnet for horrific accidents, which became more violent and intense over time. The first accident seemed like a typical theme park tragedy. A safety harness failed, dropping a rider 15 feet during an inverted loop. They landed on the track below, breaking their neck and skull, causing instant death. While this was a tragedy, it wasn't exactly anomalous. But the next major accident on the ride was an entirely different story. This time, 15 people met with disaster while riding the Thriller Chiller roller coaster. Starting from the front and moving back one car at a time, each group of riders was decapitated by blunt force trauma. A new pair of decapitations appeared to happen at every turn and loop on the ride. Forensic scientists still have no idea how this could have possibly occurred. Despite all of these disasters, the park was only finally abandoned after a day known as Bloody Sunday, when the anomalous powers of the location reached a 20-year peak. It's believed that 231 people were killed during the carnage of that day, and another seven were horribly maimed. The SCP Foundation contained the Carnival of Horrors not long after, but the mysterious deaths didn't even end there. Foundation Mobile Task Force Row 71, also known as the Origami Toads, were sent in to assess containment procedures and discover the source of all the anomalous deaths. They were unsuccessful, though, and instead they merely added to the list in exceptionally horrifying ways. One agent was found dead, surrounded by empty grenades and bullet casings. It appeared he'd removed the explosive propellant from all of his ballistics and consumed it, dying in the process. Another was found with his jaw broken, having apparently pulled out and inhaled his own teeth, and dying of the resulting internal damage. The commander got the worst fate of all, so horrifying, in fact, that we can't tell you the full details. All you need to know is that something was shoved into his brain that really didn't belong there. The Foundation considered having the entire park destroyed with a massive airstrike, courtesy of the Mobile Task Force New 7, aka Hammerdown. However, the O5 Council denied this request, on the basis that the park was too close to populated land. They'd have no plausible cover story for the bombing, and they don't even really know if blowing up the park would prevent anomalous activity from occurring. The Carnival of Horrors is here to stay, folks. The Foundation just hopes to keep it from getting new visitors. So then back to why the researchers want this place upgraded to Ketir. After all, these classifications aren't about how dangerous an anomaly is. They're about how difficult and complicated they are to contain. But here's the problem. According to the researchers, the Red Zone, where the dangerous anomalous activity is at its peak, isn't bound to one fixed position. It's changed position at least three times already, and even worse, it appears to be growing. Not seemingly so Euclid class now, is it? After all, you might not even need to visit the Carnival of Horrors to be in grave danger. If it keeps growing, then someday soon, the Carnival of Horrors may be visiting you. Okay guys, so to wrap this video up, I really don't think this cursed episode of this show was real. 
It's obviously just a really good scary fan animation, and the fact that the creators behind it didn't come out and claim ownership of it sooner, allowing it to be reposted and re-uploaded so many times, is really what got people thinking it was legit. That being said, it's still a good attempt at what a cursed lost episode would look like. So shout out to those animators, man. Anyway, I've been the Goat Hellholder98. Be sure to like this video, subscribe to my channel down below, and hey, if you know about any more lost media you want me to cover, leave it in the comments, I'll check it out. Now be sure to follow my socials at Hellholder98. I go live most days and post updates about new videos on my story, so go check it out. All right, until then, I'll see you somewhere down the line. The moment his finger pushed the button to stop the camera recording, the practiced false smile dropped from Holden's face. It was hard not to feel down after he'd finished filming a new video, not thanks to any post-creativity slump, but the more depressing knowledge of just how much of an uphill battle this whole thing was. It felt like yesterday when Holden had first gotten into the creepier side of the internet. He never ventured into anything illicit or outright illegal, mind you, but there was a distinct corner of the web that had pulled him in when he was still at school and just starting to spend more time online. This part of the internet was filled with scary stories that were mostly fake or made up for likes, but that could have been real. There were unsettling animations, short clips that were hand-drawn to give people the creeps and keep them up at night. Not to mention a whole archive of public safety announcement videos, terrifying workplace and road safety warnings that used to be broadcast on TV, and were as petrifying than the most acclaimed horror movies. Speaking of things that were broadcast to TV, that had gradually become Holden's specialty. One of his friends had sent him the link to a fictional account of someone who had supposedly uncovered an unaired episode of a Saturday morning kids cartoon, or so this person claimed anyway. They went on to describe bizarre imagery, so intense and terrifying that it was unbefitting of a show for children. Then, the person who made the original post explained how they got into contact with the show's creators via email to ask them about this cursed episode. The showrunner responded stating that the episode the poster had allegedly seen didn't even exist. To Holden, it didn't matter if the story was real or not. That wasn't the point. What was far more important was that it felt real. To him, it was plausible, even possible, that there were pieces of media out there in the world that had never seen the light of day. Episodes of TV shows or entire movies that were so wild and out there that they could have been banned and buried long before the dawn of the internet, wherein there was a record of everything and nothing was ever really lost. The idea of uncovering those lost pieces of media became Holden's primary hobby. He'd come home from school, throw his backpack onto his bed, and then sit in front of his computer for hours without even changing out of the clothes he had been wearing all day in class. But all the time he spent trawling through forum threads, following and messaging collectors on social media, listening to theories and coming up with his own, eventually it began to encroach on other things. Much to his mom's disappointment, Holden's grades took a rapid decline, and it wasn't long before he was failing his classes bad enough to not make the cut to continue on at school. But as much as it upset his mother, Holden really didn't mind. He was already thinking way beyond high school, and he knew he didn't need grades to be able to do the one thing he wanted to do with his life. Holden set up his own channel, with the plan to start uploading videos under his new online alter ego. And before long, Hellholder98 was born. He centered his whole internet persona around lost media, discussing which popular rumors were true and which were fictionalized for likes and clicks. It started out with a few discussion videos, where he would simply sit in his bedroom, a camcorder opposite him as he spoke. But before long, Holden was adding more and more flair to his content, learning how to edit on his computer, adding clips or screenshots he could find of supposed lost TV episodes to give his videos some credibility, a very necessary quality when trying to determine if certain things were real or not. Each video he finished, he had another two topics to a list of ideas he kept, planning to just perpetually churn out content until he eventually had a huge hit that went viral. Although the one thing he didn't realize until it was perhaps too late was that social media success didn't happen overnight. In fact, it didn't happen over many, many nights either. No matter how often Holden promoted his channel on his social media profiles, or how many new videos he uploaded, he couldn't seem to get any to land well and get boosted by the algorithm. At least that's one of the things he attributed the problem to. He pointed the finger of blame at anything that he could. One day, it was that the algorithm was suppressing his channel and boosting others who had already got more subscribers. 
The next, it might be his slow internet connection had led to one of his videos going live at a time when the site had low traffic. The one possibility that Holden didn't stop to consider was that maybe his genre of content was too niche, or that the days of the internet's interest in lost media had already peaked back when he was still in high school. Nevertheless, he kept trying, making content day in and day out, working under the assumption that if he just made enough videos, then one day he was sure to blow up. That would be his big break, his ultimate win, a video that did well enough to garner thousands, if not millions, of views. But the more time he devoted to Hellholder98, the only number that seemed to be at all increasing was the number of videos he had posted, each one barely garnering view figures that were above a single digit. To make matters worse, getting help with growing his online brand was next to impossible. Every now and then, he would post on forums asking for advice, or if anyone wanted to collaborate so he could gain some exposure from creators with bigger followings. Those posts were often met with a slew of apathetic, snide responses, or comments telling Holden to just, quote, make better content, as if that was solid, specific advice. On top of that, his mom had outright refused to support her son's chosen career path, citing his failure at school as the main reason. Speaking of, any friends Holden previously had at school had all moved away in the years since, going off to pursue college and other higher education. Some were even starting their new and exciting professions. The old saying said, it's lonely at the top, but Holden was just as lonely down at the bottom, posting his content in total obscurity, as if he was just shouting into an empty void with no one around to hear. The few people Holden did still consider his friends were all as chronically online as he was, most of them fellow lost media collectors. After interacting with them in the common threads of various forums, the handful of like-minded guys were as close as Holden had to people actively supporting his channel. The collectors would usually give him pointers or topics to discuss in videos and contributing to the single-digit view count underneath his uploads. Although to him, it wasn't nearly enough. He didn't want just his friends to see his videos. He wanted an audience, a fan base of his own. It was late, the light of the computer monitor illuminating the dark of Holden's bedroom. Hunched over his desk, he was clicking and dragging clips into the timeline of a video project, trimming them down to make the whole thing better paced, snipping out bad takes where he stumbled over his words or misspoke. It was while editing that Holden noticed another screen lighting up on his desk, accompanied by a vibration, his phone. He reached for it, seeing a notification popped up on the lock screen. It was from Goth one of the lost media collectors, and it read, Dude, urgent, found something that you can make a video on. Hold inside. It was late, and he was already focused on editing this current video tonight. If he got it finished, then he could go to sleep. What do you know about the deathly videotape? Goth asked in a second message, before Holden even had a chance to open it first. The what? He replied bluntly, before sending another text saying, Can't this wait until the morning? I'm trying to edit. If you don't act fast, it'll be gone forever, came the response only a second later followed by a link. Lethargically, Holden tapped the hyperlink Goth had sent, his phone opening up its browser and displaying the web page. It was a buy and sell website, one of those places where people offloaded junk they didn't want anymore to strangers for a bit of extra cash. The page in question showed a few grainy photos taken on a phone of a small rectangular object in someone's hand. What is that? Holden asked. It's a videotape, bonehead, Goth fired back. Although they'd never met in person, Holden always got the sense his friend was a little older than he was. Looking back on the seller's ad, it was for a second-hand Sony Color Collection 60-90 to minute mini-DV videotape, a type of cassette used in a lot of old handheld recording cameras. So what? Holden asked in another text. Look, there have been rumors for ages about something called the Deathly Videotape. Goth replied in a series of rapid-fire messages. It used to be all the rage on a lot of old lost media forums, the real nasty ones before they got shut down. Supposedly, there's a recording on this tape of some kind of live show, except when you put in your VCR and press play, you see something horrible. Nobody even knows if it's real or just a legend. How do you know this is the same tape? Holden queried. By now, he had typed out the same link on his computer and was looking at the for sale page on the bigger screen while he texted back and forth with Goth. Read the item description, he answered. Holden's eyes scanned down the page, finding a short message from the seller. To anyone interested, I'm giving this old mini-DV tape away. I don't know where I got it or why I watched it, but I wish I hadn't. It had ruined everything for me. It's impossible to enjoy anything else now that I've seen what's on it. Let me make this clear, I am not selling this tape. I'm giving it away free of charge. I hope that getting rid of it will help. Sounds ominous, 
Holden texted. If you're so sure if this is the Deathly videotape, then why don't you get it? Keep reading, Goth responded. Underneath the item description was another note that the seller had written. Please note, I am unable to leave my town at present, nor can I mail this tape to anyone even if you pay postage. Collection only. If you're interested, please contact me at the following address. Below was an address. It was in Holden's hometown, only a few streets away from where he and his mom lived. This could be it, dude. Came another slew of messages from Goth. You buy this tape and make a video recording, then you might finally go viral. But you better be quick before someone goes and picks it up thinking it's just an ordinary tape. Holden looks back at the address, double-checking where it was. At most, it'd take a quick walk there and back, he thought. And if this tape was as elusive as Goth said it was, then owning it would mean Holden would be the only one who could make a video featuring it. After messaging the seller the night before, Holden found himself rushing through his quiet neighborhood to the address. All night as he tried to sleep, he kept thinking of the video he was going to make, how it could finally put him on the map, and at long last, bring him the e-fame he'd been working towards. Wrapping his knuckles against the front door, he was met by an older man who stood on the other side. He was walking with a crutch, with a few bruises and stitched up cuts on his face. The second that Holden explained he was there for the tape, the man reached to an unseen shelf just inside the doorframe and thrust the rectangular cassette into his hands before shutting the door as quickly as he could without it hitting Holden square in the face. He stared at the tape in his hands, though through its transparent green plastic case, he could see a hand-scrawled note. I know you'll ignore me if I tell you not to watch this, it read. So if you do, then on your own head be it. Having spent the rest of the day looking up exactly what he'd need to play such an old outmoded recording format and convert the footage to digital so he could include it in his video, Holden had retrieved his mom's old VHS player from the attic, wiping the thick layer of dust off of it. It took a while for him to get everything ready to go, not just finding the right adapters and cables to hook the VCR up to his TV, as well as linking that to his computer, plus angling his camera right, and making sure the ring light he'd bought for filming was putting enough focus on his face. After the substantial prep, Holden took a deep breath, summoning up the faux excitement and staged smile before he hit the record button on his camera. What's up guys, it's Hellholder98 here. Now today I've got a real treat for you all. So my friend Goth, shout out to him, told me that a while ago there was talk about something called the Deathly Videotape. We found a mini DV tape that we think might be that very same tape, so we're gonna watch it and see if it's legit. Dropping his persona as his face turned away from the camera, Holden punched the play button on the VHS player. His eyes glued to the TV screen as the camera's lens was fixated on him. Okay, nothing so far, he observed, met with nothing but a blank, black screen. Suddenly, after 12 seconds of nothing, the playback started instantly, and Holden started relaying what he was seeing on the tape to the camera. There was no sound, either because the recording on the videotape was filmed in that way, or Holden had improperly figured out how to hook it up to the VHS. The video itself showed a recording of Sesame Street Live, and for the most part just seemed pretty underwhelming. Characters were up on stage, their puppeteers managing to stay out of sight as they entertained their young audience. After two and a half minutes, Holden was starting to feel like he'd gone to all this effort over what seemed to just be someone's old, unwanted home video. Just as he was considering turning off the camera and throwing the videotape in the trash, at almost the three-minute mark, something weird started happening on the stage. The actor playing one of the bigger characters seemed to be having some trouble, instantly trying to pull off his cumbersome costume, much to the distress of the kids in the audience looking on in horror. But it wasn't just the illusion that had been broken. The actor was trying to get out of his costume because he was choking. He dropped to his knees on stage, clawing at his own throat before finally falling face down, totally still, asphyxiated, dead. Over the next almost 20 seconds, the same thing started happening to another three of the characters on stage all of them violently choking while the children in the audience screamed and cried silently on the inaudible tape. Then, at three and a half minutes, the video cut out. Holden was unsure how to react, at first a little creeped out, only to be somewhat bemused. He played it down for the camera, remarking that the video seemed tame compared to some of the more graphic fake content he'd seen. But the whole time, even after rapping, recording, sitting awake all night to edit his reaction video, Blurring out the parts that would break the terms of service, he had no idea what he'd seen was actually real or not. Finishing the final edit just as the sun was coming up, Holden hit upload and crawled into bed while his video was uploaded. The buzz of a text message from Goth awoke him, 
Dude, I told you this video was going to make it big. Without even replying, Holden booted up his computer and opened the page for his newly uploaded video. The view count was already in the thousands and climbing, comments pouring in underneath, mostly from people debating whether or not the contents of the tape had been faked. Holden punched the air in excitement. He'd finally done it. But as the video kept playing, he heard a retching sound coming from the computer's speakers. He turned to look back at his earlier self, filmed only the night before. Except what he was seeing play out on screen now wasn't what he remembered happening last night. It couldn't have, because the Holden in that video was choking. That wasn't possible. He was alive and watching his own video right now. But somehow the footage was shown him dying, his airway blocked, face turning red, then blue as tears streamed down his cheeks. In the video, Hellholder 98 fell down, dead from asphyxiation, and watching it made Holden feel sick. To make matters worse, none of the comments under the video seemed to have witnessed the same ending. Holden even texts Goth to ask if the same thing had happened, but he described the ending exactly as Holden remembered filming it. But afterwards, it didn't stop happening. Everything he watched ended the same. Every clip online, every TV show, every movie. Holden couldn't even read a book without some characters, fictional or otherwise, keeling over and choking to death, just like the characters on the tape. He barely had time to acknowledge the hits his reaction to the deathly videotape were getting. He was too busy trying to figure out why he couldn't stop seeing people dying the exact same way, even himself when he watched back his old Hellholder 98 videos. Reacting to the deathly videotape garnered a respectable 3 million views, but Hellholder 98 never uploaded again afterwards. His channel went silent, remembered only as a one-hit wonder, until the video and the entire channel were taken down. Holden was never reported missing. The Foundation made sure of that when they came by to collect SCP-583 and place the videotape into containment. An elderly woman watches from her living room window as heavy sheets of rain fall outside. She rocks back and forth in her chair nervously. It's been raining for days. The road is washed out. I can't get into town. Oh, what am I to do? What am I to do? She says out loud to herself. The rocking chair creaks under her weight, but not as much as it had three days ago, before she ran out of food. I am so hungry, the old lady moans. She glances at the door that leads to her basement. Maybe I can find something to eat down there. She stands up. Her 90-year-old bones creak as she slowly shuffles towards the basement door. The empty chair rocks back and forth from the old woman's momentum, as if someone is still sitting in it. She opens the door and looks into the pitch black darkness. There are no windows down there. The only light is connected to a drawstring in the middle of the room. The old woman slowly makes her way down the uneven wooden steps. When she reaches the bottom, she reaches out her wrinkled hand, groping in the darkness for the drawstring. Her hand brushes something. It feels like sticky yarn. Then she feels the legs of a spider scurry up her arm. The old woman lets out a shriek as her hand locates the string and she pulls hard. The light flickers on. It creates a dim glow, but at least she can now see what's in the basement. The string swings back and forth, casting a snake-like shadow on the far wall. The old woman scans the floor for anything to eat. A leftover tuna can, some pickled vegetables, a rat. Anything will do at this point. There is nothing there. The old woman feels her strength has been almost completely drained. She doesn't know how she'll make it back up the stairs. In desperation, she looks around the basement one last time. Her eyes fall on an old rusty saw. She pauses for a moment. I need to eat, she whispers. The old woman slowly walks towards the saw. She picks it up and examines it. God gave me two hands for a reason, she says her eyes locked on the rusty blade. She places one hand on the wooden workbench that sits against the wall and grips the saw tightly with the other. The old woman takes a deep breath and brings the saw down towards her hand. Where are we going? D-94322 asks the SCP agent driving the car. House on Hadley Hill, the agent responds. Well, that doesn't sound creepy at all, D-94322 says as he cranes his neck to get a glimpse of the top of the mountain through the SUV window. Why don't we just play the quiet game until we get there? The agent says as he focuses on the pothole-ridden back roads of Mount Zion, Georgia. D-94322 holds on tightly to the handhold above him to keep his body from slamming into the door every time they go over a big bump. 
They continue on for a few more minutes when a rundown house comes into view. The agent pulls off the road and stops the SUV. Here you go, he says, handing D94322 an earpiece. What am I supposed to do with this? D94322 asks. Just stick it in your ear, the agent says with just a little contempt in his voice. You don't have to be rude about it, D94322 replies as he grabs the earbud and sticks it in his ear. Hello, testing, anybody out there? Hello, D94322. Can you hear me? Says a voice in his head. Uh, yeah. You can just call me D94 for short. D94322 is kind of a mouthful. Very well. The voice from the earbud agrees. My name is Dr. Andrews. I will be walking you through this test with SCP-4173. All right, Doc, shall we get this party started? D94 says as he steps out of the SUV. He looks up at the house that sits atop Hadley Hill. The sky is dark and clouds race over the mountain as if they would rather be anywhere else but here. Here we go. D94 starts walking up the slippery hill, being careful not to fall. He reaches the overgrown walkway leading up to the house and pauses. Is there a problem? Dr. Andrews asks. No, just trying to psych myself up to go into this creepy house, responds D94. What's inside anyways? That is not your concern at the moment. But if you do exactly as I tell you, you should be in and out in no time. <laughs> Whatever you say, Doc. D94 walks down the path, reaches his hand out, and grips the cool brass knob. He turns it and pushes the door open. The inside of the house smells like mothballs and decay. All right, I'm in, he says. Good. Head down the hallway and turn to your left. You'll see a door that leads to the basement. Let me know when you're there. D94 walks down the hallway. The old wooden floor groans under his feet. He reaches the basement door. It's slightly ajar. Ugh, this place gives me the creeps. Rightfully so, Dr. Andrews chimes in. It is an old spooky house on top of an old spooky hill in the middle of nowhere. Obviously, it's going to be creepy. An old woman died here under mysterious circumstances around 20 years ago, but you don't really need to worry about that. No ghosts here, I think. You think? D94 shouts as he takes a step away from the basement door. <laughs> I'm just kidding. There's nothing but harmless old SCP-4173 in that house. And when has an SCP ever hurt anyone, right? There is a long, uncomfortable pause. <clears throat> Anyways, why don't you head on downstairs so we can get you out of there as soon as possible? Yeah, sure, D94 says as he begins his descent into the darkness. I can't see anything. Is there a light? No, I think it burnt out years ago. But that's okay, I can guide you. It's what I'm here for, says Dr. Andrews. Walk towards the east wall, but watch your head. The ceiling is low in that corner. You'll see what you're looking for when you get there. D94 is silent for a moment. East? He asks. Turn left, Dr. Andrews responds. Oh, all right, why didn't you say so, Doc? D94 turns left and walks forward. After a few feet, there's a loud bang as he slams his head into the ceiling. Son of a bitch! I told you to watch your head. Yeah, thanks, says D94 as he rubs the bump forming beneath his hair. This place is even spookier than the first floor, you know that, right? I promise there's nothing in that room right now that can hurt you, Dr. Andrews reassures D94. Wait, what do you mean right now? Don't worry about it, just let me know when you reach the wall, D94. After a few seconds, D94's eyes adjust to the darkness. He can just make out the damp concrete wall in front of him. It looks as if the wall is perspiring. I'm here, he says. Good. There's a little door, maybe five feet to your left. You see it? Asks Dr. Andrews. D94 turns. Yeah, I, I see it. it. It's closed. The door itself is not very big, maybe a foot long and a half a foot wide. Open it, says Dr. Andrew. D94 hesitates. What, what's in there? Nothing, just open it. Dr. Andrews repeats himself. No way, man, you're lying and I'm not opening anything until you tell me what's on the other side of that door. Dr. Andrews sighs. We both know that you're going to do as I say, D94322. You have no other choice, unless you want to go back to that death row cell block where we found you. D94 shakes his head and rubs the bridge of his nose. Fine, fine, he says. Dr. Andrews can hear the squeaking of hinges through the microphone on D94's earbud. It's open, now what? Do you see anything? 
Um, uh, no. There's some cobwebs and dirt, but other than that, it's just dark. D94 thinks for a moment. Why is this little door here? Is this some, like, pet door or something? You have to be, I don't know, pretty small to get in there. Agreed. Just hang tight and let me know when you hear something. We won't keep you there for long. He hear something? Like, like what? Asks D94. You'll know when you hear it, says Dr. Andrews. Five minutes go by without a sound. Then ten. Fifteen. The basement is damp and cold. D94 thinks he sees creatures scurrying around the floor, but he doesn't say anything because acknowledging them makes his situation more real and a lot more scary. After a half hour of waiting in silence, D94 screams, What the heck was that? What was what? Dr. Andrews is startled out of a daydream by the shouts of D94 in his ear. Something just moved past the door. I definitely saw it. What in God's name was that? Yells D94. Dr. Andrews tries to remain calm, but he can barely contain his excitement. The entity in the wall is why you're down there. What do you mean? You said there wasn't anything down here. I said there was nothing down there that could hurt you. If you follow my instructions, this will continue to be true. Can you hear anything? Asks Dr. Andrews. No, I can't hear it. But before D-94 can finish his sentence, a voice speaks from behind the wall. He can't understand what the voice is saying at first, but as his heart begins to slow and the blood stops thumping in his ears, D-94 can make out her words. Oh, thank goodness. I wasn't sure you'd be able to find me. What took you so long? Says the voice of an old woman. D-94 takes a step back from the door. There's someone on the other side of that wall? He hisses into the microphone at Dr. Andrews. Tell it that the road is out, and you had to find another way up, says Dr. Andrews in D-94's earpiece. What? Why? Just do it if you want to get out of there, D-94, Dr. Andrews says a little impatiently. Ah, uh, the, the road is out, so I had to find another way up, says D-94 to the little open door in the wall. Oh, yes, the rain washed it out. I was worried I would never get to see another person again being stuck up here and all. Can you see me? Asks the voice. Um, no, I, I can't, says D-94. Doc, what is on the other side of that wall? Come over here a little closer. I, I can't see you properly either, says the voice. It's fine, you can get closer. Just don't touch the door, Dr. Andrews says. I really don't want to do that says D-94. Do it, and you will be that much closer to getting out. I hate you, whispers D-94. He slowly approaches the little door and speaks into it. He Hello? Oh, there you are. The voice pauses as if whoever is speaking is examining D-94. I'm sorry, I can't see like I used to. It's so dark in here and it's been so long. R reach through the door and let me feel your hand so I can tell you're really there. What? D-94 steps away from the door. No way am I putting my hand in there. Come on now, don't be rude. I just want to feel that you're there. It's been so long. Just, just a touch. The voice says a little harsher than before. Screw you, lady. I'm not getting my hands anywhere near this creepy hole in the wall, says D-94. He turns around and starts walking away from the little door towards the staircase leading back to the main level of the house. Before he can put his foot on the first step, D-94 hears Dr. Andrew's voice screaming in his ear. Stop moving! Look, you're going to have to do it. We haven't been able to recover anyone who refuses to do what she asks. I cannot guarantee your safety unless you put your hand through that door. Are you kidding me? Shouts D-94. You're telling me that sweet, creepy old lady will somehow kill me if I don't do what she asks? We're not entirely sure what happens, but you need to put your hand through that door if you want to get out of there, says Dr. Andrews. D-94 turns back toward the little door and slowly approaches it. This is my nightmare, he says more to himself than anyone else. He reaches out slowly and puts his fingers through the doorway. He immediately pulls them back and steps away from the door. I, I, I really don't want to do this. D-94 whispers. He steps forward again and sticks his hand all the way through the doorway. For a moment, nothing happens. All, all right, I've got my hand in there. Now what? Oh, I can see you now. You're right there. Thank you for coming. Oh, it's been so long since someone came. And with a gift as well? Oh, sweetling, you're so kind. So kind to me. G gift What gift? D-94 asks nervously. It's so dark and lonesome, and I've just been so hungry for such a long time. Thank you, sweetling. I'll take your gift from you. 
You are such a rude little brat. You don't really deserve it. You've had it for too long, and you don't deserve it. It's mine now. Mine for my belly. Thank you. What are you talking about, you psycho? D94 stutters. Suddenly, something grabs his hand and pulls him against the wall. He screams in agony as Dr. Andrews hears a wet, ripping sound coming through the microphone. It sounds as if some type of metal instrument is cutting through flesh. Oh god! No! Help me! Help me! D94 screams. Please! 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 Dr. Andrews hears the sound of D94's body hitting the floor as he passes out. It's quiet for a moment. Don't worry, you ungrateful child. Don't worry. I'll fill you up too. You can have mine. I'll give it to you, sweet boy. Good boy, fill you up, says the old woman's voice from the other side of the wall. Dr. Andrews listens as the hinges of the little door squeak and it clicks shut. He picks up the phone next to him and dials it. Go in and get him. Bring him back to Site 94 for observation. And try to keep this one alive, please. He hangs up the phone and prepares the lab for D94322 to be brought in. D-94 slowly comes out of his medically induced coma two days after the incident with SCP-4173. He's stable, but doesn't feel great, and he can't help but sense that something is different. D-94 looks at where his hand should be. There's nothing there. That crazy old lady ate my hand! He starts screaming. A medical team rushes in as red lights begin to flash and sirens blare. They attempt to restrain D-94. During the struggle, D-94 catches a glimpse of himself in a mirror on the far side of the room. He stops fighting for a moment. There is a growth expanding from his head. What the heck is that? He yells, pointing to his reflection. D-94 begins to struggle again, this time much more intensely. He begins scratching at the growth on the side of his head without much success. In the process, he pushes the growth further into his skull. It penetrates his brain. D-94 blacks out. The medical team ties D-94 to the bed and tries to get a reading on his vitals. The growth is putting too much pressure on his brain. They rush him to the ER, but D-94322 dies before he reaches the operating table. Dr. Andrews stands over the body of the deceased Class D subject. Cut him open, he says to the doctor standing in the room. One of them pulls out a scalpel and makes an incision into the side of D-94's head. What is that? One of the doctors says. The other bends over to get a better look. After a moment, he turns away and vomits into his face mask. Dr. Andrews picks up a pair of forceps off the table. He sticks them deep into the hole in the side of D-94's head and clamps down hard. Dr. Andrews pulls out a decomposing hand. The fingers are still moving, as if trying to grab onto something. There is no explanation for how it got in there, but it is obvious that SCP-4173 played some sort of role in the phenomenon. Dr. Andrews goes back into his office to review previous case files on SCP-4173. Everyone who had put their hand into the small doorway has been pulled towards the wall and had their hand chopped off. The severed appendage never ends up being a clean cut, which leads Dr. Andrews to hypothesize the gruesome makeshift operation is done with some sort of tool with teeth. Once the hand of the victim is severed, SCP-4173 always thanks the person for their gift. She then informs them not to worry about their hand, as it will be replaced. But then something incredibly strange happens. Like with D-94, a decaying hand will appear somewhere in the body, but it isn't always inside the head. In fact, depending on how polite the test subject is to the old woman behind the door, the closer to the wrist the decaying hand actually ends up. For the test subjects who are rude to the old lady, the decaying hand ends up in some pretty interesting places. <laughs> she really hated D94322, chuckles Dr. Andrews to himself. Dr. Andrews continues flipping to the back of the file on SCP-4173. The SCP Foundation doesn't quite know how it happens, but people who refuse to offer their hand to SCP-4173 suffer a worse fate than those who surrender to the old lady. In every case where a subject tries to get away from the small door, some inexplicable force seems to grab them from behind and drag them through the tiny opening. In these cases, there is nothing left of the test subject. It is likely fatal as a human is much smaller than the opening itself. So the only way a body could fit through the doorway is if every bone is broken and every muscle compressed to a quarter of its actual size. I'm not sure which is worse. 
Dr. Andrews says aloud as he closes the file on SCP-4173. He glances at the picture paperclip to the front of the manila folder depicting the tiny doorway. He can't quite pinpoint why, but the fact that the door slowly closes after the old woman gets what she needs from her victims sends chills down his spine. The words of the old woman echo in his head. Don't worry, I'll fill you up too. You can have mine. I'll give it to you, sweet boy. Good boy, fill you up. Morality tends to get lost very quickly when you start working at the SCP Foundation. During the whirlwind of basic training, site orientation, and learning the difference between Euclid, Keter, and Thaumiel object classes, you'll have to make peace with the fact that, as a new member of Foundation staff, you'll probably end up having to turn a blind eye to doing some morally compromising things. Then again, it's such a normal everyday occurrence at the Foundation that almost everyone working for them is desensitized to whatever ethically dubious or downright violent tasks they have to partake in. And at the end of the day, everyone knows that it's all for the greater good, to keep anomalies securely in containment for the benefit and protection of humanity. But the one part of Foundation life that Simon Bennett just couldn't reason with was the very existence of D-Class personnel. Now anyone with previous knowledge of the SCP Foundation's dubious practices will, of course, be aware of D-Class. But to Simon, who had just been recruited as a member of Site Security personnel, the whole concept was not only alien, but completely abhorrent. D-Class personnel, as he'd come to learn, were completely expendable. Their ranks were filled with convicted felons, almost all of them guilty of violent crimes. The Foundation seemed to have a habit of plucking inmates from the highest security prisons and penitentiaries in the world, covering their tracks by staging the deaths of these unwilling recruits into D-Class. From there, these criminals were essentially used as little more than human lab rats. And it was this part that really didn't sit well with Simon. The very idea left him torn. On the one hand, D-Class were arguably the worst of the worst. Most, if not all of them, were guilty of horrific and brutal crimes, some that could never be forgiven by anyone. But on the other, Simon struggled to rationalize taking these prisoners from their incarceration, only to subject them to anomalous creatures and entities. Most SCPs could do things to a D-Class that were almost as bad as what these convicts had done to their victims and some could dole out far, far worse fates. Did their actions make their cruel fates justifiable? Did D-Class personnel deserve the amount of punishment for their crimes? Simon didn't know. It was a perplexing moral conundrum. Most days at the Foundation, those questions echoed around his head. He was probably better suited to a role in the Ethics Committee than rank-and-file security. He was uncertain if it was better to leave a violent murderer to serve their sentence in prison until their eventual execution or abduct them and use them as a D-Class guinea pig. It wasn't long before his fellow security officers tried to dissuade Simon from questioning the Foundation's methods, reminding him how lucky he was to be selected to join them, and how an easy application of amnestics could take that all away, leaving him not only jobless, but his memory wiped as well. Ultimately, as weeks turned into months, then became years in the blink of an eye, security officer Bennett's moral compass was ground down. He started getting used to the idea of the Foundation's way of doing things, asking fewer and fewer questions to oppose how morally and ethically ambiguous a lot of their experiments and procedures were. Obedience to others slowly became apathy, and the Simon that had once been concerned with the ethics of D-Class experimentation soon began looking at them as expendable assets, just like the rest of the SCP Foundation did. He even started to resent a few of them that seemed to have gotten off easy, on a few occasions, a member of D-Class personnel got to interact with the friendly kind of anomaly. It didn't seem fair, Simon thought, that while he and the other security personnel had to put their lives on the line whenever a dangerous SCP breached containment, meanwhile a D-Class, who might have been a multiple murderer or domestic terrorist, got to sit in the testing chamber with a friendly entity, like SCP-999, the Tickle Monster. Keeping up to date with the special containment procedures for the various anomalous objects and beings held at the Foundation was an essential part of a security officer's job. Ongoing testing and new discoveries that were about an entity often led to them needing new, updated measures to keep them securely contained. But it was during a routine check of these procedures that Simon came across something strange. 
Well, maybe not so strange when you work at the SCP Foundation, but definitely a noticeable level of strangeness. Reading through the containment procedures for one of the anomalies housed at the site, Simon found a list of instructions, fairly standard stuff for the Foundation. The strange part was that he was sure that he had never read this list before, but at the same time, it wasn't a new update recently added to an entry in the SCP archive. It was paradoxically brand new information, a detailed description of containment measures, yet also seemingly something that had been written and archived ages ago. Reading through the instructions, they described a process that was essential to keeping one of the site's anomalies secure. It had even been given its own name, the special containment procedures referring to the whole practice as a monthly termination. The more that Simon read, his eyes would widen further as he learned exactly what the steps of this process entailed. In his earlier days, he wouldn't have thought of this so-called monthly termination as excessive, a needlessly cruel act even by the standards of the SCP Foundation. But that was the old Simon, a man who hadn't yet become jaded by his work, before he had come to adopt the same apathy and disregard for life as his fellow Foundation personnel. Reaching the end of the passage, describing monthly termination, Simon alerted the other security officers, making sure they read the procedure too. Some unknown feelings stirred deep within Simon, telling him this needed to be carried out, and it had to happen right now. Before long, members of staff had been told to read the entry on monthly termination, each one passing it on to their colleagues. Then, Simon and a large detachment of other guards began marching towards the cell blocks where D-Class personnel were imprisoned. Almost a third of the site's incarcerated inmates were rounded up. It couldn't have been any more than a few hundred. Simon wasn't sure. He couldn't see all of them from where he was standing, but mostly, he didn't care. All he could focus on was following the monthly termination procedure to the letter. Together, he and the security detachment escorted the collected D-Class personnel through the facility single file, all marching in efficient and perfectly synchronized motion. It was almost like a choreographed military display. If he hadn't been so preoccupied with thinking only of the procedure, Simon might have realized how strange all this was. All the personnel were moving at once in such flawless timing, even though this hadn't been planned in advance. And yet he and the other personnel had only just learned about monthly termination, and yet they were carrying it out as if they had done it a thousand times before. The security officers continued ferrying the D-classes through the facility, eventually leading the convicted felons to the main entrance. The doors were opened without question. Nobody who had read the monthly termination instructions saw what was going on as anything out of the ordinary. A long, winding row of inmates in Foundation-issue orange jumpsuits were then guided out of the site's main doors, instructed by the security to keep walking even further. None of them knew how far they'd really walked. A lot of D-Class personnel complained and moaned, but the few that tried to leave the single-file line were quickly put back in place by the security department. Most of them were directly verbally aggressive, cursing and threatening the security officers, but they seemed compliant, walking the way they were told to. It was as if they had to obey, almost like their legs wouldn't let them resist. One begged to be let go, turning to Simon and pleading not to be taken wherever it was they were going. I'm sorry, Simon replied plainly, with barely any emotion behind his words. It was a lie. He didn't feel sorry. In fact, he hadn't even been sure why he apologized at all. The reply had happened almost unnaturally, like something else was speaking through him. He wasn't even sure how far away they'd gotten from the facility. It might have felt like miles if he hadn't been thinking about it, but he wasn't. None of the officers were. They were following their instructions, totally unaware that they'd been walking for so long that they were starting to get blisters. They all somehow knew they had gotten far enough, beyond the reach and sight of the Foundation facility they started in, so far in fact that the surveillance systems wouldn't be able to see them. Still moving with the same complete synchronous timing, Simon and the other security officers herded the D-Class personnel towards a wooded clearing. They formed a ring around the inmates before pushing them down onto their knees. A few of them hung their heads, some even shedding a tear. They had already figured out what was about to happen. Those that hadn't quickly caught up when they saw the security officers covering or deactivating their head cameras, then reaching for their sidearms. When they returned to the facility, Simon and the other officers would all give the same story. They collectively led a third of the site's D-Class to an area out of surveillance range, and executed them all with their handguns. At least, that's how they all remembered the incident. But what they thought they'd done didn't quite match what had actually happened. 
Naturally, the Foundation higher-ups quickly got wind of what happened and of such a massive expenditure of their expendable D-Class resources. The incident forced the SCP Foundation to launch a full-blown investigation into the actions of Simon, the other security officers, and additional personnel on site. They quickly recognized the pattern of behavior. They had seen it before. They already knew not one of the guards had actually fired their weapons. In fact, none of them had been acting of their own free will. Simon and the others had no idea that the monthly termination procedure didn't exist in the Foundation's records and was actually the symptom of an SCP-2193 event. All those D-Class that had been rounded up and marched out into the middle of nowhere were still gone, though. Not shot point-blank like the officers thought, but the prisoners were still no longer alive, either. Although he'd never remember it, when Simon had been stood amongst his fellow officers, one of the D-Class had begun floating upwards. Lifted off the ground by some invisible force, the convicted felon drifted about three meters in the air without warning. The prisoner was then launched up, practically fired towards the sky like a rocket, traveling into the upper atmosphere at several times the speed of sound. One by one, the members of D-Class all began experiencing the same thing, floating off the ground only to be catapulted up into the stratosphere with such speed and force that they vanished from view in seconds. Meanwhile, all Simon and the other security officers did was stand by and watch, keeping their head cams covered or switched off. The last of the D-Class prisoners stood in the clearing, the one that had asked Simon to be set free. He was still asking, begging to be helped down as his feet were hoisted up against his will, practically screaming for someone, anyone, to do something. His eyes locked with Simon's for a split second before he too was sent hurtling into the sky. Moving that high and that fast isn't something a human being is at all likely to survive. Now rid of the D-Class that they had led to their deaths, all the gathered security personnel looked up. It was night. Starlight cast across an inky canvas of dark sky, but Simon was fixated on the moon. They all were. None of them could take their eyes off it as it slowly appeared to blink, like a watchful eye hanging in the space above them. Not one of them would remember what they had seen or what they had truly done. No member of D-Class was a saint, it's true. They were murderers, criminals, and dangerous individuals. Maybe some of them were so bad that they did deserve to be used as test subjects, to die at the hands of anomalous entities. But then again, does anyone really deserve to go out like that? Little is known about the point of origin of SCP-2193. While it affects the documents stored within the Foundation's database, it does not function like a computer virus or artificial intelligence. Instead, SCP-2193-1 is an anomalous piece of information, or an info hazard, as SCPs like this are known. It has been known to infect digital files, specifically the special containment procedures for various entities, objects, and creatures that the Foundation has recorded in its archives. Even their most talented computer engineers and anomalous researchers cannot determine how this info hazard is able to accomplish this. It seems to infect files at random, without any repeating pattern in its timing or the type of SCP files it appears in. Upon infection, a file now containing SCP-2193-1 will include references to a monthly termination of D-Class personnel, making it as an essential process for keeping an anomaly secure. Anyone that reads this suffers from what is known as a mimetic effect. Essentially, they will believe what they have read and believe that they have always been aware of this information. On top of that, a person infected by SCP-2193-1 will accept it as true that the monthly termination is a legitimate and accepted practice within the SCP Foundation. They can't be convinced that killing hundreds of D-Class personnel is anything less than justified. Now, you might be forgiven for thinking that uninfected personnel can easily explain to those who have been affected by SCP-2193-1 that the monthly termination isn't an official Foundation policy, but this info hazard has proven itself to be particularly infectious when spreading its mimetic influence. Any member of Foundation personnel not yet exposed to SCP-2193-1 can be easily convinced that the monthly termination is both morally acceptable and a Foundation-held procedure that is absolutely necessary for anomaly containment. If anyone that has read and therefore believes the monthly termination process, then they will display a lack of cognitive dissonance whenever someone attempts to present them with information that conflicts with SCP-2193-1. While no document within their internal database has a record of the monthly termination procedure, back in January of 1999, 
the foundation was able to witness the process secondhand via one of its agents. During an SCP-2193 event, Agent Yusan's head camera was left uncovered, recording excerpts of the precise and perfectly choreographed execution of numerous D-Class personnel. Much like the event Simon was a part of, an unknown anomaly caused the Earth's moon to appear to blink. It is believed by some within the Foundation that this is the result of a form of eldritch entity, a being that demands a substantial human sacrifice every month. This being, as of yet, remains unidentified. Just as unclear is this anomaly's intentions, motives, or how it is able to affect, or perhaps use, the moon. Of course, the SCP Foundation has its own personnel stationed up there. However, during recorded instances of SCP-2193 events, their agents at Luna Area 32 have reported no unusual activity or abnormalities at the corresponding times. The running theory among some personnel is that the moon isn't this unidentified being's actual eye, but some kind of ocular device like a spyglass that allows it to observe the monthly termination. Whatever this being is, it apparently possesses an immense level of power. How exactly it is able to create SCP-2193-1 and infiltrate the Foundation's internal database with that info hazard is still unknown. As is the exact reason why it goes to such trouble, such incalculable lengths, seemingly just for the purpose of killing so many D-Class inmates. The immediate assumption, albeit admittedly a morbid and cynical one, held by most Foundation researchers studying SCP-2193, is that this entity needs this almost ritualistic monthly sacrifice in order to sustain itself. One idea suggests it could be a creature that opposes how the Foundation uses its D-Class personnel. Maybe it, just like Simon used to, questions the morality of convicts being used as expendable guinea pigs. And as such, it uses its eldritch levels of power to remove them from the Foundation's reach for good. Or perhaps despite its subterfuge, this being feeds on those who have wronged others, making D-Class personnel prime candidates. That would certainly explain why the monthly termination procedure causes security officers to only bring the Foundation's force of expendable convicts. And after all, there are benevolent SCPs out there, even friendly ones. So it stands to reason that this being could be trying to rid the world of people who are bad enough to be put into D-Class. But then again, this world is rarely so kind. SCP-2193-1 makes Foundation officers bring D-Classes out to where they can't be seen causing them to cover their head cameras and believe a phony story about execution by sidearm so nobody knows what really happens to them. It even hides the info hazard detailing the monthly termination procedures at random, moving it around to a new file whenever it's detected. Such great effort is taken by this entity to cover its tracks, which would suggest a far more nefarious goal. It is entirely possible that this being does all this simply to amuse itself, expending countless lives and Foundation resources purely for a sick, sadistic form of entertainment. With no way of knowing the entity's true intention, the SCP Foundation can only sit and vigilantly wait, an artificial intelligence surveying their database for the next instance of SCP-2193. Call them what you will, be it myths, urban legends, ghost stories, or just fool yarns. The fact is, we have all heard at least one. Traditionally, stories like that were just shared around a campfire, but nowadays they have ended up spreading far and wide across internet message boards and creepy threads. Everything ranging from unsolved missing persons cases actually being the result of alien abductions, to haunted videos carrying an unforgiving curse or some missing unaired episode of popular TV shows that had somehow been unearthed by an online sleuth. We're always quick to share these ideas, these stories, but deep down a part of us knows that there's no truth to them. Urban myths are speculation that someone has turned into a tale of terror for nothing more than to give some quick scares to whoever they tell it to. But then that person passes that tale on to someone else, and suddenly the story had become a widespread legend with no discernible point of origin. Sure, they might still be fictional, but through sharing these stories, we as humans bring them to life. Not literally, of course, that would be outlandish. After all, when was the last time you heard of a fictional story becoming reality? Growing up with exposure and unfiltered access to the internet in the late 2000s, Paul Jacobs and his friends had been fascinated with, and admittedly pretty terrified by, the notorious legend 
of the Slender Man. It began as whisperings in an online forum, a story that was intentionally designed to be a modern-day urban myth. And just like so many others before it, the myth spread. What had started as a forum post became unnerving photoshopped images of a tall, faceless figure in a suit lurking in the woods, next an indie video game, and even a real-world tragedy. Given how young he was at the time, still being in high school, Paul and a few others had bought into the Slender Man myth wholesale. He believed it to be real, this towering, expressionless boogeyman. The more he learned about this malevolent creature, every story, blog post, or creepy YouTube video made about Slender Man only added more and more to his legend and kept young Paul awake at night, afraid that every noise outside his bedroom window was the faceless horror. Of course, if you take away that belief, the possibility an urban legend might be true, then it simply loses its power. It's that potential, that maybe, towing the line between fantasy and reality that can allow these stories to go on and incite fear forever. But that wasn't the case for the Slenderman story, and the craze for it quickly died down after it was debunked numerous times over casting it permanently back into the realm of fiction. But the profound effect the legend had on Paul at a young age ended up informing his future. As he grew older, his past fear of certain stories became a keen interest in how these tales could influence people. Could any story have that same impact, or only those that walked the line between fictional and maybe being true? Did these urban legends become more real to people because of their subject matter? Or did human beings give them that power to transcend the constraints of fiction just by believing in them? As Paul got older, he began to study the truth behind certain urban legends, attempting to trace them back to their origins. Some were often inspired by real events, but with specific details that had gradually been altered from the original story the more and more people passed it around. Ghost stories seemed to be the most changeable, but with some roots in the real world. A person might have died a hundred years ago, and the story of them haunting their old home or final resting place would start to circulate. Then, shortly after, another similar story might emerge, and the two would overlap. Whoever was telling each story might have added or omitted certain details or combined elements of more than one tale, until what was left being passed around was neither the first story nor the second, but a hybrid of different versions from different storytellers. There was one legend that Paul felt drawn to more than others, and it was a rather obscure one to say the least. During his self-conducted research into stories of this nature, he learned about a tale that told of an ancient sect called the Davites. According to legends, some that dated so far back that they preceded almost all of recorded history, these Davites were a callous and cruel civilization. They had emerged from a book, so the story went, and sought only to wage war on other cultures and enslave their enemies. But Paul also uncovered one detail of the story that intrigued him more than any other. It referred to something known as the Eternal Text, and was regarded as some kind of deity or figure of worship by the Davites. The legend stated that this text had helped create the book that they had emerged from. Of course, this all sounded like highly fictitious nonsense to Paul Jacobs. He knew that things of such nature didn't exist in the real world, they were only part of stories. But he had noticed that this particular story seemed to have passed its way through the ages. Searching further, Paul had uncovered the works of an obscure author from the United States who had only a few works that were known about during the 1940s and 50s. Even then, most of his stories weren't widely published, only a few shorter pieces making it into a magazine that had long since stopped being printed. This writer had died in 1957, having never seen his career in fiction come to fruition. But despite his short-lived career and being considered a somewhat subpar author at the time, the writer's work had garnered its own little cult following online, mostly comprised of amateur authors. It was through them that Paul managed to obtain some scanned copies of the anonymous writer's stories, particularly some that he felt bore a striking similarity to the Davide legends of the eternal text. One story in particular, written in a style lifted directly from H.P. Lovecraft, was based on a supposed encounter the writer claimed to have had with something that closely resembled the eternal text. Paul also studied the writer's own personal journals that he had managed to recover scans of. The entries from it seemed to imply that the author came across what he called 
the written god, and that this compelled him to write a fictional version of those events. It was only after writing about this new encounter that what he had depicted in his stories seemed to come true, exactly as he'd written them. This led to a recursive process of the writer creating these encounters only for them to occur, thus causing him to write about it and then make it happen. The entire prospect not only confused and bewildered Paul, but intrigued him further as well. Although he had no way of confirming what this writer had claimed was true, Paul believed that on a smaller scale, the author had achieved the same effect that occurs during the passing down of urban legends, but the difference here was that it had all been done through himself via a singular person telling variations on the same story, allowing it to continue and perpetrate recursively. Of course, Paul didn't actually believe in this written god or eternal text, those were all just part of the fiction, but he wanted to experiment further and see if he could achieve the same process for himself. Taking an empty notebook, Paul started to write the first things that came to mind, basing a short story off of the anonymous author's own tale. He intentionally changed a few key details, noting down things that weren't in the original. The written god appeared behind me, he wrote, adding on a whim the line, it had no face. The whole intention of Paul's experiment was to pass his new version of the story on to someone else, and then try to get them to write it from memory. He wanted to observe if their mind would change certain details subconsciously, or if they would misremember elements when they retold their new version. If enough people could spread the story around, each time altering or adding new parts to it, what effect could it have? As he finished his rewritten version of the author's tale, attaching it to an email to send to one of his fellow writers, Paul was blissfully unaware of just what he'd done. A heavy knocking rang out, somebody's fist pounding at the front door loud enough to wake him. Bleary-eyed, Paul checked the alarm clock next to his bed. It was the middle of the night. Stumbling out of bed, he staggered his way towards the repetitive noise, unsure who or what would be calling this late. Paul froze for a second, casting his mind back to the story he had written earlier. Surely not. It couldn't be right. It was just a story after all. But the author, he had described how the things he'd written had come true. There it was. That possibility that, maybe, what if it was behind the door right now? Suddenly, something much heavier than a hand bashed against the wooden surface of the front door, causing it to fly open, the catch of the lock being ripped out of the wall by the force of the impact. A group of black-clad figures rushed in, one of them tackling Paul to the ground before he could even process what was happening. The weight of another person pinned him down and kept him from moving, despite his attempts at struggling free. Then the feeling of something sharp poked at the exposed skin of Paul's neck, a needle filled with… he wasn't sure. All he really knew right now was how dizzy he was. Unable to stop himself from slipping away, the sedative quickly put Paul back to sleep as the agents filed into his home. The floor he woke up on was freezing cold. Blinking his heavy eyelids until they opened again, Paul did his best to stand. His head was still spinning, making it hard to keep his feet still, and to make matters worse, the room around him was hardly lit. Only a few low fluorescents dimly illuminated the tiny space. Mr. Jacobs, a voice boomed over a crackly intercom. The pitch lowered to distort it further. We need you to answer a few questions for us. What? Paul responded in confusion. Where did you first learn about SCP-582? The voice questioned, barely giving Paul a moment to think. About what? What's an SCP? He asked back. You wrote a story earlier today, correct? Boomed the unseen speaker. Meekly, Paul nodded his head. We monitor online activity for any mentions of SCP-582, or anything using any of its known aliases. You mean that written god eternal text thing? Paul replied, catching on to what the voice had been referring to. I read about it in some stories by this old author, he died ages ago. Most of his work is pretty niche, it's actually hard to track down. Enough! The voice interjected bluntly. When did you specify SCP-582 would manifest? Manifest? He raised an eyebrow, confused again. It was just a story, that's what I was doing. I was examining stories and how they change when they get passed on. Mr. Jacobs. It sounded as though the voice had shifted. Still distorted, but now calmer, more collected. Somebody else was speaking. It is important you answer our questions. Your life could be very well in danger. Now, do you remember when you wrote that 
SCP-582 when it was going to appear. What do you mean, in danger? Paul retorted in a panic. Who the heck even are you people? Calm down, Mr. Jacobs. He looked down to see his hands were trembling, suddenly aware of the sweat coating his forehead. Paul took a series of deep breaths, trying to collect himself. I... I don't remember, he sighed, his voice now shaking as much as the rest of him was. What about a location? The voice pressed him. Can you tell us where it's going to appear? I didn't write a location either, Paul answered. I, I just said it appeared. The words he had written earlier quickly came crashing back into his head, almost like an urgent warning. Behind me. As he spoke, Paul could sense someone standing near him. That same sensation you get when you know another person is in the room, even when you haven't looked directly at them yet. Paul tried to keep his head forward, only tilting it slightly to the side, seeing something dark looming just behind his shoulder. He couldn't rationalize any of what was happening. He was too scared to turn all the way around. Doing that would admit it all of this was real, and not just some horrific nightmare. Not just a story. Yeah. For the first time, the voice over the intercom sounded uneasy. We think you need to turn around, Mr. Jacobs. Telling himself he'd wake up any second, Paul rotated with his eyes screwed shut, snapping them open once he was facing nothing. A blank space lacking any expression, and all of the normal features was looming over him with an empty, eyeless stare. It had no face, just like in Paul's story. He opened his mouth to let out a scream, only for it to be interrupted by the crunching sounds of neck bones twisting the wrong way. As Paul's lifeless body dropped back down to the cold floor, SCP-582 vanished just as quickly as it had arrived. The thing about some anomalies is you have to be very careful about how you talk about them. Not just because they could be listening in and might hear you, but because what you say about them might just have a nasty habit of coming true. That is the case with SCP-582, otherwise known as its rather apt nickname, A Bundle of Stories. What's so fitting about that title is its accuracy. That's all SCP-582 really is. Stories. But therein lies its true power. This entity has a way of propagating and perpetrating itself, continuously adapting and spreading like a mutating virus. Except it doesn't pass from person to person as an illness. There are no symptoms. It transmits via stories. SCP-582 is a subject to a process of passive reality manipulation. It doesn't necessarily directly change the world around it, but can itself be changed by certain factors. What this means is, anything said or written about this entity, even if pulled out of thin air, a fictional account of its deeds, all becomes real. Let's say, for example, you told a story about SCP-582 sneaking up behind a Foundation researcher when his back was turned. Telling that story would cause those exact events to be carried out in the real world. When SCP-582 manifests, it will do so in accordance with any details given in a fictional account about it. The same time, the same place on Earth, it would appear in the exact form that the tale specified. If any of those details were omitted or purposely left vague, then the entity would still be able to manifest and would do so in a way that fits the rest of the narrative, appearing wherever and whenever it has an opportunity to. As far as the researchers at the SCP Foundation can tell, the actual abilities of SCP-582 are usually left vague when people write about it. One of the few consistencies is that the entity can disappear and reappear at will, to any place or time. Another is that no method of harming or even killing SCP-582 has ever worked, even if written down as fiction in order to be made fact. Any other details or abilities that someone assigns to the creature will, however, become a permanent addition to its growing myth meaning it is able to perpetually increase its power the more people write about it. On the rare occasion, multiple different writers' accounts of SCP-582 contradict each other, or don't fit into the entity's own canon, it can easily adapt to these contradictions. This usually results in conflicting information having no effect on the bundle of stories, or having so little impact that it is almost like they didn't happen at all. In short, if one author's story doesn't quite match up with another's, then the effect these additions have to SCP-582 and its ongoing story are lessened, so that they can all either logically occur, 
or be negated completely. It is because of this adaptability, and that it has been described by multiple sources, that portrayals of SCP-582 tend to be generalized. This even extends down to its appearance. It's currently unknown what the entity is, or if it even has one. However, the fact that it is usually depicted as a deity or god means that this bundle of stories has been known to manifest as one of several avatars. The most common of these appearances is that of a humanoid being, standing well over six feet tall. When manifesting as this particular form, SCP-582 is dressed in thickly layered robes made from burlap or hessian, complete with a hood. However, no face is visible underneath the creature's hood, and when presenting as this avatar, it is often described as carrying sacks of unknown contents, sometimes even appearing to bleed heavily. There have been a number of other incarnations of SCP-582, including a six-legged form that is made out of pure molten tar and will attack any nearby human beings on sight. This avatar would normally appear as being fused with the first. In other instances, it has appeared as a plant, capable of producing both light and enough radiation to kill anyone in its radius within a few hours of exposure. Other times it has been a vaguely human-shaped shadow, and even has one form that exists within more than three dimensions. Due to this form existing on higher dimensions, this made it impossible to properly perceive it with the naked eye, and resulted in the deaths of anyone who even looked partially at it. Who knows? Maybe at some point it has even been described as a tall, slender figure in a dark suit, with pale skin and a face with its eyes, ears, nose, and mouth all missing. Actually, it's probably best that nobody writes it down. We don't want it becoming real now, do we? The question is, how can you hope to contain or even fight something that can be anything, anywhere, and have any strength that someone claims it has? Well, just to be on the safe side, the Foundation uses its own fictional narrative to keep the entity contained. It is their hope that, by describing it as powerless, it will turn the creature's own reality-altering properties against it and actually cause SCP-582 to lose its abilities. What thoughts, if any, that flow through that alien mind are not mine to know. It remains silent and still within its chamber, entrenched in the persistence of its own memory. It remains, but only as a shade of what it was, its power spent, or at least come to rest. So remember, SCP-582 possesses no actual consciousness or free will. Anything it has ever said or done is because someone wrote that it would. And yes, we're only saying that because we don't want to write that it's broken free from containment and is currently standing behind you. If we did that, it might just come true. An organization with as many secrets as the SCP Foundation requires the ability to dispose of material that could prove harmful to the facade of normalcy that the O5 Council desperately wishes to uphold. And because most of the high-ranking researchers are a bit too smart and practical to simply flush classified documents and unwanted objects down the toilet, that means the Foundation has to get rid of evidence thorough enough to guarantee that absolutely no trace of what needs to be disposed of survives. For this purpose, several waste disposal plants are used as front companies for the Foundation and function internally as a foolproof way to liquidate hazardous material and comprising information. But not all secrets are so easily forgotten with the push of a button, and a rare few can prove too resilient to be burned away. This is the regrettable case of the anomalies contained within the site now designated SCP-2419, a place where the unfortunate consequence of amnestic experiments has led to the creation of hateful, immortal humanoids fated to be sealed within the incinerators of the facility. These undead freaks are known as SCP-2419-A, and though they were made from human bodies, the consciousness that dwells within each instance is nothing short of pure evil. Every happy memory and associated positive emotion was extracted from the brains of SCP-2419-A corpses prior to their attempted disposal in the incinerators. 
This was done in order to increase the effectiveness of standard issue foundation amnestics. But the cost of this minor breakthrough was that these bodies, all of which were once D-Class personnel, had effectively been stripped of all human qualities. Given the sorts of violent criminal backgrounds that earns an individual the designation of D-Class personnel, these former humans were the last people that should have been deprived of the love and joy in their hearts. And when the first of these psychopathic laughing men crawled out of one of SCP-2419's incinerators, the Foundation learned all too well what an uninhibited criminal mind looked like. Driven only by rage and fury that inspired their most gruesome acts of exploitation and violence in life, their pain has made them too hateful to succumb to the flames. They are the archetypal sinners of a burning hell that the Foundation's best intentions pave the road to. And when they break loose, all that hell breaks loose with them. But no place of the dam leaves its gates unguarded. Dante's Inferno posits that the ancient Greek mythological figure Minos, serpentine father of the Minotaur and judge of wicked souls, guards the pit of hell with stern vigilance. The Greeks themselves favored the image of Cerberus, a three-headed hound that served its lord Hades as a watchdog. For the ancient Egyptians, there was Amut, the devourer of the dead, who consumed the hearts of the unrighteous in the afterlife. While this sort of guardian beast is not officially on the Foundation's payroll, the concept turned out to be alive and well in the present day when SCP-682, the hard-to-destroy reptile, stood against the laughing men and gave them the fight of their tortured, unliving existence. It all began when the guards stationed at SCP-2419 began to hear banging from inside one of the incinerators. It seemed as though the SCP-2419-A instance on the other side was determined to breach containment, so Mobile Task Force Beta-7, the Maz Hatters, were called in to stand with all weapons at the ready. But this was exactly what the instance wanted. As soon as the armed force had fully assembled, the laughing man inside ripped the door from its hinges. It proceeded to use it as a cover and run full speed towards the Mobile Task Force, who opened fire immediately. SCP-2419-A were known to possess extremely fast regenerative abilities, so it would take a lot of punishment to slow this instance down. But this was no unthinking zombie, and the instance broke its charge the second it was in the midst of the mobile task force agents to twirl the door around like a trained martial artist. This not only sent the incoming bullets ricocheting everywhere, causing many of the Beta-7 operatives to be hit by their own friendly fire, it also allowed the instance to bludgeon several agents with sides of the door. As the remaining mobile task force members retreated to a less exposed vantage point, where they could employ heavy artillery, the instance used this moment of confusion to pitch the door backwards towards the incinerators in a boomerang trajectory. The force and spin of the door knocked two more incinerator doors off their hinges and caused two other instances of SCP-2419-A to emerge. One, who was so thoroughly decomposed that it appeared to be more than a flaming skeleton, sprinted forth and threw handfuls of hot cinders at the Foundation agents. It used its still-burning body to ignite a few of the closest agents, laughing with sadistic glee as it did so. Seconds after the emergence of the two new instances, a grenade launcher was fired at the first escapee. The blast was enough to deal significant damage, but the instance was indifferent to its own pain. It pointed to the agent wielding the grenade launcher, and a moment later, the third instance was at the agent's throat, strangling him to death. It was starting to become clear to the mobile task force that this was no random containment breach. It was a coordinated escape attempt by three ruthless criminal masterminds, who in their time contained at the site SCP-2419 had probably decided there was some truth to the old adage that misery loves company. And indeed, these three D-Class were some of the best of the best when it came to being the worst of the worst. D-1576, formerly Police Lieutenant Campbell Farage, a riot cop with a serious taste for carnage. Whenever the streets of the city precinct he presided over turned violent, Farage always made sure that the violence didn't die down too quickly. His nasty pension for bludgeoning suspects and citizens alike with his riot shield did wonders for the escape plan he had coordinated with his fellow laughing men. 
He was eventually tried and sent to a supermax after picking a fight with several other officers in the line of duty. A fight that resulted in a pair of rookie officers who opposed his violent methods being hospitalized with permanent comas. The skeleton was D-4483, Damien Lambert, a prolific arsonist who terrorized three counties while avoiding detection under the guise of being a sovereign citizen. If there was ever a person who wanted just to watch the world burn, it was Damien Lambert. He was caught in the process of setting fire to an elementary school and was thankfully apprehended before any of the kerosene he had poured through the halls ignited. When the truth about his previous history of pyromania came out, Lambert faced death row until the Foundation chose to recruit him as D-Class. Then there was D-2316, Arnold Roper, who was better known as the Illinois Strangler, responsible for over 50 deaths in two decades before he was arrested and detained. While he mostly used his bare hands to do the deed, Roper was fond of using metal chains and heavy-duty choke collars, usually worn by animals to perform his namesake act of violence. Roper wasn't just brutally strong, he was crafty too, and the trio of Laughing Man had him to thank for some of the finer points of the escape plan. The three now immortal D-Class also had one thing in common. Each of them had met the ends of their cruel and violent lives at the jaws and claws of SCP-682, and now that they had outmaneuvered and slaughtered Mobile Task Force Beta-7, their only collective goal was to get revenge on the monster that condemned them all to the fiery hell of the incinerator. The Laughing Men soon breached the limits of the SCP-2419 containment site and began making their way overland towards the facility where all of them had met their original fate. They knew they needed wheels to get there, so the instances made their way to the nearest gas station from the waste disposal plant they'd come from and made short work of the staff. Lambert stocked up on lighters, kerosene, and duraflame, while Farage took the emergency shotgun that the cashier hadn't had time to fire. In her defense, it would have been difficult to accomplish much of anything with Roper's hands clasped around her throat. Once the trio of undead psychopaths had stocked up on weapons, they waited for a suitable vehicle to pull into the lot. And before long, there was. A family SUV, with a happy family inside, no less. Farage ordered Lambert to keep his fire-starting tendencies in check, as a gas station explosion was the last thing they needed right now. The former riot cop made his way out to the car and used the shotgun to threaten the family out of the car. Family road trips can be stressful, but rarely does one expect to be carjacked by a gang of the undead. Farage told the unlucky mortals that he wouldn't hurt them if they let himself and his two friends use their car. And true to his word, he didn't fire a single shot. The family were all added to Roper's list of victims instead. After that, the three men took to the wheel, and with only their hazy memories of pain and suffering to guide them, drove relentlessly towards the Foundation facility, where their enemy SCP-682 was contained. The three had made sure to leave no human alive at their original containment site, and would allow no witnesses who saw their anomalous corpse-like forms to survive. They couldn't afford to give the Foundation a heads up that the Reckoning was on its way in a family motor vehicle. Meanwhile, at the Laughing Man's intended destination, SCP-682 was having another perfectly routine day of painfully soaking in a tank of corrosive acid. This was par for the course for the reptile, and it found itself as eager as anyone else stuck in a rut to get a break from the repetitive mundanity of containment. Little did the human-hating monster know, it would soon get its wish. A few hours later, the facility was shocked to find that several fires had been lit at the fringes of the testing units. These were no freak accidents, but rather the work of Damien Lambert. The arsonist still had memories of all the times he wished he could just burn his jailer's buildings to the ground, and had targeted the most vulnerable areas for combustion. The flames threatened the integrity of several areas of the facility, and multiple containment breaches were imminent if the blaze couldn't be kept under control. While any available agents with firefighting experience sought to minimize the damage, the researchers evacuated to safer parts of the building, bringing any sensitive documents and flammable items far away from the affected sections. This kind of pandemonium was exactly where Officer Farage thrived, 
and he soon entered the fray, causing enough commotion that Roper was able to slip deeper into the facility completely undetected. This turned out to be the perfect role for the Strangler, as he hadn't eluded the police for 20 years of his life just by being lucky. Farage and Lambert would both join up with him after they were finished having their fun. For now, his task was to locate the containment unit of SCP-682 and give the beast a taste of what the trio had in store. Along the way, he made sure to obtain some durable metal chains from a different containment unit. He likely released some kind of elder evil in the process, but Roper didn't care about the consequences. The bottom line was that he was always able to do his best work when he was armed. It wasn't long before he found the large chamber which housed his most hated foe, SCP-682. Roper laughed maniacally as he approached the creature floating in its acid tank. Remember me, lizard? The strangler said, sporting a wide grin. The monster simply growled back at Roper, wishing to tear him apart. Roper chuckled again and wrapped the iron chains around the vat. With all the considerable strength of his immortal muscles, the Strangler pulled the chains taut and shattered 682's containment unit. The anomalous chains snared the creature's body, holding it in place. How about now? Roper taunted 682. He laughed, but the creature laughed back. No, said the reptile. I don't remember you, but you are disgusting. The monster lunged towards a nearby wall and burst through, dragging Roper along with it by his chain still wrapped around the creature's body. 682 twisted and turned, flinging Roper against every wall and obstacle in sight. But to its surprise, the stranger was regenerating, and his grip on the chains was unyielding. Back down the hall, Farage was still continuing his rampage when he ran into an unlikely adversary. Dr. Alto Clef stood between the laughing man and the other researchers, and as usual, the good doctor was packing heat. He told the other researchers to go on without him, while he contained the SCP-2419 instance on his own. A bold move, to be sure, but Dr. Clef had made the same mistake he was always making, by assuming that guns were the solution to this problem. Farage laughed off the bullets and slammed into Dr. Clef with enough force to leave a crater in the wall behind him. He followed up with a merciless barrage of punches, beating the armed researchers senseless, and only relenting for a moment to steal a few of his prized firearms. With a blow that would have taken the life of any normal man, Farage struck Dr. Clef once more and left him lying there a hair's length from death. Dr. Clef's anti-anomaly field may have protected him from reality warpers, but it did very little against being kicked repeatedly, very hard, in the face. Elsewhere, Lambert had made his way into the facility, setting more fires as he went. The arsonist skeleton was a terrifying sight to all that beheld it, and when the guards realized that none of their weapons would have any effect, most of them started to run away from Lambert rather than towards him. All three laughing men would soon be upon 682, and then the fight of their afterlives could truly begin. Until that moment, Roper was buying his partners in hatred more time. The chains he had stolen were no ordinary metal, and with them he had managed to keep 682's jaws shut while he pounded away at its exposed ribs with his inhuman strength. Roper had killed more people than either of his former D-Class compatriots, but all that seemed to mean nothing in the face of this invincible reptile. The shame and powerlessness he had once felt as the creature had mauled him to death made his immortal heart beat with outrage. When he was alive, the Illinois stranger had always thought that his gift for murder made him better than the average person, a man among men. But this thing had made him feel weak in his last moments of humanity, and that sickening emotion of weakness was still sliding around in his soul with all of the other despair and malice. If his fate were to live forever as a dead man walking, then he would make damn sure that any humiliation he suffered would be paid back threefold. This soup of impotent fury bubbled within Roper as SCP-682's strength suddenly increased, shattering the weak link of the chains and sending the hapless strangler flying backwards. At that precise moment, Farage leaped out of a nearby hallway and unleashed Dr. Clef's arsenal on the reptile. This sustained fire irritated the creature, and it turned its focus towards the unliving dirty cop. It readied a charge only to be suddenly held fast by Roper, who had grabbed its tail. Farage fired until there was no more ammo, then pistol-whipped the creature in both of its eye sockets. 
SCP-682 thrashed and struggled, so the men began to circle the reptile and alternate delivering formidable body blows. They took far more damage than they could dish out with their bare hands, but the regeneration that their preternatural hatred granted them meant that both instances could theoretically keep this up all day. Roper grabbed a broken length of the anomalous chain, while Farage picked up a metal table to use as a makeshift riot shield. The beatdown continued as 682's eyes regenerated, along with several new sensory organs to give it a full 360-degree view of the pitched brawl that was taking place. A fiery explosion blew open a nearby wall, and in walked Lambert, still skeletal and laughing as uproariously as ever. He threw a Molotov cocktail at 682's back, causing the creature to ignite immediately. The reptile roared in sudden agony. Farage, Lambert, Roper regrouped at the creature's flank and pushed together until they forced it back through the hole where the arsonist had entered from. They were now all together in the inferno, the three laughing men who refused to die, and the indestructible monster that made them into what they were. Roper quickly knotted the chains and wrapped them around one of the creature's claws, securing the other end around his waist. Like a trained boxer, he bobbed and weaved, pummeling the beast with all he had. Any step back from SCP-682 was met with the immortal man shifting his entire body weight to pull the creature's leg out from under it. Farage wedged his shield into the creature's open jaw, widening it to an uncomfortable degree and temporarily limiting 682's bite force. He took out the shotgun that he had stolen from the gas station and blasted it down the reptile's gullet. When that plan had run its course, he started clubbing 682 about its neck and head with the butt of the shotgun. Lambert simply continued to douse the arena with more flammable material, especially himself and the creature. He climbed onto 682's back with his burning bones and hammered away at its defenses with literal fists of fire. The arsonist was incapable of articulate speech due to the damage to his body prior to his death, but if he could speak, he would probably be celebrating the fact that he had become what he had always wanted to be. Damien Lambert was no mere pretender with a fetish for fire. He was fire itself. A brightly burning god of destruction that left no inch of the world unburnt and no molecule of oxygen unconsumed. His mother and father would be proud of him as they waited in hell for the sun who would never arrive. The sun who would make the planet they left behind into a true hell where he would reign supreme. That is, until SCP-682 stole that dream out from under him. With a flash of blue and green from deep within, 682 began to burn with a never-before-seen chemical reaction, an impossible event that could only be described as anti-fire. The turquoise anti-flames devoured the orange and yellow ones, leaving Lambert in a state of panic, which was soon shared by his fellow laughing men. The three former D-classes had gotten so used to the torments of the incinerator that the idea that anything could be more painful had never occurred to them. And yet, here it was, the Anti-Fire, which devoured all flames and directly inflicted unimaginable suffering to the trio of instances. Every particle of their still regenerating bodies felt as if it were ice cold and melting into nothingness at the same time. Numbed and broken all over again, the laughing men were consumed all over by the anti-flames and fell into a state of suspended animation. With the Foundation finally getting everything back under control 24 hours later, SCP-682 was contained in a new acidic chamber. There were some new ordinances from all present and surviving researchers about exposing it to fire, as the anti-flames it produced were considered too hazardous to ever exist within the facility again. As for the three laughing men who had escaped from SCP-2419, they were returned to their containment units inside of the incinerators and never exhibited signs of aggression or escape attempts ever again. A psychological profile of Farage, Lambert, and Roper that all of them could still feel the sting of the burns left by 682's anti-fire to this day, and that not even exposure to natural heat and fire could ever reduce that pain. Modern cognitive neuroscience tells us that our memories are about as reliable as a weatherman at your local news channel. When a couple is asked, how did you first meet? They are lured into romanticized reflection. They might recall locking eyes at a school dance. They might recall the night being just perfect, despite the truth being far from it. We don't remember the spilled punch, the stepped on toes, or the st 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 stuttering. 
We only remember the X's and O's. Our memory doesn't find the needle by sifting through the haystack, but rather by lighting a match and setting the barn ablaze, until all that remains is the small piece of silver shining through the smoke. In this way, our memories are our best friends. They know exactly when to lie to us, feeding us misinformation about the past to satisfy ourselves in the present. Because if humans were capable of writing and recalling accurate personal accounts of their history, our memories would be stiff, unmarketable literature. And when a book gets boring, we tend to tap out. Just the same when our lives get monotonous, we tend to give up. So we have our faulty, biased brains to thank us for our perceived happiness and fulfillment. Our inaccurate memory systems consequently help us hide trauma, contrive purpose, and infuse unique importance into an otherwise banal existence. But let it be known, not all cerebral restructurings are gifts from psychology. Some are curses from SCPs. Which of these two possibilities is more existentially terrifying is up to you. SCP-5040 is a non-existent Japanese horror film entitled Tears of Blood, which spontaneously manifests in human memories. SCP-5040 is a master of persuasion. Those affected by SCP-5040 will remember going to see the film, even when their supposed attendance would contradict empirical evidence. It manipulates the mind into unwavering faith. While humans occasionally stumble upon the self-awareness to question their recollection, there are no documented instances of an individual doubting this specific memory. Somehow, beyond the Foundation's understanding, SCP-5040 manages to suspend the skepticism of its victims. They accept the memory as canon, as brute fact. Victims of SCP-5040 do not need a ticket stub to know they have been to the theater, and SCP-5040 afflictions can occur any place where movies are shown. It even transcends laws and navigates social norms. In cultures where its content would usually be prohibited by regulations and frowned upon by the public, it still inserts itself into the memory of its prey. And once that memory is planted, it's an event that can't be forgotten. Like the birth of your first child, like your favorite football team winning the Super Bowl, like the employee number you punch in and out of work every day for the rest of your life. It stamps itself into the forefront of the subject's brain, waving its arm, pleading to be recognized, begging for attention. Descriptions of the film are always similar in nature, as are the circumstances and events surrounding the viewing. However, reports of SCP-5040's story and characters are never fully consistent from one subject to the next, and the film's setting, subplots, character names, and much of the dialogue are different for each viewer. Whether this is SCP-5040's intent or inadequacy is unclear. Casting also varies and appears largely arbitrary. A broad variety of Japanese performers and entertainment personalities, both living and deceased, have been said to star in the film, even when the actor in question has no real-life associations with the horror genre. Imagine famous Japanese actor Pat Morita, better known as Mr. Miyagi from The Karate Kid, being the lead in a horror film. Despite the fact this would be a noticeably strange casting decision, SCP-5040 would still be taken seriously. Despite any and all deviations from expectations of the medium, SCP-5040 is seen as legitimate. Kinks in its design are overlooked by the viewer, similar to how our sleeping selves most often don't recognize we are dreaming, even when we encounter flying horses, friends with banana fingers, and leprechauns playing Pot Limit Omaha in Chris Hemsworth's basement. This may be because, despite all of its quirks, the film's core is sturdy. Its beginning, middle, and end are always in agreement. It doesn't stray from Robert McKee's universal structure of story. Not even the sick, twisted M. Night Shyamalan himself could have created a cinematic experience quite like this. After conducting more than 300 interviews, researchers have constructed a detailed synopsis of SCP-5040's most consistent story elements and the most common sequence of events associated with the viewer's memory of their screening attendance. There is no matinee with this movie. Screenings always begin at sunset. If there are obstacles standing in the way of the subject's attendance, SCP-5040 will see them removed. Dentist appointments, drinks with a friend, a long procrastinated date with the treadmill. All these commitments for that day and time 
will be pushed down the subject's list of priorities, making way for the movie. They will learn that their plans have been cancelled or resolved one way or another. The dentist's office burned to the ground. Your friend is suddenly sober. The model of treadmills at your gym have been recalled. Somehow, some way, time is freed up. And when life is kind enough to offer respite from personal and social obligations, it is modern human's instinct to sit down and veg out. At this moment, the subjects decide to see a movie at a nearby theater. Upon arrival, the theater looks to be an entity in its own right. Long lines of patrons are like limbs extending from its center box office. Bright, blocky letters forming the film's title run across the marquee like a cheap tattoo. It is truly madness. A frenzied crowd gathers at the box office, pushing and shoving, clawing at the glass partition for a ticket. The entire theater has been reserved for this special event, a one-time-only screening of a rare, critically acclaimed film. Admission is entirely free. But is it actually free? Or has the cost just not declared itself? When the subject reaches the auditorium, they scan their eyes over the sea of people. Heads emerge from the backs of almost every seat. They can only find one empty space, and they have to shuffle like a crab to get past the mass of other viewers. In their seat, they notice that a large number of people throughout the audience are wearing disposable face masks. The woman sitting next to the subject's right wears one such mask, as does the woman on their left. And before you think, well, that isn't so weird, it's important to note that all of these accounts were taken years before certain recent events. Patrons continue to pack into the theater. Despite every chair being filled, more and more people enter. The aisles become overflow seating. Regulations of max occupancy are dismissed. In the darkness of the room, all that can be clearly seen are shapes. The rectangle that is the screen, the hundreds of circles that are the heads of the audience, but there is a shape that feels misplaced. What appears to be the letter P sticks up from the crowd, a thin line with a bulge protruding from the top. The specificity of its origin is difficult to define, but once the subject's eyes adjust to the dark, they notice it's an IV pole carrying a bag of unknown fluid. However, there is no clear indication of who it is connected to. Furthermore, they notice one of the masked audience members is wearing a hospital gown. There is little time to assess any of these strange visuals, because there are no trailers or advertisements before the film. As soon as the audience is settled into whatever space they might find temporarily habitable, the theater goes silent and the film begins. The film opens with the female protagonist going about mundane activities in her day-to-day -day life. A phone call interrupts her. It is an unknown party who tells her that a loved one has been hospitalized for one reason or another. The protagonist drops what she's doing to accept the call to action. On her way to the hospital, however, she is attacked by a male assailant and loses consciousness. The protagonist wakes up in a fog, unable to make sense of her surroundings, but the audience understands that wherever she is, she is in deep trouble. She's in a desolate and unfamiliar building with her arms and legs bound. She is accompanied by a number of other female captives, some of whom still remain seemingly unconscious or possibly dead. The women briefly discuss their strategy to escape, but they are interrupted when the kidnapper appears. Descriptions of hairstyle, eye color, and wardrobe would fall short in showing us who this character really is. Instead, his swift and decisive actions do the talking. He sees one of the women crying and kills her without hesitation. The kidnapper reveals to the woman the code he intended to operate under. He would release the captives after 24 hours, but only under the condition that they do not cry. During the film, the kidnapper demonstrates various forms of physical and psychological torture on the group of women. Despite their best efforts, the captives are unable to hold back their tears, and one by one, they are murdered until only the protagonist remains. Frustrated by the protagonist's unremarkable resolve, the kidnapper takes more extreme measures, increasing the intensity of her torture. However, the protagonist is not one to be messed with. Despite being tormented, she seems in control of the situation. She doesn't succumb to the traditional dynamics of torture. Even while on the wrong end of the bat, she isn't afraid to swing. She fights back how she can. She mocks and insults her captor, and it's then she finds his weakness. Although a physically empowering villain, he is emotionally fragile. Her grit frustrates him, 
causing him to lose focus and become noticeably rattled. As the protagonist continues to weaken her kidnapper with words, the subject in the audience notices what seems to be a slight echo in the dialogue. They look up to see if something is wrong with the speakers. They even wonder if this is a stylistic decision made by the director. But then they notice where it is coming from. They eventually realize that the two masked women sitting beside them are quietly repeating every line of dialogue as it occurs. Their lips moving causes their masks to shake softly. With each word, the air from their whispers blows the cloth away from their mouth, only for the mask to collapse back in when the syllable is completed. If the subject looks even closer, they will see that the lower half of the women's masks are saturated with saliva. Things don't get any more pleasant when the subject shifts their gaze down the woman's body. Just near their waists, their hands are clasped together so tightly that their fingernails are digging into their skin. They tremble and fidget, as if having taken on the burden of the world's anxiety, and no medication can calm them down. Fingernails dig deeper into their skin, drawing blood and foreshadowing the film's finale. At the film's climax, the kidnapper approaches the protagonist with a double-edged razor blade and announces that even if she is freed, she will spend the rest of her life horribly disfigured. This leads to an argument between the two, the subtext of which alludes to themes such as nature of inner and outer beauty, the value of women in society, and the societal stigma against expressions of vulnerability. The argument on the surface, however, does not sound sophisticated or profound. There is no consolation for a fight having emotional depths. At the end of the day, the blows will always feel more physical than intellectual. Eventually, the kidnapper loses patience and grabs the protagonist by the shoulders and slams her to the floor. He reaches out his hands and grabs her by the face. The subject's attention is again pulled from the screen when they hear groaning from every direction. The wordless hums fill the theater with a sense of worry and uneasiness. So much so, that the subject feels the room getting smaller as the air polluted with angst grows thicker. As the subject brings their eyes back to the film, they see the kidnapper gripping the protagonist's lower lip between his thumb and forefinger, squeezing tight as to pop her lip like a balloon. The kidnapper then takes the razor blade to the victim's lips. He pauses to mock the protagonist, and while he does this, blinded by pride and arrogance, she jolts into action, grabbing the razor right out of his hands with her teeth. She follows up her burglary with assault. Her neck stabs forward, and in a blur, she stabs the kidnapper's eyes out. It happens in an instant. The kidnapper has no time to react. Blood spills from his face. Screams pour out of his mouth. During this time, the protagonist maneuvers the razor into her fingers. She hacks away at her bindings, but they are stubborn and resist her sawing. The battle continues, and the kidnapper is able to tear off the victim's lips entirely. She looks like a monster now. As the kidnapper smiles and celebrates his wrongdoings, the protagonist finishes freeing herself and slits the kidnapper's throat with the razor. The protagonist locates the exit and scrambles towards it as the kidnapper bleeds to death on the cold, hard floor. The protagonist then speaks her final words. Due to her injuries, her voice is muffled and raspy. She bears down and calmly speaks. One last time, she mocks the kidnapper, telling him that he cried tears of blood and therefore had to die according to his own rules. During this climax, it is reported that the subjects experience a sense of dread unique to any other terror ever felt. Strangely, the feeling appeared not to correspond to the scene in the film at all. It is a feeling entirely separate from the viewing experience, as if for a moment, the subject is taken out of the moment in time and transported to a realm composed only of fear and anxiety. But just as quickly as they left, they return. The Foundation sees it worth mentioning that this peculiar moment happens to occur during the film's most clearly recalled scene. While descriptions of violence vary from one viewer to the next, the climax is unshakable in its consistency. This is further evidence that SCP-5040 has a core foundation that remains intact. False memories are given validity by our peers. When we tell a story, the inaccuracies are often the best parts, the exaggerated drama, the rearranged sequence of events, the jokes you thought of in retrospect, but weaved into later accounts. While a storyteller knows when to lie, a good storyteller knows how to not get caught. SCP-5040 captivates its audience, but it seems to know how much it can get away with. By providing a consistent, objective truth, a climax that is reported the same across all accounts, SCP-5040 insists, even if only briefly, on being a credible film. 
not just a random sequence of 24 frames per second. Eyes back to the screen, the film abruptly cuts to an unspecified point in the future. Now wearing a face mask to hide her disfigured mouth, no different than the one seen worn in the theater, the protagonist walks down the street to her apartment, indifferent to the crowd of paparazzi that follows her. It is clear that this is now just a part of her life. The lights flash on her face. When she reaches her bedroom, the protagonist slowly pulls down her mask. Face free from cloth, she stares at herself in the mirror. It is silent. What she sees is less notable than what she doesn't. The lower portion of her face is gone. She focuses only on that. It's hard to know if she will ever see into her own eyes again. Her gaze might forever be fixed on what she can't get back. And through those eyes that long to see more, she sheds a single tear. Over the course of several minutes, her weeping gradually builds into frenzied sobs and shrieks. It can first be misinterpreted as bad acting, a case of doing too much. But as the crying carries onward, it's understood that the horror in her wallowing is all too real. The film cuts to black and the credits roll, but the sound of the protagonist's cries continue to play with no other audio until the credit reel ends. And even then, in silence, it's hard to say if she ever stopped crying. Audience members remain silent after the movie ends, exchanging only whispers as they exit the theater. Feet step over small red puddles and stains on the theater floor as if they are sticky puddles of soda. Those who remain past this point experience an escalating feeling of unwelcomeness until sitting and staying is more physically demanding than getting up and walking out. Some experiences will stay with you forever, even if they never actually happened. Alarms go off all around the facility. Things descended into chaos so quickly. Of course, the staff of the SCP Foundation are extremely familiar with the horrors of a containment breach by now. But this was something exceptional. Two anomalies had joined forces in an unexpected fashion, neutralizing some of the weaknesses that the two of them usually experienced. Needless to say, this was bad. More specifically, 74 staff members were dead already. Several different mobile task forces had already been dispatched to hunt down this terrifying new anomaly, but none of them knew where it was hiding in the depths of the site. Little did they know, this deadly new hybrid had already escaped the SCP Foundation and was already on its way towards a nearby population center. That's where the real fun would start. But before we get to all that carnage, let's rewind the clock a little and find out how this disaster started. Some things just go great together, like peanut butter and jelly, milk and cereal, or clicking subscribe when you're watching a video by SCP Explained. But for every match made in heaven, there's also a match made in hell. Like being covered in sugar water while you walk past a wasp nest, or doing tricks with your awesome Zippo lighter next to a gas pump, or most horrifying of them all, a combination of SCP-106 and SCP-035. Of course, the reputations of these two horrible creatures are well-known and well-feared enough on their own. SCP-106 is a humanoid abomination also known as the Old Man, capable of walking through walls and entering his own private pocket dimension, where he practices his predilection for pain to its full potential. And then there's SCP-035, also known as the Possessive Mask. This is one of the most powerful and dangerous psychic entities that the SCP Foundation has in its vast collection. Some of its more minor, unpleasant qualities are things like the fact that it constantly drips corrosive black slime, or the fact it immediately reduces you to a state of brain death when you're foolish enough to wear it. On the more severe end of its abilities is its power to crawl into the mind of anyone around it, slowly whispering horrors into their mind until they're completely under its control or utterly broken. It likely has designs on world domination, or at the very least, to plunge the human race into an unimaginable pit of eternal suffering. The one saving grace is the fact that 035's corrosive slime slowly destroys the body of its hosts, limiting the purview of each one of its reigns of terror. But occasionally, there are wonderful, terrible exceptions to the rule. Speaking of terrible, our story began chronologically with SCP-106 showing one of its rare signs of activity. This, naturally, caused waves of panic to rock through the researchers and security staff of the site. 
They'd need to grab a D-Class, then plug in and warm up the femur breaker. They'd also need to mobilize groups of on-site guards with powerful flashlights to slow the gnarled old monster down. But by now, SCP-106 had gotten wise to the Foundation's techniques. He wouldn't make himself so easy to capture this time. He wanted to have the proper time to enjoy himself. SCP-106 got up and phased through the nearby wall. His cell was never easy to escape. They filled it with strange shapes and running water, just to confuse his wretched old mind. But once he was out, he was out. He avoided the hallways, instead just phasing from wall to wall, until he reached a different block of containment chambers. That's where the fateful meeting would take place. It wouldn't be the first time he'd wandered into other containment cells, his battle with SCP-682 perhaps being the most famous, but this time, something was different. The room he'd just faced into didn't contain some huge writhing monster or another humanoid beast. It contained instead a glass container on top of a podium. The walls coated in deadly telekill alloy to keep its prisoners' immense psychic power sealed in. But now that SCP-106 was in the room, standing mere feet away from the grinning white mask inside the glass container, there was nothing keeping the two of them from having an extremely fateful conversation. The first thing SCP-106 noticed was the black liquid leaking from the mask. Strange. It seemed to perfectly match his own secretions. Hello there, good sir. It isn't often I have visitors in here, and even less so visitors who are as handsome as you. The mask said, speaking directly into the old man's frail, fractured mind. I don't believe we've ever been acquainted. Come a little closer and remove the glass box. I'll be able to hear you better that way. Come on, come on. Don't be shy. The old man felt something about the mask was distasteful. Even to a creature as despicable as SCP-106, something about the mask just seemed slimy, metaphorically as well as literally. And yet it found itself stepping forward towards the glass case, almost as though he was sleepwalking. How was the mask invading his mind like this? He'd always been one of the more mysterious creatures in the Foundation's containment, and yet SCP-035 had slipped into his mind like a warm bath. On some level, it frightened him. Yes, yes, that's wonderful. Come closer, dear boy, you're doing so well. The mask said as the old man reached forward and began lifting off the glass case. I think I'd look rather good on you, don't you agree? Let's cover up that nasty old face of yours. You'll look positively spiffing, old chap. Just do exactly as I say, and this is all going to go wonderfully. The old man picked up the mask, somehow not even in control of his own body anymore. An almost electrical power seemed to pulse out of the mask and through the old man's rotting fingertips. The old man was a sadist, but he'd never before encountered this kind of utterly malicious intelligence. This was a mind geared to commit almost incalculable evil, and while the old man was wondering how exactly he felt about that, he was already lifting the mask up to his face and watching the universe go very, very dark. Outside, a small army of Foundation security operatives, armed with flashlights and assault rifles, were charging through the halls, trying to trace the movements of the old man for recapture. Back in the old man's cell, a confused serial arsonist was being shoved into the femur breaker by a group of nervous and impatient researchers. None of them knew they were dealing with an entirely different beast down here now. Eventually, the security team found the last rusty scorch mark on the wall of a containment cell belonging to SCP-035. Before they could even comprehend the terrifying implications of this horrible scenario, they charged into the cell in hopes of stopping it. But by the time they were in there, both the old man and the mask were already gone. Well, not entirely. Suddenly, the guards in the room felt an odd sense of calm wash over them. Not a true, authentic calm, but an artificially induced one. Like the lulling of a cattle while a bolt gun descends towards their foreheads. The mask's psychic influence had pacified them making them perfect prey for the rotten hands reaching out from the ground and pulling them down into oblivion. The guards outside heard the most horrific screaming. They circled the door, terrified, aiming everything they had at the entryway, but it wouldn't be enough. 
Soon enough, this new hybrid beast, SCP-106 wearing SCP-035, emerged and began its onslaught. It had the immense physical abilities of 106, bolstered by 035's diabolical intelligence and ability to cloud the minds of its victims, inhibiting their capacity to run away or fight back. But most frightening of all, because SCP-106 was already adapted to resist the effect of its own corrosive mucus, it was also perfectly able to sustain the mask as a host without ever melting and falling apart. See what we mean about a match made in hell? How do you like my new body, gentlemen? The mask asked, its voice dripping with malicious glee. It isn't much to look at, I know, but you're about to get very well acquainted with its collection of charming abilities. And the mask stayed true to its word. It rampaged through the containment site, waltzing through walls like a gleeful schoolchild with the heart and mind of the devil himself leaving a pile of melted, tortured corpses in its wake. Researchers, guards, janitorial staff, nobody was safe. And with every killing, the rest of the staff became increasingly afraid, only strengthening the psychic hold of the mask. It was having the best day it could remember in a long, long time. The site director and his team put out a mayday for all available mobile task force units to descend onto the area and help them deal with this deadly new threat. But by the time they were on their way, the mask and its new SCP-106 body had already had its fun with the Foundation. Even when they activated the femur breaker, nothing happened. The mask was far more interested in the pain it could cause outside, and far too intelligent to be lured back into imprisonment by such a simple trick. Instead, the hybrid made its way out of the nearby perimeter wall, finding its way to a heavily armored Foundation ground vehicle and sliding in through the door like a ghost. The operative in the driver's seat was immediately terrified by the monster suddenly sitting next to it, but then the mask's psychic effects took over his mind. He became a calm, placid little servant, just like all those other mortal fools. I feel like a change of scenery, old sport, the mask said to him. Take me out to the nearest city. It can be the one of your choosing. I feel like having a little night on the town. Oh, it's been far too long, you know." The hypnotized driver nodded and punched the gas. The guards were too busy controlling the aftermath of the chaos within the site to even notice the creature they were chasing had already escaped. And if it reached a nearby city, then the chaos, cruelty, and madness it was liable to release would be the biggest mess the Foundation would need to clean up in quite some time. Which was precisely what the malicious mask had in mind. Meanwhile, Dr. Robert Scranton woke up in a dark room. Well, he wasn't sure if it was a room, but it was definitely dark. He rose to his feet in this strange black void, surrounded on all sides by blackness. It wasn't the belly of SCP-3001, the dreaded red reality again. No, this was something new. And what's more, he had no idea how on earth he'd gotten here. Dr. Scranton, said a cruel mocking voice behind him. Turn around, old chap. It's been far too long since I've seen you in the flesh. Well, in a manner of speaking, at least. Confused, Dr. Scranton turned and saw a vaguely familiar sight. SCP-035, the possessive mask, floating in the dark behind him. What on earth was happening here, he wondered. Oh, you really don't remember, do you? <laughs> the mask said with a spiteful laugh replying to a thought he'd never voiced aloud. We're in your mind, Doctor. As it turns out, you're harder to erase than I thought. Perhaps you're buried so deep in the psyche of that monster. <laughs> no matter, I'll get you eventually. How strange, Dr. Scranton thought. This must be his mind playing tricks on him somehow. He raised a hand to scratch his head quizzically, and only then realized that his right hand was gone, simply vanished from the end of his wrist, the mask gave another sick laugh. <laughs> oh, it's already started! I told you I'd get you, Scranton! <laughs> the mask cackled with glee. I never normally get to delete a mind slowly. Oh, this will be amusing. Where's Anna? Scranton asked, suddenly wondering about the safety of his beloved wife. He couldn't help but worry when this got another cruel laugh out of the mask. <laughs> Oh, don't you remember, Robert? 
the mask said through giggles. <laughs> you killed her! You killed her with your toxic embrace! She died terrified of you! And with that, all the awful memories came flooding back. Back in the real world, things weren't any less horrifying. When the vehicle had finally made its way to the nearby city, the masked old man had unceremoniously murdered its chauffeur and decided to go for a little exploration. It had been so long since it felt the sun on its pristine white porcelain. Such a beautiful day outside. It couldn't wait to kill some people around here. It began its rampage in a dark alley, snatching some homeless people and unfortunate passers-by through the graffiti-stained stone walls. By the time it was done with them, there weren't even any bones left. But this would only be the start of the masked old man's horrific rampage through the city. Next, he invaded an office building and decided to unleash his grisly wrath on the people within. Some were pulled through the ground while chatting at the water cooler. Others were dragged through the walls as they went to refresh their coffee. Some were simply sitting at their desks, getting on with their daily work, when a dark silhouette appeared behind them. Some turned around, saw the creature, and screamed immediately. Others remained in ignorance and only screamed when an acidic, rotting hand curled around their shoulder. But every single one of them screamed eventually. By this point, the SCP Foundation had started sending all the mobile task forces in the area to the nearby city after receiving reports of unexplainable disappearances and murders. Panic was starting to spread, and that panic was only making the nightmarish psychic abilities of the mask even stronger. The challenge would be intercepting SCP-106 and removing the mask before it became too powerful for them to do anything about it. If they didn't, they could be looking at a loss of life on a massive scale. Which was exactly what SCP-035 hoped to indulge in. A young barista was having a stressful day at a nearby boutique coffee shop. She retired to the staff bathroom to splash some water on her face and recenter herself. She sighed and looked up from the sink into the mirror to see if her makeup was running, and then screamed. A dark figure was standing right behind her. It looked like a rotting human corpse, dripping with black slime, and wearing a grinning white ancient Greek comedy mask. I'm not interrupting anything, am I? The masked old man said, amused. Soon after the dark presence had spilled out into the coffee shop, the psychic powers of the mask caused its victims to be paralyzed with sheer terror, unable to escape its cruel hands. The death toll of the day had already risen to over a hundred, and the masked old man had no intention of stopping. That's when several police cruisers skidded to a halt in front of the coffee shop. Cops disembarked from their cars and pulled out their handguns. Step out of the store with your hands up! One of them yelled over a megaphone. Any sudden moves and we'll blow you to kingdom come! This made the masked old man laugh. <laughs> Oh, how very adorable. Not long after, he was driving a police cruiser further into town, with a pile of dead cops left in the street behind him. This was shaping up to be such a wonderful day, he never wanted it to end. Back in the pitch dark of the mindscape, Dr. Robert Scranton was looking a little worse for wear. Both of his legs had disappeared, along with one of his eyes and much of the rest of his right arm. His remaining eye was weeping, remembering how his embrace as the old man had killed his beloved Anna. He'd lost his humanity and become the worst kind of monster, the kind who even hurts the people he loves most. SCP-035, floating in the darkness, was still just laughing at him. <laughs> oh, you pathetic Scranton, it said. Look how little is left of you. You haven't even been human in decades. Why not give up what little is left? You're mine now, and soon you're going to be nothing at all." And Dr. Scranton kept crying, because he feared the mask was right. Back in the city, the stolen police cruiser pulled up in front of a preschool, and the masked old man got out. This would be the perfect place for his next little slice of fun. Straightening himself out, he began walking to the school, knowing that with the extent of his psychic powers, nobody would be strong enough to run away. They'd all just have to sit there and suffer, just like Dr. Robert Scranton. Goodbye, old man, the mask said to him. I'm tired of talking to you now. Dr. Scranton was ready to give up and let himself disappear. But then, something occurred to him. 
knowledge from his foundation days. I... I, I must be wearing you, Dr. Scranton said. I must be wearing you. Scranton reached up to his face with his remaining hand grasping at something. Suddenly, the face of the floating mask twisted into an infuriated frown. What do you think you're doing? It said. It's too late, Robert. But Scranton wouldn't be deterred. He gripped something invisible over his face and began to tug, even though pulling on this invisible mask on his face was agonizing. The whole void around him began to shake and quiver, including the grimacing SCP-035. Scranton just kept pulling. Stop that, you idiot! It roared. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! You're going to ruin everything, you! But it was already too late. Dr. Scranton murmured, I'm sorry, Anna, and gave one last yank. That's when everything went white. Back in the city, it thankfully wasn't long until a group of mobile task force agents was able to locate the two anomalies. SCP-106 was sitting cross-legged on the grass outside of a preschool, where thankfully nobody had been hurt and was just staring off into space. In his trembling hands was another familiar sight, a frowning SCP-035. It's hard to believe it's been a full 100 days since I began my journey. No, my mission into the beating heart of the SCP Foundation. I, Stathis Stern, risked detection, my safety, and even my own life for this cause. And I'm sure that makes you wonder why on earth I'd be foolhardy enough to put so much on the line. Well, my reason is the best. No, the only reason that matters. For the sake of art. I decided early on that recording my findings was essential, both for posterity and so that the art world may know just how dedicated I've been in my pursuit of true inspiration. It all started over three months ago. That was when I first managed to embed myself in the SCP Foundation. Naturally, I never would have jumped at the idea of having to fraternize with the likes of the Chaos Insurgency. Their methods are far too brutal, their organization seeped in violence that trivializes my own pursuit of a deeper meaning. But even I have to admit, the Insurgency's methodology can yield results. They arrange for a convenient accident to befall a lower-level researcher. After they returned home from Site-19, the SCP Foundation's largest and most infamous facility, home to many of their equally infamous anomalies. Thanks to a falsified identity and phony transfer order from the insurgency, I was able to slip into Site-19 undetected so that I could begin my search. The subterfuge was, at first, easy to maintain. I looked the part, obviously. A lab coat and a name badge, so versatile and yet completely unassuming. I was visible and still imperceptible to the rest of the Foundation's personnel. As far as they knew, I was just the latest transfer to Site-19. As I spent the day getting my bearings, not one of them could have possibly known my true intention. My goal was simple and twofold. First and foremost, I had long felt I deserved to be accepted as a member of the art collective known as AWCY, or Are We Cool Yet? Since the 19th century, they have been championing the creation and exhibition of anomalous artwork, truly pushing the boundaries of what can be considered artistic expression despite the Foundation's attempts to censor AWCY's transcendent art. I had admired their mission statement from afar for a number of years and strived to achieve much the same in my own artwork. However, none of my previous pieces quite met the collective's anomalous pedigree. I know a way to change that, though. Blending in at Site-19 proved to be fairly simple. As long as you stride around with purpose, few will question what you're doing. With my head in a notebook or a look of conviction on my face, I could freely make my way around the facility. But why, you might wonder? What was the actual intention behind my undercover mission? Well, that answer lies in the second half of my goal, recognition. Not just notoriety and acceptance into the ranks of AWCY, but fame throughout the anomalous art world, and all the perks that could come with. Of course, the main hurdle to overcome was that I needed to create a piece of art that was anomalous in its nature. And so, rather than wait for inspiration and materials to fall into my lap, I chose to instead seek out what I needed. The anomalies on offer at Site-19 <laughs> were abundant, and knowing where to start was tricky. I made the decision, while still getting accustomed to my new surroundings, that I would start wherever I felt the most drawn to. Before the end of my first week in Site-19, I felt the first pull of an anomaly, and uncovered it in the most unlikely of places. 
During my day, most of the SCP Foundation living quarters are empty, meaning I could sneak around there undetected. It was in the personal bathroom of one Foundation doctor that I found SCP-063. To the untrained eye, the anomaly appears to be an ordinary toothbrush, save for the wording stenciled into the pale blue plastic, the world's best toothbrush. Of course, examining it closer, I learned of its ability to cleave through inorganic matter, like a hot knife through butter. It was quite the shock, slicing the porcelain of the bathroom sink by accident. That would have led to my detection had I not left soon after. But I reflected on the toothbrush, or toth brush, and what it could possibly represent. Perhaps an acknowledgement of rituals and their importance to human health, yet at the same time, being sharp enough to cut anything not organic, anything not human. Maybe SCP-063 was meant to symbolize the possible dangers of habitual behaviors. The next day I was able to bear witness to an anomalous piece I had only ever heard rumors of. For a time, I thought it to have been the reason for AWCY's founding. After all, its nickname was derived from a particular traditional art form. SCP-173, the sculpture, as those at the Foundation call it. I was able to insert myself into a group of two other personnel, a researcher and security officer. The former was entering the container, housing SCP-173 to run tests, the latter protecting her. Naturally, I overheard them looking for a third and offered my assistance. Even if all I had to do was watch the sculpture intently, I wasn't even allowed to blink without getting someone else to cover for me while I did. I adored it. The messy structure of concrete and rebar defied all notions of what many believed art should be. It wasn't beautiful or pristine. It dared to be ugly, and yet it demanded to be seen, to be looked at and perceived, or else it would break my neck and claim my life. It was everything I'd hoped, pure art personified. It was as I neared the end of my first week in Site-19 that I discovered my next anomalous art piece hidden away in a storage locker. SCP-010, The Collars of Control. These were a collection of cast iron collars that, according to their file, could be used to control the actions and movements of a person wearing one via a remote control. These collars fascinated me. They were, to my interpretation, tools to control yet simultaneously a rejection of the very rules that control human beings. Someone wearing an SCP-010 collar could potentially have their entire bodily shape reconfigured by the person wielding the remote. That alone, the fact that these objects could be used to defy the physical laws that dictate the forms we exist in was a meta comment rejecting the laws of society in order for free expression. Expression only achieved by art. It all made me appreciate AWCY's dedication to anomalous artworks, yet I was still determined to be welcomed into their collective. My first week hiding within Site-19 concluded with a visit to SCP-107. Held on a pedestal in an otherwise empty room was an empty, hollowed-out turtle shell. Now I, for one, don't respect archaeologists. Art historians are another matter, however. I would rather focus on translating the human experience into my art than waste mental energy on events or objects from hundreds and thousands of years ago. But this turtle shell might be the exception. Apparently any liquid placed within the shell will be absorbed, only to rain down from the clouds above. There's something quite honest about SCP-107. Interpreted through the mind of an artist such as myself, it appears to be a reminder of the natural world's cyclical process. The liquid within it becomes rain, which falls and feeds the plants. The plant life in turn provides food and shelter for animals, humans too, and so on. On and on the circle of life repeats, as so embodied by the hollow shell of an ancient proud turtle. I began my second week of subterfuge with a scare, a close call that I may have been discovered. One of the Foundation's doctors had complained that his sink had been sliced in two, in spite of my best efforts to cover my tracks. It seemed that using his denture glue to repair the damage SCP-063 had done didn't quite have the effect I had intended. Nevertheless, the reaction by the Foundation seemed to imply that sort of thing happened all the time. An announcement was made reminding all researchers to not toy with the world's best toothbrush, despite how fun it was to slice things up with. Although they requested the culprit come forward, I decided to divert the Foundation's suspicions away from me, hinting to a security officer I had seen Dr. Alto Clef leaving the private bathroom, where I had accidentally broken the sink. 
They seemed to believe he had been capable of causing the damage. Almost being discovered meant I had to reassess my objective. Over the following few days, I tried to sink into life among the Foundation's researchers, playing the role of a helpful member of personnel so as not to attract any further suspicions. And so, I was mostly concerned with the general day-to-day -day tending to anomalies. Most of them I encountered during this time were living creatures, which were of little interest to me. Although one by the designation of SCP-049 sporting the rather aesthetically striking appearance of a plague doctor, complete with dark robes and a beaked mask. At first I thought him to be a quite an amicable, intelligent fellow, that is until I had a moment alone with him, to ask his opinions on art. The plague doctor claimed it was of literal importance when compared to curing the pestilence. Naturally, I took that to be a personal insult, requesting to the research head that I be transferred away from an anomaly that was obviously not as intelligent as I first thought. Two and a half weeks had passed, and I had still remained undetected by the Foundation. However, I had been forced to reassess my mission. AWCY were hardly likely to accept me into their group if I had nothing to show for my efforts. I needed either some materials I could use to create an anomalous art piece, or preferably, something I could claim as my own. It wasn't as if the upper echelons of AWCY possessed their own detailed files on every anomaly at Site-19. They would have no idea if something I plucked from containment was an existing SCP, or a Stathis Stern original piece. So I set about finding something I could be my magnum opus, my breakthrough into the anomalous art community. My key to the fame, fortune, and artistic acclaim I so obviously deserved. You may call it plagiarism, using another anomaly as my own piece, but nobody technically owns the objects and entities at Site-19. Even the Foundation themselves are more so jailers and curators than creators. I, however, am a visionary. I just needed something to prove it. My search took me far and wide, all over the width and breadth of Site-19. By the time my first whole month had passed, I had begun to walk the corridors and pass by its containment chambers just like any other researcher, although not one who I had interacted with had any clue they were in the presence of a man who would reshape the anomalous art world. There was an SCP transferred from another facility that I witnessed during that time. According to the Foundation's files, SCP-066 had previously been a ball of braided yarn and ribbon, but had since become an amorphous ball of meat with functioning eyes. What struck me most about SCP-066 was the question it asked since transforming. Are you Eric? At first I thought, I'm not Eric, but the longer I pondered it, I began to wonder, allowing my perception to be challenged. That is what art does, after all. Perhaps much like in the Marshall Mathers sense that we are all Stan, all of us may well be Eric too. I can recall another incident encountering some SCP-131s, creatures known as the iPods, which one almost tripped me up. Their brightly colored teardrop-shaped bodies were certainly striking, a rather abstract modernist biomechanical design, but it was their eyes that I found myself ruminating on. SCP-131 instances had a single, unblinking eye, giving a constant gaze without faltering. I likened it much to the uncritical, unthinking eyes of certain audiences, who in the past had stared at my artwork and had nothing interesting to say about it. In other events, my attempts to avoid detection may have proven a little detrimental. Dr. Clef cornered me, a little perturbed that I had implicated him in the sink slicing incident. He at one point seemed to imply a desire to inflict far worse damage with a ukulele of all things. Although I'm sure he was just joking. At least I hope so. The whole interaction reminded me of the urgency of my mission. I still needed my anomalous masterpiece, and would need to have an escape plan in place once I found it. During my next stint of time hidden among the ranks of the Foundation, I tried to broaden my own interpretation of what AWCY would consider to be art. Nothing in their admittedly vaguely defined rules stated my anomalous art piece couldn't be created from a more modern medium. Never mind paintings that can depict a person's death or a sculpture that moves whenever unobserved. What about something like photography? I thought to myself. However, it was around this time that my hopes for such a piece were seemingly answered in the form of SCP-105, or Iris Thompson, as she introduced herself. 
Iris had a rather unique relationship with the art of photography. She possessed an ability to alter images taken on a specific Polaroid Express camera from 1982. In the hands of SCP-105, the photographs would come to life, like slices of real-time frozen one moment, then moving the second she held them. She could even alter these images, reaching into the Polaroid to move or retrieve objects. It instilled an idea in me. Perhaps taking a Polaroid of my chosen anomalous art would be enough. That is, until I realized the photographs were only interactable to Iris, and breaking her out of containment was a waste of my skills as an artist. Partway into my third month hiding out in Site-19, part of me began to wonder if the Foundation's security forces were as formidable as I had been led to believe. It seemed I barely even needed to hide my mission to join AWCY, or that I had spent so much time in their facility undetected. It was on my 68th day that I decided to reflect on some of the potential anomalous pieces I had encountered so far. <laughs> Frustratingly so, I was still yet to discover any that would wipe the smug grins off of the AWCY members, only to replace them with looks of awe. Something in Site-19 would guarantee my spot among the anomalous art collective. I was certain of it. I just had to find it. A potential candidate presented itself, one that might have even allowed me to get back at AWCY for denying my entry for so long. I was shown SCP-3037, a miniature model that depicted the city of Dubrovnik in Croatia. I was watching it and pondering the meaning behind the sculpture, thinking about why it was made to specifically look like Dubrovnik of all places. Maybe, I pondered, it was meant to be a commentary or condemnation of urbanization, given the city's walls, keeping its residents contained, confined, much like how we as humans have become trapped by our urban settings, finding comfort in being confined there. However, it was while I was examining SCP-3037 that I apparently suffered something of an incident. From the moment I touched it, I spoke in only Serbo-Croatian, believing myself to actually be the city of Dubrovnik. I awoke a short while later and was informed by another researcher that I had been administered with an extremely high dose of amnestics to negate the effects of SCP-3037. Although later that night I recalled having a dream about some delicious black risotto with squid ink sauce. The research heads ordered security officers to gather everyone in the mess hall. The Foundation was seemingly aware that they had an imposter, a charlatan in their midst, pretending to be a member of personnel. I made sure my facial expression did not betray that I was the one they sought. Not one of these Philistines could appreciate my goal of infiltrating Site-19. Not one had the slightest clue how revolutionary my actions would be for the art world. However, although staying vigilant, I became increasingly aware time might not be on my side much longer. After overhearing a conversation about something known as SCP-035, I began conducting my own secretive research into what it was. I discovered information on the so-called possessive mask within the Foundation's archives. Immediately, my heart skipped a beat. The porcelain mask that shifted from an exaggerated comedic grin to a wide frown, it would have made for a perfect art piece to present to AWCY. Much to my annoyance, SCP-035 wasn't housed at Site-19, however. Over the next few days, I petitioned to have the possessive mask transferred to the facility so that I could claim it. My greatest anomalous art piece stayed out of reach, though. I was informed by senior research staff that the mask posed a potential danger. Anyone nearby was compelled to wear it, and would thus be taken over by its influence. Additionally, questions started to be raised as to why I was requesting this transfer in the first place. I was starting to grow concerned that my cover had been blown. By now it very much seemed that my time was running out. And although it shames me to admit it, to say I handled that notion with grace and professionality, well, that would be a lie. Suddenly, I found it. The perfect anomalous art piece. While rummaging around the Foundation's files, I located one about something known as SCP-1379. As I read more, I realized it would secure my spot within AWCY and forever grant me the recognition I deserved. Even better, it was a painting. Such a classical art medium, they'd never be able to refuse me. As I looked at it directly for the first time, I knew I had found my masterpiece. SCP-1379 depicted a clown and two children on the canvas, but the subject of the painting would hardly matter to AWCY. They only cared that the artwork was anomalous. 
and SCP-1379 certainly was. This painting would allow me to exact revenge on the AWCY members who'd failed to recognize my artistic genius for so long. Anyone that made a critical remark on SCP-1379, which those AWCY snobs were bound to do when they saw it, would first experience intense pain. After 20 minutes of sharp, severe agony, the sensations would subside, but that would only be the start of it. Everyone at the AWCY that dared to criticize my magnum opus, my SCP-1379, would rapidly lose their ability to imagine. Any of their creativity that allowed them to laud their artistic superiority over me would cease to exist. None of them would ever make anomalous art again, and they'd surely be forced to finally accept that I am, in fact, the greatest artist of all time. From the moment I saw it, I began to plan my escape with SCP-1379 in tow. A hundred days have passed since I arrived here, and when I leave it will be with SCP-1379 and this journal. I've not only chronicled how I infiltrated the SCP Foundation, but also cataloged more about anomalous art than anyone at AWCY ever has. Once I've lifted that painting from its containment locker, my old friends at the Insurgency have arranged for me to be extracted from Site-19. With SCP-1379, finally, I'll achieve my dream of- This journal, belonging to one Stathis Stearns, has been seized by the SCP Foundation. Stearns was discovered to have infiltrated Site-19 after only a handful of days. However, given that he posed little threat and never left the facility, security officers were instructed to monitor him closely until he attempted to escape. Aware of intelligence reports regarding various SCPs noted within his journal, the Foundation deemed Stathis Stearns a security risk after 100 days. Subject was arrested attempting to escape and is to be administered amnestics. His journal will remain at Site-19 until further notice. Ask anyone that has been through it, and they'll all tell you the same. That moving home is maybe one of the most stressful things that a normal person can ever experience. It's a logistical nightmare right from the start. The moment you talk to a realtor about being interested in selling your current house and buying another, everything goes downhill from there. After that moment, an avalanche of things comes hurtling towards you. Finding a place you like, making an offer, letting people look around your house, waiting for them to make a counteroffer, exchanging contracts, and that's before you even have thought about packing. And as Milo had learned, doing all of that on your own only makes the stress of moving feel all the more potent. But he had finally made it. After a constant back and forth with his realtor, the time had come for him to pack up all of his worldly possessions and relocate to a brand new place to call home. He had felt it was long overdue for him to get a change of scenery, and luckily just the right place had come onto the market to answer that call. It was a pretty big house, bigger than Milo's previous home, but considerably cheaper. In fact, he thought it had been significantly undervalued. The house had an almost Victorian-era feel to it, all beautifully carved and varnished woodwork and creaky old floorboards but in more of an elegant, refined sort of way, rather than a creepier one. That's not to say Milo's new place wasn't without its more unsettling elements. Aside from being big, spacious, and easy to imagine as being haunted, the creepiest thing about the house, aside from its frighteningly low price, was the story of what happened to the previous owners. Obviously, you know that legally we have to disclose whether or not anyone died on this property, the realtor had explained, wearing a forced grin as she showed Milo around the house. Hearing that sentence, he could feel the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. Someone died here? He asked in disbelief. No, 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 of course not, sir. The realtor instantly walked back her statement, less in an effort to ease her client's nerves, but more to ensure that she still closed the deal and earned her commission bonus. Then why the hell would you start a sentence like that? Milo asked. We just have to give full disclosure, but I assure you, the previous residents didn't die on the grounds of this house. She gave that fake smile again. It was pretty ineffectual at reassuring him. So what happened to the last owner? Well, it's a bit of a mystery to be honest. A local legend if you like. But hey, that gives the place more flavor, hearing some spooky history, right? Think of what a conversation starter that will be. The realtor ended her sentence with a forced snorting laugh, but reined it back in when she realized Milo wasn't laughing with her. 
Ah, as far as I know, there used to be an older couple living here, the Shaws. They were apparently very quiet, reclusive, kept to themselves a lot, I'm sure you know the type. Milo couldn't help but notice she shot him a look as she said that part, as if she was silently passing judgment on the fact he was planning on moving in alone. But they used to spend a lot of time tending the garden out front, so their neighbors would see them pretty frequently, which meant they were all okay and no one had any bad mishaps in the house. You know how old folks can be, such a worry when they get to that age. Yeah, totally. Milo interjected, aware the realtor was stalling. He repeated, So, what actually happened to them? Well, that's the thing, she shrugged. Nobody knows the full story. One day, the neighbors across the street noticed they hadn't seen Mr. and Mrs. Shaw for quite a while, so naturally they came on over here to see if they were in, and the last thing they wanted was to assume everything was hunky-dory here. I mean, hey, better safe than sorry, right? But once they got inside, they couldn't find either of them. Mr. and Mrs. Shaw were just gone, vanished without a trace. Most people on the street thought they had just sold the place, kept it quiet and moved away, retired to somewhere nice and exotic. Oh, well, that sounds nice, I suppose. Milo replied, relieved to hear that there hadn't been any brutal unsolved murders in the house, and that it most likely wasn't haunted. That's just what the neighbors think anyway, the realtor continued. Of course, they hadn't sold the house, they just left it. When my firm came in to repossess the place, it had all their belongings in it. Some might even still be laying around here. Uh, anyway, did you want to have a look at that contract? Well, strictly speaking, Milo was the only human living in his new house. He was never fully alone. He had arrived with his two closest friends, a pair of pets he had adopted while living in his old house. One was a hamster by the name of Donut, named after his round little body, and the golden brown shade of his fur had reminded Milo of the glazed sugary baked treat. The other was Pixel, a bearded dragon with a pattern on his scales that resembled some kind of mosaic art. The first order of business Milo had decided was before even unpacking, he needed to make sure his scaly and furry friends each had a suitable place to stay and that he got them fed. Little did he realize there was something else living in the house with them, something that was far bigger and was getting much hungrier than either of his pets would. Looking around the house, Milo stumbled across a few boxes that he hadn't brought with him. Like the realtor had said, the Shaw still had some of their possessions left lying around the place. Most of it was useless to Milo. Old man's clothes or a set of knitting needles and rolls of colorful thread, it was those particular clues that seemed to imply Mrs. Shaw had a lot of free time on her hands and maybe took up knitting as a hobby during retirement. Of course, the bigger clue was the huge handmade blanket that Milo found draped over some of the remaining boxes in the attic. He wasn't exactly well versed in knitwear, but he could appreciate the craft behind this soft blanket. It clearly had a lot of time and effort put into making it, painstakingly knitting each and every individual thread, looping it around a pair of steel needles and eventually, after hours of wearing out shaking, bony fingers, produce something that actually looked quite nice. Even though the idea of sitting and knitting a blanket might have been one of the most boring uses of time Milo could imagine, he still had to admit he was surprised that the Shaws had left this particular piece of bedding behind. It seemed like it would be pretty comfy to sleep under, and might help keep a person warm at night now that the colder seasons were approaching. What's more was that the blanket was clean, almost like it had been freshly washed. There was no old person smell on it, no dirt or discoloration, not a stain and it hadn't even accumulated any dust in its fibers. In fact, he noticed that there was hardly any dust at all up in the attic, despite the house being empty for so long. He assumed the realtors had hired someone as a caretaker while they found a buyer for the place, and they had kept the place clean. After all, what other conclusion could they have possibly drawn? It's not as if something had eaten all the dust. That would be absurd. He'd have a sort through of the Shaw's leftovers later, maybe sell some of it off at a local yard sale or give it to a thrift store. But that blanket might come in handy when it started snowing, so Milo had half a mind to keep it. Now, part of what makes moving home such a stressful life experience isn't just all the logistical and administrative parts of the process. It's only made worse by the fact that it takes forever to move into a new house fully. That's the part everyone always forgets about. The months after a move, when you're forced to live amongst towers of cardboard boxes, all your worldly possessions buried deep within them, and you can never remember which crate anything is in when you urgently need it. 
So realizing it would take him much longer to unpack all of his things, Milo set about making sure he had everything that Donut and Pixel would need already to hand. The latter of his two pets, the Bearded Dragon, usually spent most of his days in a spacious glass tank. Milo didn't love the idea of keeping either of his two best buds so confined, but Pixel never went very far anyway, content to lay under a heat lamp almost perfectly still for most of the day. Donut, on the other hand, was much more of a free spirit. The tiny brown hamster physically could not stay still, and most days seemed to be filled with more energy than Milo was. As a result, he let the little guy roll about inside a little plastic ball all day long, until his little hamster feet gave out. And now, Donut had much more space to zip around inside his ball, so while he entertained himself, Milo could focus on what needed fixing, cleaning, and generally improving around the house. It didn't take him long to realize, however, that the realtors had pulled a bit of a fast one on him. Despite the absolute steal of a price that Milo had been offered, it quickly became clear that the unknown fate of the previous residence wasn't the only detail about the house that had been conveniently kept hidden. The place was in dire need of repair, with a lot of the old woodwork rapidly rotting away. If left unchecked, parts of the house could collapse and come apart at the seams. To make matters worse, the boiler was an ancient iron monstrosity that was barely able to produce warm water, which would quickly become an even bigger problem when the weather started to get colder. Then, to top off the trifecta of unforeseen issues and teething problems with his new place, Milo couldn't sleep. It was to be expected. After all, the house was old, worn out, and had definitely seen better days. There were bound to be a few noises, the odd creak coming from upstairs when Milo and his two pets were all downstairs, the tapping of branches against windows blowing in the wind outside. But for some reason, every audible disturbance that emanated from some hidden corner of the building only seemed to get a thousand times louder when the sun went down. At nighttime, every squeaky floorboard or random noise of the house settling was nearly deafening, enough to pull Milo right out of what little restless sleep he was getting. The worst part about it was, though he couldn't help it, it made him feel unwelcome as if Mr. and Mrs. Shaw were angered that he had moved in. In the dark, it was hard not to picture every sound as one or both of the old couple creeping through the corridors, coming to reclaim their home and remove Milo from the premises. One night, the noises started invading what little sleep Milo did manage to get, spilling into his dream and causing them to devolve into unsettling nightmares. There was an old photograph in a frame that he had come across in the personal effects left behind by the Shaws, showing the pair of them staring disapprovingly out of the image at him. Now, thanks to the creaking wooden structure of the house and the sounds it made at night, Milo was seeing the old couple in every bad dream he had. Both their faces were locked in those same still, frozen expressions of contempt as they tried to exercise him like an interloper on their property. That was the final nail in the coffin that made Milo realize he needed to look at other options. Surely there had to be some way to induce a deep enough sleep so that the sounds the house was making weren't keeping him up or incepting nightmares anymore. He called the local doctor, arranging a consultation for later that day. As he hung up the phone, something nudged against his foot. It was Donut, having rolled through the maze of cardboard boxes still filling the house. Milo took one look at the little brown furred hamster and the crates that still littered the place. Grabbing the leftover items that the Shads had forgotten to take with them before they vanished, Milo moved those boxes out into the shed. He knew he was probably reaching, that it was hard likely to make even the slightest difference to his sleeping, but maybe keeping their stuff away from him would keep the old couple out of his head. The only thing he kept in the house was the blanket. There was no use letting it go to waste, especially knowing that the boiler was on the blink and it would be cold soon. He rolled it up and left it on his bed, leaving his more mobile pet in the same room before heading out to see the doctor. When Milo got back, a bottle of prescription sleeping pills in his pocket, he couldn't help but notice his room seemed different. The blanket looked like it had fallen off the bed and onto the floor for one. But more worryingly, Donut's plastic travel ball had been split open laying in pieces on the ground, with its furry little occupant nowhere to be seen. Over the next few hours, Milo searched every corner of the house, calling out to his hamster, trying to lure it back with more morsels of food. But Donut didn't seem to be anywhere. He wasn't even underneath the knitted blanket. Still, there was no sign. 
As worry set in, Milo hurriedly checked Pixel's cage to see if he was gone too, but the lizard was relaxing, as lethargic as ever, completely unfazed by what was going on. It certainly seemed that when it rained, it really poured in this new house. Just as he was searching for his missing hamster, Milo heard a new, horrible sound echo through the corridors. This one wasn't so much a scary noise, even if it did make him jump, but it was more the inconvenience that came with it. Finally, giving out after God knows how many years it had been installed for, the house's boiler burst. Spending the afternoon into the evening failing to track down one of his missing pets and stopping the huge iron cast boiler from flooding the basement wasn't exactly what Milo had in mind for fun activities to do when he got home. Going to bed frustrated made it as hard to sleep as all the nightly cacophony of creaking floorboards and branches raking against the windows. He tapped out two of the pills the doctor had prescribed him, knocking them back with a sharp motion of his head and a swig of cold water before laying back in bed. As night had fallen, the temperature also had plummeted too. Not having a boiler to heat his room meant that Milo couldn't stop himself from shivering in the cold, his breath forming clouds in front of his face. He reached for the knitted blanket and threw it over himself, curling up underneath it to try and provide an extra layer of warmth to protect himself from the gnawing cold. The pills did as they were meant to, helping Milo to quickly sleep into a much deeper sleep than he had experienced in a while. Although it didn't seem to help the nightmares, Mr. and Mrs. Shaw came back again. This time they had Milo's arms and legs tied up. With their matching disapproving faces, the elderly couple threw something over their helpless victim and tried to smother him to death. For a dream, it felt so intense, so real. Milo could feel a heavy weight on top of his body as he slept. In fact, it felt like it was all around him, engulfing and crushing the life out of him from all sides. But it was the feeling of something wet against his arm, the sensation of liquid against his skin, and the numbness where his hand should be were what finally pulled him out of the dream and into the nightmare. Through the dark and his cloudy vision, Milo could see a wide, gaping maw filled with teeth. The feeling of being crushed was still surrounding him, and despite kicking his legs and trying to free himself from confinement, it didn't stop squeezing him tighter. His panic was already making it harder to catch his breath, but now he could barely fill his lungs enough to scream for help. Not that anyone was around to hear him, but it was the sight of his arm that chilled Milo's blood. It wasn't there anymore. Part of it, just above the elbow, was just gone. His hand, fingers, every internal bone and muscle had been reduced to a bloody mess, a slurry of red melting and coming apart. It was runny, little more than a liquid resembling the consistency of sand when it's underwater and becomes sludge. Most of his flesh was liquefied, going further up his arm, and as the blanket pulled its prey into its mouth, until Milo was no more, not a trace of him left, just like the previous owners. Little did Milo or the Shaws and Donut before him know, but he'd been the victim of a creature that was part of a rather unique species. While they will often vary in size, shape, pattern, and other aspects of their appearance, SCP-799 always seem to be ordinary items of knitted bedwear, at least at first. They retain heat like a normal blanket would, and are soft to the touch, and for the most part, don't seem directly harmful. And usually, they aren't. SCP-799s are incapable of much movement, instead laying still a lot of time not unlike a certain bearded dragon that just lost its owner. They also don't seem to require much in the way of food, extracting what little nutrition they do need by drawing in household dust. A lot of the organic matter and dust is comprised of dead and discarded human hair and skin cells, so this makes sense. This feeding is all done through filtered mouths in the fibers. However, this changes if an SCP-799 blanket is forced to go on a long time without food. While they possess this biological trait themselves, SCP-799 don't seem to regard cold-blooded animals to be the source of food. In fact, they don't even seem to be able to detect other creatures with cold blood, such as reptiles. Instead, SCP-799 will metamorphose into a more predatory form in order to consume any warm-blooded mammal or human being it encounters, transforming its feeding orifices and digestive tract into a singular mouth lined with several rolls of sharp, pointed teeth. From there, it will wrap up the largest warm-blooded animal it can find, whether that be a hamster or a grown man, and will tear off parts of its prey, reducing them to little more than a thin slurry as it digests their body mass to feed itself. 
So if you move into a new house and come across an old knitted blanket, maybe consider throwing it out. If you want to live. Now go and check out SCP-3032 and then it was an angry spider. For more warnings about everyday objects that can seem harmless at first, but will quickly turn deadly when you least expect it. And after that, if you're in the market for a piece of anomalous furniture that's still soft and cozy like the blanket, but nowhere near as dangerous, then SCP-3832 Surprise Pillow Fight might be just what you need. The desert is still. The night seems endless, silent, and at peace, until it's pierced by the sound of gunshots and screams. Deep in the Sahara, the SCP Foundation is waging war against a newly discovered enemy. A squad of Foundation agents is retreating, trying to get away from the ones who massacred their allies. They were attempting to eliminate the threat using conventional means, but their rifles were no match for the reality-bending entities of the Kingdom of Abaddon. The retreating agents cover one another as they make their way back to the extraction point. The enemy force advances. Agents that are caught too close to the sorcerers of Abaddon disintegrate into thin air. This is not an enemy they can defeat. The SCP agents need to get back to base and relay what they have found to their superiors. Out of the hundreds of agents sent into the Sahara that night, only a handful make it out alive. They are debriefed by their superiors at the Foundation who classify the anomalous humanoids under the highest of threat levels. The Kingdom of Abaddon is a threat. The Kingdom of Abaddon must be eliminated. Reconnaissance done prior to the disastrous mission had alerted the Foundation to the presence of anomalies in the region, but they had no idea how strong the anomalous humanoids would be. From data gathered through old reports, it seemed like the Abaddon humanoids were responsible for the deaths of no fewer than 75 Foundation personnel, and had stolen at least 12 different items from the Foundation. The leaders of the SCP Foundation tasked research team Omega-5 with developing a weapon that would be capable of destroying the Kingdom of Abaddon once and for all. The weapon they are researching must be capable of long-range destruction, because the moment any Foundation agent gets close to the area, they are vaporized by the reality-manipulating powers of its inhabitants. The project is given the name Twins of God, and is led by a Foundation doctor known only by the designation O51. O51 is popular in the SCP Foundation, well known for his in-depth research and charismatic personality, making him the perfect person to lead such a project. And O51 recently came across an anomaly that he believes holds the solution the Foundation has been looking for to defeat the Kingdom of Abaddon. Item 001. And so the Omega-5 team gets to work. They discover that the anomaly has incredible powers when put inside a host, which they refer to as an Item 001 entity, and set up a series of experiments using different people to harness its energy. The first series of tests all end in tragedy. The anomaly causes the entity it inhabits to become intensely radioactive. Anyone who gets close to it succumbs to immediate radiation sickness, and eventually, death. To stop the radiation problems, the Omega-5 research group intensifies the containment procedures. O51 receives reports from the higher-ups that the Kingdom of Abaddon has attacked another Foundation facility in Sudan. Long-range defense is needed ASAP. The administrator puts more pressure on Omega-5, and especially its leader O51, to solve the problems of Item 001 and develop a weapon that can save the Foundation. He stays awake for days on end, working tirelessly to create a safe and controllable Item 001 entity. Although there are signs that the weapon will work, it is still unpredictable. <gasps> when Item 001 is initiated, the host entity becomes paralyzed, suffers severe cerebral hemorrhaging, and soon a new host is needed before testing can begin again. And that's not the only thing that goes wrong. Whenever the anomaly is put into a new host, sudden and random destruction of on-site structures and personnel take place. O51 knows, though, that if this power can be harnessed and controlled in the right way, that it could be the weapon that the Foundation needs to wipe out the Kingdom of Abaddon once and for all. In order to control Item 001, O51 has a mind kill switch implanted in its host's brains. O51 can activate the implant to incapacitate its host and immediately stop the unwanted destruction. Countless hosts are terminated by this mind kill switch in the early trials conducted by the Omega-5 team, but progress continues to be made, and eventually a hypothesis is formulated. 
Perhaps the disastrous side effects of item 001 can be offset by spreading the anomaly across multiple subjects. They theorize that the immense mental load of the anomaly can be distributed among several hosts, thus reducing the toil it takes on each and giving them the ability to control its immense power. But 051 and the Omega-5 team need more data, and for that, they need more bodies. They consult with the director of Site-17, and it is concluded that the nearby town of San Marco would be an appropriate place to get the additional test subjects they require. On a quiet Sunday morning, Omega-5, along with support from a squad of armed SCP agents, storm into the San Marcos de la Vida Sterna church during the middle of Mass. They gather up a number of the younger congregants and bring them back to the site where item 001 is housed. The researchers quickly ran through their new supply of test subjects, though, and Omega-5 would need to get even more if their research was to continue. Instead of going back and forth between the testing facility and San Marcos, 051 decided to move the entire item 001 operation to the town itself. He renames the town Testing Site 001, and Omega-5 rounds up 23 of the healthiest subjects they can find for use in the next series of research yeah. tests. A few weeks after occupying the town of San Marco, Omega-5 makes its most substantial progress yet. Just as they theorized, by spreading out the anomaly of item 001 across a specific group of hosts, they can control its powers. The test may have cost the lives of almost everyone in the town, but the ends certainly justify the means. The Kingdom of Abaddon poses an existential threat to the SCP Foundation, after all, and thanks to this research, they will soon have a weapon capable of bringing them victory. The Foundation Administer criticized O51's methods, but can't argue with his results. Unfortunately, O51 has a dark secret, a secret that disturbs even the most hardened and loyal members of Omega-5 a secret that has to do with the item 001 hosts. The hosts that Omega-5 has made its major progress with are not the ordinary test subjects normally used by the Foundation. No, the test subjects 051 makes his breakthrough with are children, nine of them to be exact, all between four and 11 years old. Despite being told specifically by the Foundation Administrator to only test on adults, the research required 051 to break the chain of command and follow the science down the path it led. The children are contained in a reinforced bunker where only 051 and a select few have access. They are technically alive, but are functionally brain dead. The group of nine children share a hive mind that can process information, and more importantly, can unleash the full potential of the implanted anomaly, creating and controlling a devastating power. But not everyone is thrilled with what they've achieved. Members of Omega-5 are haunted by the screams of the children that they force to be part of their weapons development program. They describe their merging with item 001 as being a process that rips out their souls and replaces them with something much more sinister. In fact, all of Omega-5 regret what they have been a part of and what they've done, all except 051. The nine children can channel unprecedented amounts of energy from an unknown origin that Omega-5 hypothesizes comes from an extra-dimensional source, which is then used to unbind atoms at the quantum level. When the right activation words are spoken, it appears as though this tremendous power gives the children the ability to annihilate anything in the entire universe. It's a gun to end all guns, and only 051 has the key to control it. The Nine Children works so well with an item 001 that Omega-5 reclassifies it to include the Nine Children themselves. They are not just the entity housing or controlling item 001, they permanently become item 001. Once Omega-5 has a better understanding of item 001, they begin to run tests to find out the full extent of its abilities. First, they test the distance item 001 can reach. The initial test that Omega-5 carries out is on a steel rod placed 5 kilometers away. 051 orders the children to destroy the target. Moments later, the phone next to 051 begins to ring. When he picks it up, the observer tasked with watching the pole is on the other end. He informs 051 that the steel rod has been completely vaporized. 051 is not satisfied though. He has another pole sent out, this time placed 8,000 kilometers away from the nine children. 051 asks the children to destroy that rod. Almost immediately, the phone rings again. The target has been vaporized. 051 smiles. 
The next series of tests Omega-5 runs on item 001 are to determine the maximum size of an object that can be destroyed. The tests start out with a steel sphere, 3 meters in diameter, placed 1,000 kilometers from item 001. 051 orders the children to destroy the object. It is instantly vaporized. 051 has seen enough small tests. It's time for something big. So he does something that will later be questioned by everyone at the SCP Foundation. Mm -hmm. He orders the nine children to destroy a Church of the Broken God worship site in Turkey. Not long after the destruction order is given to item 001, reports begin coming in. The worship site has been obliterated with no observable damage to the surrounding area. Deadly and precise. 051 closes his eyes and takes a deep breath. He looks as if he's overcome by an immense spiritual experience. He opens his eyes, leans over to the children, and whispers the name of someone. Later that day, 051 finds out that the target he had named has been vaporized. The success of Omega-5 in item 001 is relayed to the administration of the Foundation. They are so impressed that they make plans to use item 001 to eliminate the Abaddon threat once and for all. However, one of the heads of the Foundation, Administrator Williams, has major concerns about the way 051 is running the program. The updates that 051 has been sending have become less scientific and more philosophical, more spiritual. Administrator Williams sends a letter to 051 reassuring him that he is doing good work. But once the mission to destroy the Kingdom of Abaddon is completed, 051 will be promoted to director and reassigned to the newly constructed Site-19. For the good of the Foundation, and maybe the rest of the world, he'll be permanently moved away from Item 001. 051's response is short and to the point. I am fine, Administrator. The project is finished. We will complete our task when you arrive. Administrator Williams arrives at Site 001 a few days later. He is greeted by 051 and the Omega-5 team. Williams can't help but notice that 051 has a strange look in his eyes. It is the look of a crazed man who has been lost in his work, and who has, perhaps, lost himself. Williams puts the thought away, though, and walks with 051 and his accompanying agents to the viewing area, where the powers of item 001 will be demonstrated. Administrator Williams and the other agents watch from a protected viewing room as 051 enters the chamber of his new superweapon. It's time to see if their weapon that has had so much time, effort, sweat, tears, and especially blood poured into it will have been worth it. Everyone watches as 051 leans over and says the name of the Abaddon Citadel to the nine children. All at once, they start to glow. No one observing can see what has happened in the far-off kingdom but they know something big has happened. The administrator is thrilled, but notices something. 051 hesitated a moment while leaning over the children before standing back up. Did he whisper something else to them? And then Administrator Williams vaporizes, pulled apart at an atomic level before he has the chance to scream. What's going on? The agents standing next to where Administrator Williams previously existed begin to yell and pull out their guns. They burst through the door of the observation room and run down the hallway towards where 051 and the nine children are located. The arm agents rush into the room, but 051 is gone. The nine children are still. Over the next few weeks, 051 is reported to be seen several times by SCP agents. However, no one is able to catch him, and it appears as though other members of the SCP Foundation have also gone AWOL as well, perhaps joining him on the run. It is unclear what his plan is, but the reports from the reconnaissance team sent into the Sahara make it obvious what the result of his first command to the children was. There isn't a single humanoid or building left in the Kingdom of Abaddon. But even with this victory, the highest levels of the SCP Foundation have an ominous thought lurking in the back of their minds. Where did 051 go? And what is he planning to do next? Following the improper use of item 001 leading to the untimely death of a high-ranking Foundation staff member, the weapon was deemed too dangerous and containment procedures were implemented. Due to the high amount of radiation they were found to emit, the nine children were placed into lead-lined bags and buried under 50 meters of concrete beneath the church of San Marcos de la Vida Eterna. Though all of the children continued to be functionally brain-dead, they still display signs of life despite their containment, and by order of the Overseer Council, have been classified as a Thaumiel entity. The SCP Foundation deals with plenty of different groups of interest. 
cults, rival agencies, criminal organizations, all of which have some connection to anomalous artifacts and creatures. But there are some groups of interest who actually are responsible for the creation of anomalies. And a few are as weird and intriguing as the Dr. Wondertainment Toy Company. Whether or not Dr. Wondertainment is a real person or not is the subject of much speculation. But whoever they are, the company that bears their name has produced a multitude of dangerous anomalous items that are currently in Foundation containment. Usually these anomalies take the form of highly dangerous toys, but the company has also released a very peculiar set of limited edition creations. A set of 21 living, breathing, more or less human beings known collectively as the Little Misters. All of them are marked by tattoos of their name, and each comes with a card reading, Wow! You've just found yourself your very own Little Mister, a limited edition collection from Dr. Wondertainment. Find them all and become Mr. Collector. Let's take a look and see what's out there before you try and catch them all. SCP-905, or Mr. Chameleon, is a living being made up entirely of photons. His form is described as fuzzy but definite, and he appears to be the rough shape of a human male standing at approximately 175 centimeters in height. He has no mass due to being made solely of light particles, at least not one we can measure. And while he can move and speak, he cannot manipulate objects in the world around him. Mr. Chameleon, as his name suggests, can alter the wavelength of the light coming from his body in order to match the color of his environment. He also has the ability to walk through any transparent material. SCP-2287, or Mr. Headless, is a human male who is mostly normal aside from his lack of a head. Mr. Headless is blind, but can somehow still speak and hear, and does not need to eat. Spending time around Mr. Headless can cause people to experience dissociative episodes where they begin to see themselves as headless as well. In an interview, Mr. Headless claims to have been created for use as a Halloween decoration, with his dissociative effect on others being intended as a kind of spooky prank, even if it does sound more like a form of torture. Mr. Headless was found by the Foundation wandering the streets of a Wisconsin town after he left an attic where he had been kept with other holiday decorations. SCP-1799, or Mr. Laugh, is a human male standing 120 centimeters tall, who has the physical characteristics of a classic circus clown, complete with gray and white skin, a red nose, and comically long feet. He is capable of communication, but everything he says will be interpreted by those around him as a joke. No matter what he says, people around him will start to laugh. And the more he talks, the more people laugh. In some cases, they can even laugh themselves to death. For example, one D-Class personnel used to test the effects of Mr. Laugh started laughing so hard that he lost his balance and suffered a fatal cranial injury. SCP-909, or Mr. Forgetful, is a man with retrograde amnesia. He appears aware of his condition and cannot seem to recall any of his own memories. The only way that information appears able to enter Mr. Forgetful's long-term memory is if he writes it down. However, when he does so, something strange happens. The memory he's just written down is instantly forgotten by anyone else who was involved in the events. SCP-3537, or Mr. Shapey, is an amorphous humanoid that changes shape, though this transformation happens involuntarily. All of Mr. Shapey's transformations are into non-anomalous human beings, and they have been seen taking their own notes on possible anomalous properties each new persona could have. They describe these transformations as painful, with the level of pain varying dependent on how dramatic the change is. Despite the pain, Mr. Shapey says they're happy the way they are. In an interview, they claim to be the first of the Little Misters, and their random transformations were used as inspiration for the appearance of all the subsequent Little Mister designs. SCP-1908, or Mr. Soap, is a man who constantly produces soapy water, which will quickly fill up any area he's in and cause all surrounding surfaces to become slippery. The soap can be easily cleaned up with normal methods, but the levels of liquid being produced by Mr. Soap's body have to be constantly monitored. When the Foundation discovered him, he was in a factory in China where he had been put to work cleaning the machinery. 
SCP-913, or Mr. Hungry, is a middle-aged African-American male wearing a dress shirt and pants, who is capable of eating almost any material. Mr. Hungry is given nutrients intravenously and must be provided with a full day's worth of calories every two hours, or else he will enter a hunger trance. While in this trance state, he is capable of biting with a force of up to 5,000 newtons and will devour anything and everything around him. His metabolism is so fast that drugs and toxins have no effect on him, including amnestics and anesthesia. SCP-629, or Mr. Brass, is a massive brass automaton, standing at 170 centimeters and weighing 500 kilograms. All parts of Mr. Brass's body are removable and can be rearranged with only mild discomfort to Mr. Brass himself. Projections show that there are at least 73 billion possible combinations of Mr. Brass's body parts. When Mr. Brass was discovered by the Foundation, he had been taken in by the Church of the Broken God, who believed him to be a religious idol and worshipped him as a deity. SCP-644, or Mr. Hot, is a man who can both accurately guess the number of children that any person has, biological or otherwise, and predict the material wishes of any child. He also claims to be able to accurately predict the popularity of any product aimed at children. When approached, he will offer a business card that identifies him as Dr. Wondertainment's marketing consultant. He was found sleeping in the hallway of a school in Racine, Wisconsin, a town that was later found to contain many children with anomalous Wondertainment toys in their possession. In interviews, Mr. Hot describes his job as being able to identify which children would get the most use out of a Wondertainment toy. In his own words, You can't just give this kind of craftsmanship to just anybody. You give the average kid a realistic race car, he's just gonna go leave it on a shelf and go stare at the sun or something. SCP-2396, or Miss Sweetie, is a female humanoid who stands at 250 centimeters tall and weighs 101 kilograms. She lives entirely on sugar and foods containing sugar and claims to be in pain when denied her sweet fuel. She has a repellent effect on males, a feature which she says is meant to keep nasty brothers and their friends out. Anomalous hard candies will appear at random anywhere in a 6km radius of Miss Sweetie's location. When ingested by females, the candies are perfectly harmless, but any masculine presenting humans who eat them start to undergo transformation into a being made entirely of living candy. These candy entities are resistant to blunt force trauma, but can be easily dispatched with fire and will obey any command given to them by any person who identifies as female. SCP-1007, or Mr. Life, is a male humanoid who goes through the entire human life cycle every 75 minutes, aging at a rate of one year per minute. Mr. Life has a keyhole in his back that when a key is inserted into it, can reverse the aging process. Each turn of the key regresses Mr. Life one year younger until he's fully regressed to a newborn baby. Mr. Life was seized from a California mansion after he had been purchased at an auction held by Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited, another group of interests that provides the wealthiest and most powerful people in the world with objects and experiences that would otherwise be impossible without the help of the anomalies they trade in. Other little misters were also sold at the auction, though the buyer of Mr. Life couldn't recall who they were or exactly which little misters they had bought. The tattoo on Mr. Life's back reads Mr. Life and Mr. Death, which may imply that Mr. Life has a counterpart that the Foundation has not yet been able to identify. SCP-527, or Mr. Fish, is a non-anomalous man with no physical abnormalities of any kind, save for the fact that he has the head of a fish. He was discovered in Boston in 2002 and moved to Site-19 in 2004. In his initial interview with Foundation researcher uh -huh. Dr. Baker, Mr. Fish was very frank and upfront about his lack of interesting qualities. Like I told the other guy, this is all it is. You're looking at it. Lies, thrives, hot, sweetie, they got all the good stuff. I'm just the guy with the fish head. SCP-917, or Mr. Moon, is an elderly man whose facial features wax and wane in time with the lunar cycle. On nights when the moon is full, his face is normal, and his face is completely blank on nights with a new moon. This is painless for Mr. Moon, but he does lose his sense of sight, hearing, and smell when his face is in its new moon state, and he claims that the experience leaves him very tired. 
SCP-2855, or Mr. Money, is a Latin American man who is anomalously affected by any business transactions regarding his ownership. As soon as any person exchanges money for ownership of Mr. Money and creates any kind of written proof of that ownership, Mr. Money will be teleported to their location. Mr. Money's abilities are also subject to the beliefs of whoever claims ownership of him and will display any anomalous properties that are written as part of his contract. Mr. Money was recovered in 2007, taken from the holdings of Marshall Carter and Dark LLP, a branch of the same company that had previously sold Mr. Life. When Mr. Money was discovered, MC and D had been selling and buying him back repeatedly in order to test his adaptive capabilities. SCP-920, or Mr. Lost, is an Asian man in a green hoodie who seems to do nothing but wander aimlessly. Transportation and containment of Mr. Lost are impossible, as any attempts to do so can result in a variety of natural disasters and other destructive phenomena. He has a kind of psychic pull on those around him, who feel compelled to walk and talk with him. Mr. Lost doesn't seem to suffer from any environmental effects, as he has been spotted wandering deserts and tundra with no apparent harm coming to him whatsoever. SCP-2284 or Mr. Lai is a man of Indian descent whose voice has a cognitohazardous effect on anyone who hears it. Any statement that Mr. Lai says will be perceived as true, despite the fact that Mr. Lai is physically incapable of telling the truth. Because of this, Mr. Lai communicates mainly via rhetorical questions, which is the only way he can express what he means. SCP-2428-1, or Mr. Mad, is a man in a multicolored straitjacket who can only be seen by those possessing the document designated SCP-2428, a document which serves as proof of purchase. Mr. Mad is essentially an imaginary friend who can only be seen by the lone person in possession of the SCP-2428 document. In interviews, Mr. Mad expresses a belief that he was a real person once, before being rendered imaginary by Dr. Wondertainment. In fact, there is evidence to suggest many of the little misters were once ordinary people. SCP-2933 is a partially submerged steel structure located in a saltwater reservoir, a structure which contains SCP-2933-A, or Mr. Scary. The interior of SCP-2933 is constantly changing and seems to move and shift in a way that directs anyone who enters towards Mr. Scary. Once inside the structure, there is no way back to the entrance. Despite his name and despite the sense of dread surrounding the steel structure, Mr. Scary doesn't seem interested in scaring people. He self-identifies as Mr. Smiles and seems to have the personality of a young child. His body is, like his containment, covered in rust, a condition which he claims was transferred to him by his father and which he says is very painful. While he does have a tattoo naming him Mr. Smiles, a rusted patch of his skin appears to have been marked with Mr. Scary, property of the factory, suggesting that they may have had something to do with his rusted condition. SCP-2148 or Mr. Stripes is a man wearing a white blindfold. If the blindfold is removed, anything that Mr. Stripes tries to commit to memory, whether that's a passage of text, a scene from a movie, or a person's face, becomes censored by large black bars in all existing records. Mr. Stripes refers to Mr. Lai as his brother and believes himself to be the first little mister, although he was told that by Mr. Lai, so take it with a grain of salt. Based on Mr. Stripes' testimony, Mr. Lai spent a lot of time with him, traveling around and making use of their combined abilities to break into secure government buildings. Even though they were close, Mr. Stripes has never directly looked at Mr. Lai. As he tells it, Dr. Wondertainment told him they weren't supposed to look at Mr. Lai yet. And then last but not least is Mr. Red, who has not been given a designation and is listed as a discontinued little mister. His story is a topic that would take an entire video to explain altogether, but he may just be the most violent, powerful, and dangerous of all the Little Misters. As interesting as the Little Misters are, they're not the only anomalous creatures of the mysterious Dr. Wondertainment. So let us know in the comments if you'd like to hear more about this twisted toy maker. After all, nothing makes you feel more like a child at heart than running in terror from a Dr. Wondertainment original. 
You're driving down a long highway, lost in an area you don't know too well, trying to find the right turn that'll have you heading back towards your home. You keep driving, the nighttime quiet all around you. Deciding to try and break that silence, you reach for the radio, turning the dial to filter through all the garbled, distorted voices and songs from nearby local radio stations that are too far out of range to come through clearly. You try your best to listen to the music from one radio station, but eventually the sound of the static only makes you wish for the silence you were trying to break. Your fingers nudge the tuning dial on your car radio once again, and finally, something comes through. It isn't loud or clear, but under the distortion, you can make out the sound, and it isn't a song or even a late news broadcast. The first thing you hear sounds like a short musical tone, only for about 10 seconds. Next, a young girl's voice speaking in a language you don't understand, even through the distorted audio. From her accent, you assume it's Russian, but you still have no idea what the words she's saying mean. With nothing else to listen to, you let the broadcast play. Still driving alone in the dark with nothing but the strange adolescent voice to accompany you, your mind begins to wander. She sounds like she's speaking something, but the rhythm of the words is somehow familiar to you, even though you don't speak Russian. Then it hits you. She's counting, but you don't feel smart for having worked that out. Instead, something about knowing that makes your blood run cold. You carry on driving through the night. After a few short minutes, the Russian girl stops counting, and the musical tone plays again under the distortion, leaving you alone in the car once again, with nothing but your thoughts and questions of what exactly you just heard. Thankfully, we have the answer. What you heard was SCP-3034. Since 1964, this same broadcast has been made a vast number of times, 627 times, in fact. You'd have to be within two kilometers of the broadcast's point of origin to hear it, where Foundation personnel have tried and failed numerous times to triangulate its source. The numbers heard recited in the SCP-3034 broadcast are actually a countdown from 200, read aloud in Russian. All Foundation staff are able to do while stationed at the nearby Provisional Site 3034 is scour radio frequencies for occurrences of SCP-3034. Checking their equipment is properly maintained and calibrated before they are eventually rotated off-site and replaced with a new group of staff. There is only one rule that any Foundation members working at Provisional Site 3034 must follow. They are only permitted to send one radio transmission with their equipment, a single phrase in reply to the SCP-3034 broadcast. Vizio Harashu. Receiving this, the countdown stops and the broadcast ends, but never permanently. SCP-3034 has been known to repeatedly occur, seemingly at random. The shortest recorded gap between broadcasts was two weeks, while the longest so far lasted six whole months. You may have heard the term number station mentioned before, but these are far from just random numerical sequences sent out over the airwaves without purpose. General speculation surrounding number stations points to them being the tools of espionage agents, a way of sending coded, highly sensitive messages or information without the risk of compromising their cover. The use of number station transmissions is often attributed to spies working on foreign soil, who utilize shortwave radio frequencies, speech synthesis, Morse code, and either regular or sporadic timing schedules. While it's true that times have changed and technology has progressed considerably, there appears to be evidence that number stations are still used among various intelligence and espionage agencies today. Despite being considered an old-fashioned method of communication, these low-tech shortwave stations remain a viable, reliable option for the transmission and reception of intelligence to field agents. The CONET project is a comprehensive archive of this phenomenon and its founder, Aiken Fernandez, has long been fascinated by number stations. According to him, this system is completely secure because the messages can't be tracked. The recipient could be anywhere. You just send spies to the country and get them to buy a radio. They know where to tune and when. So what does the distorted broadcast of numbers from SCP-3034 mean? Is it the work of covert agents? And if so, whose side are they on? Most importantly, 
Why does the SCP Foundation make certain there are always three of its personnel on site, ready to send the all is well message whenever SCP-3034 begins broadcasting? SCP-3034 was first discovered by the Foundation in 1964, after a defector from the Soviet GRUP, a division tasked with acquiring and studying anomalies on behalf of the USSR, gave them a tip. Commander Robert Malthus, along with a team of six, including a man named Agent Browning, selected for his knowledge of Russian dialects, were sent to investigate at Provisional Site 3034. Here, the team uncovered partially burned records and logbooks, all kept in Russian, along with evidence that the site had been evacuated shortly before their arrival. Carved into a desk, also in Russian, were two phrases, don't let her finish, and tell her all is well. On the team's second day at the site, an automated alarm sounded at 7.30 a.m., alerting them to the incoming SCP-3034 broadcast. Following the instructions on the desk, Agent Browning was able to stop the broadcast, telling the young Russian girl that all was well. A tape was partially recovered by the team from the site and translated from Russian. The GRUP members that had previously inhabited the station had interrogated one of their own, a man named Sergei whom they accused of stealing state property. She's not state property, he replied. She has a name. While his GRUP superior accused Sergei of planning to defect to the United States, allegedly in exchange for money and asylum, Sergei denied any collusion with America. He claimed that the GRUP at Provisional Site 3034 were meddling with powers they could not possibly hope to understand. His superior, a man named Vaslov, dismissed this claiming their work to be no different to the United States' experimentation with atomic weapons at the time. One does not make deals with atom bombs, Sergei argued. One certainly does not sacrifice little girls to them. Shortly after this, a struggle broke out, with Sergei having to be restrained while urging Vaslov to cease any and all interference with it. The man spoke of terrible nightmares that he'd had, voices screaming in the darkness. That's what he wants, Vaslov. That's what it is. You cannot make a deal with this thing. We have finally contained it, and now you want to offer it. The tape's audio ends shortly after this point, with no clear answer as to what Sergei was referring to, or what offer these mm. Russian operatives had made to it. Ever since the discovery of SCP-3034, members of the SCP Foundation have worked tirelessly to understand the purpose of these countdowns, as well as determine their origin. By September 2012, Dr. Shulkill was reaching the end of his tether with the investigation into the SCP-3034 broadcast. Mm. Over almost half a century, the Foundation had made well over 600 recordings of the Russian girls' countdowns, but still hadn't determined any noteworthy information. They were prohibited from contacting the girl via the same radio frequency, only permitted to use the phrase that stopped her countdowns. Mm -hmm. Running out of options, Shulkill contacted his colleague, Dr. Emerson, asking for an in-depth vocal analysis of the various recordings of SCP-3034. Even if they could narrow down where the broadcast was coming from, maybe by determining the girl's geographical location from her dialect, then that would be at least some slight progress into understanding SCP-3034. While unable to discover the girl's location, Dr. Emerson's analysis did yield some interesting findings. Emerson learned that these countdowns were not pre-recorded, the variations in the Russian girl's voice, her tone, her pitch, all seemed to indicate that every instance of the broadcast was unique. Rather than use the same recording, this girl had been counting down over and over hundreds of times for almost 50 years. But there was more. Shulkill and Emerson then examined the distortion, the sounds interfering with the audio of the Russian girl's countdowns. What had initially seemed like garbled static seemed to actually be additional voices. And much like the girl's voice, these distorted voices were unique, different in every broadcast. However, Shulkill and Emerson were unable to accurately determine what these voices were saying. Given that the girls' countdowns were always cut short by the use of the phrase, all is well, the doctors did not have long enough samples of the audio to analyze the other distorted voices. With permission from the Foundation, the next five occurrences of the SCP-3034 broadcast were allowed to carry on for longer, giving the two doctors enough audio to determine exactly what the distorted voices were. And the results were extremely troubling. They were screams. 
thousands upon thousands of children's voices endlessly screaming. Both Dr. Emerson and Dr. Shulkill agreed that it would be best to continue responding to SCP-3034 with the correct phrase, and refuse to analyze the distorted screaming audio any further. Mm -hmm. Three years later, while stationed at Provisional Site 3034, a Foundation researcher named Dr. Uriel Willis decided to take matters into her own hands. She conducted an experiment that had not been sanctioned by the Foundation and attempted to make contact with a Russian girl giving the countdowns. Hearing Dr. Willis's voice, the girl stopped her countdown. After five long, painfully silent seconds, a new broadcast was heard. A piercing, high-pitched screech that caused extreme pain and dizziness to all the staff working on site. Unable to bear the disorienting sound, Dr. Willis told the girl all is well and caused the noise to stop. The following day, SCP researchers noted that there had been a significant increase in cases of missing children all around the world. A majority of these disappearances happened at the same time the screech had been broadcast, and remain unsolved to this day. Dr. Willis faced disciplinary action from the SCP Foundation, and any further testing of SCP-3034 and attempts to communicate with the Russian girl were prohibited. Only one distinct change has been noted in the SCP-3034 broadcast since this incident. Almost a month later, the countdown was detected and the correct phrase given. But researchers noted that, instead of starting her countdown from 200, this time the Russian girl began counting down from 199. Nobody knows what will happen if the Russian girl's countdown is allowed to reach zero. Personnel working at Provisional Site 3034 are told to always offer her the necessary phrase before this point in the countdown. Attempting to interfere with the broadcast by contacting this girl directly not only resulted in intense pain for SCP staff, but also seems to have caused an unconfirmed number of child disappearances around the globe, as well as reducing the countdown starting number from 200 to 199. After a long night on the road, you finally find the right turn, sending you in the right direction. As you drive through the night, you keep telling yourself one thing, one small phrase over and over again. You hope the words will eventually give you comfort, but deep down you start to realize just how hollow they are. That it's just a lie we tell ourselves so we don't have to face the inevitable. But still, what choice do you have but to keep telling yourself that all is well? As we all know, the SCP Foundation secures, contains, and protects the various anomalies under its custody. But their mission isn't limited to just grabbing the object and chucking it into a containment locker at the bottom of a classified site deep below the surface of the Earth. The Foundation wants to get a comprehensive, full understanding of all the strange items, creatures, and humanoids in its custody, because that's the only way to understand what they're capable of, what danger they pose, and how to effectively contain them. That much is logical, but the problem is that there's no global scientific community surrounding anomalies, at least not ones willing to cooperate with the Foundation. Perhaps the Chaos Insurgency or Global Occult Coalition have some scientists who have studied anomalies, or the various government agencies that know about the anomalous world like the Unusual Incidents Unit, or Soviet GRUP. But for the most part, the Foundation is utterly alone when it comes to figuring out how these anomalies work, what they are, and how to combat them. So the Foundation does what any institution would do, experiments. Many of the Foundation's most important and iconic anomalies are defined by the experiments the white-coated scientists have performed on them sometimes even using human subjects through the notorious and infamous D-Class program. Everyone knows about how SCP-682, the hard-to-destroy lizard, has been subjected to practically every known weapon and attack under the sun in an attempt to kill the highly dangerous, hateful predator. And who can forget SCP-914, the clockworks, and the countless objects the Foundation has put through it on its five settings to see what it spits out. Needless to say, the Foundation's experiments are incredibly important to how the organization functions, so those SCPs that can offer lots of testing options are very treasured and prized, along with being iconic and legendary throughout the Foundation. Today we're going to be looking at one such anomaly, but not a dangerous, hostile, man-eating predator like SCP-682, or a mysterious eldritch machine like SCP-914. 
No, today we're going to be looking at something much more simpler than that. A coffee machine. Yes, today we're going to be inspecting SCP-294, affectionately referred to by guards and personnel as the coffee machine. Though you probably don't want to order a hot cup of joe in this coffee machine lest you, well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. The first thing you see when you open the SCP-294 file is its number, of course. Item 294, object class Euclid. The next thing you see is the image. If you were imagining a tiny little coffee maker before, this should get rid of that. SCP-294 is big, the kind of coffee machine you'd see in a factory break room. It's almost the size of a vending machine and has a big colored window showing a few cups of coffee along with the slots for cash and coins so drinkers can pay for their espressos. But the most notable feature on SCP-294 is the full keyboard on the front panel. It's a typical QWERTY keyboard, just like yours with a spacebar and everything. Why on earth would a coffee machine need a keyboard? The special containment procedures paint an interesting picture, by which we mean there aren't any. SCP-294 doesn't need any special procedures, secret rituals, or complex machines to keep it contained, but it's still Euclid. So only personnel who have security clearance of level 2 or higher are allowed to interact with it at the moment. This is surprising when you realize that SCP-294 is currently being held not in anomalous item locker or containment cell, but exactly where you'd expect to find a big coffee machine, a break room specifically the Site-19 second floor personnel break room. But it's not alone. It's monitored by two guards with level 3 clearance around the clock. For them sitting in the break room all day guarding a coffee machine that can't move and is too heavy to lift has to be a pretty sweet gig, considering what other kinds of jobs are available at the Foundation. But all that raises even more mysteries. What the heck is up with this coffee machine? The description starts off obvious enough, affirmed that yes, SCP-294 is indeed a standard coffee vending machine, but with the difference we all noticed earlier. Instead of a simple button list of options, it has a full keyboard on it, each button aligning with the letter on a real keyboard. And when someone slips 50 cents into the coin slot, quite a bargain for coffee if you ask me, the user gets a message on screen prompting them to enter the name of what liquid they'd like. You type it in on the keyboard, and that's that. The machine drops a little paper cup, and a nozzle shoots out 12 fluid ounces of whatever you requested. Pretty nifty, isn't it? But it gets niftier. Most people would only think to ask a coffee machine for, well, coffee. But SCP-294 accepts any liquid, and some things that aren't liquids. When the Foundation initially got their hands on it, they ran no less than 97 tests on it, after they realized they weren't just limited to espressos and cappuccinos. At first, any kind of liquid you could drink was requested. The researchers popped in requests for water, coffee, beer, soda, milkshakes, and out they came. Then they decided to get a little more creative. They started to request things you couldn't possibly drink, not if you wanted to stay alive. Sulfuric and hydrochloric acid, like the kind SCP-682 is suspended in, wiper fluid, motor oil. But SCP-294 stubbornly provided, even if the liquids would melt through the researchers' throats like a knife through butter. Then the researchers decided to apply some of their scientific knowledge. There are a lot of chemical compounds that don't usually exist in a liquid state on planet Earth's surface. They typed in nitrogen, iron, and glass, among others, and received shimmering liquids in paper cups. They sent them off to a lab for analysis and, wouldn't you know it, chemically identical to nitrogen, iron, and glass. But when they typed in diamond, no doubt wondering whether they'd found an infinite cash cow, they received an error message on the screen. It seemed that while SCP-294 could deliver substances that aren't usually in a liquid state on Earth's surface, it needed to be at least possible for the substance to be in a pure liquid form for SCP-294 to dispense it. Since diamond is only a mineral, it couldn't be dispensed. Then they tried to test something else, and got a slightly disturbing response on the small LCD display. Out of stock. It stopped responding to requests for over an hour, then made a small noise and began to accept requests again. It appears that the machine can take about 50 requests before needing to take an hour and a half to restock itself. And while only the machine is anomalous, 
The small 12-ounce paper cups it dispenses its liquids in seems remarkably hardy. Substances that would have eaten through paper instantly, like the sulfuric acid and hydrochloric acid, had no effect on these little cups, though the same can be said for those that drank from them. One of the researchers had a great idea. Here was an anomaly that was practically harmless, and could be a great little way for the foundation to scale back its budget a little bit. They proposed putting SCP-294 into the break room it currently resides in, both to more easily conduct experiments and to save money when agents and doctors came in for lunch and needed a quick drink, or in the mornings where everyone was looking for coffee to wake them up. With no good reason not to, the machine was put in the break room, but not long after, an unfortunate incident occurred. One with enough harm that it was deemed necessary that only personnel with security clearance interact with SCP-294. What could have happened to cause this? Did someone burn themselves on hot coffee? Did the vending machine accidentally crush someone? No. The reality is much darker. One morning in August of 2005, Agent Joseph, whose full name has been redacted to preserve their identity, went up to the vending machine in the break room looking to get a hot cup of coffee to wake himself up between shifts. Another agent in the room who was on break at the time saw him and made a suggestion to find out what SCP-294 would do when given the colloquial name rather than the exact real name of a drink. They just wanted to see what would happen. So Agent Joseph slipped in two quarters and typed in a hot cup of Joe. Seconds after, he began sweating like a pig. He was feeling very hot, even though the break room was fully air-conditioned, and his skin began to flush. He then clutched his head, complaining that he was dizzy, and the whole room was spinning around before collapsing to the floor. The other agent immediately called the medical staff, who moved Agent Joseph to the infirmary and stabilized him. Once they made sure he wasn't in any real trouble, they also grabbed whatever SCP-294 had spit out. It was a disgusting, thick, reddish-brown liquid with a strong stench. And when they ran the labs on it, they confirmed it was exactly what they thought it was. A mixture of blood, tissue, bone marrow, cerebrospinal fluid, and other bodily fluids that was an exact DNA match for Agent Joseph. SCP-294 somehow managed to literally liquefy 12 ounces from the agent's body before producing them into a cup. This offered a clue. Maybe it stole the liquids it was asked for from the nearest source. In any case, the agent was released after a few weeks of bed rest and care to make sure he wasn't further injured, and both involved agents were reprimanded. With the knowledge of how accidentally dangerous SCP-294 can be, who can blame the Foundation for wanting to keep a careful lid on it? Researchers were curious, though and received clearance to test the SCP's abilities to retrieve specific liquids from long distances. With an O5's approval and oversight, they input a cup of SCP-075's secretion. SCP-075, the corrosive snail, is exactly what it sounds like. A gross little creature that secretes a highly caustic acid, capable of melting almost anything. Without fail, the coffee machine dispensed the secretion into the cup, and the cup stayed perfectly intact. But at the very same time, in SCP-075's cell, the creature woke up and began secreting acid that immediately disappeared. All in all, about 12 ounces, the same amount in the cup. Based off of these results, further testing with SCP-294 was approved. One researcher tried punching in a request for a cup of gold. What came out was a small paper cup of molten gold that quickly cooled to room temperature. Asking for cups of silver and platinum produced similar results, but based off of previous tests, it seemed clear that the machine wasn't creating precious metals, so much as siphoning them off from somewhere else. The next request was a strange one, a cup of anti-water. The machine took a moment, then printed a small message on its LCD display, out of range. This confirmed that the machine couldn't produce substances that didn't actually exist, and couldn't break physics to get its materials by peering into alternate universes, dimensions, or realities. After that, the researchers tested for diamond and got the result that you already know of, an out-of-range error. Some more investigations show that all solid substances that don't have a liquid form get this error, but asking for a cup of liquid carbon produced exactly that because liquid carbon isn't the same thing as a diamond, 
though both are made of carbon. SCP-294 clearly has more knowledge of chemistry than some of us. Then the researchers created an entirely new drink, made of bleach, various sodas, protein powders, and spices. They blended it together and put it in a jar across the room from SCP-294. When requested, the amount of the liquid in the cup was missing from the jar, proving that SCP-294 doesn't actually create its own liquids. But how does SCP-294 react when presented with a more subjective request? One researcher asked for the best drink I've ever had. After a moment, the paper cup filled with something that looked like cola, but the researcher said it tasted like a drink he had years ago at a party and that he'd always remembered as his favorite drink, though he couldn't say what was in it. But that was a subjective test, and the researchers repeated it with a different subject. When an agent also requested the best drink I've ever had, the machine produced a simple Vienna lager with a label showing a group of people drinking it at the beach and no brand name. The agent confirmed that the best drink he ever had was a Vienna lager at the beach with his friends. So SCP-294 could not only read people's minds, it can read memories they don't even know they still have. Another one they tried was something Cassie will like, referencing SCP-085, the young girl who lived in a drawn-on world. The cup dispensed was completely empty, but it had a small drawing printed on the side of a soda glass with brown and white things floating on top of each other. The researchers presented the cup to Cassie and were told by her it was a chocolate banana milkshake and a delicious one at that. A cup of music was a strange request and produced an even stranger result. A clear, odorless carbonated drink that tasted vaguely alcoholic. When drunk, subjects said they could feel it and started showing an affinity to music, being able to sing and dance to a rhythm when they had no sense of rhythm or were tone deaf before. Whether SCP-294 can produce even more abstract concepts is still under study, but was interrupted by the next test. An unfortunate containment breach incident at Site-19 left several personnel trapped in the break room, heavily injured while MTFs fought to re-establish control over the site. An agent typed in a cup of medical knowledge, and the machine quickly produced a green liquid. After drinking it, the agent was able to treat the injuries of their fellow personnel consistent with standard first responder practices and was commended for their bravery, but their knowledge didn't stick around after the breach, and attempts to recreate the liquid failed. They decided that SCP-294 broke its own rules for self-preservation in the emergency, implying that it's not only sentient, it is intelligent. A doctor using SCP-294 made a request close to him, My Life Story. While nowhere close to a drink, SCP-294 seemed to accept the input until it started shaking violently and making odd noises. It remained in this new state for about three minutes, then returned to normal, spitting out a completely opaque black fluid, like tar, in a cup. Despite the strange reaction, the doctor drank the fluid and immediately informed the others he was now able to remember everything that had ever happened to him, from the smallest childhood event to the most important events in his adult life. He excused himself and disappeared into his office. The next time the staff saw him two days later, he was carrying an autobiography 600 pages long. Then the researchers decided to try their luck and input, surprise me. The resulting solution was a cup containing what seemed to be regular water, right until a researcher touched it. It was just water all right, but it had been superheated to 200 degrees Celsius while remaining in liquid form. The moment someone touched it, bang, it violently evaporated into steam, spraying boiling water everywhere. Not only does SCP-294 have intelligence, it has a sense of humor, albeit a quite rude one. The next three requests were for blood, namely blood of the Smilodon, or saber-tooth tiger, of the passenger pigeon, and of founding father Thomas Jefferson. But the only thing SCP-294 produced were out-of-range errors, confirming it can't take liquids that don't exist anymore. But in the next test, blood was received from wolves, saliva was received from horses, urine was received from koalas, and cerebral spinal fluid was received from Phoebromus patersoni, a rodent that went extinct some 8 million years ago. Though if SCP-294 is working according to its own rules, it means that there may be still one in the wild somehow. 
For the next test, the researchers decided to get back to the scientific roots of it all. They made a request for a cup of D151839's leukemia, knowing that the D-class in question had a very advanced case of cancer. The machine outputted it without any trouble, and analysis of the liquid showed it contained cancer cells that matched the D-class's DNA. But another request for the same spat out an out-of-range error. What's more, a medical checkup on the D-Class revealed that their tumor was completely gone. But unfortunately, it was only a short-term fix. The cancer cells recurred within two weeks of the test. SCP-294 initially just seemed like a boring magic vending machine. But it was only after the extensive experimentation that you just saw a shortened log of that the SCP Foundation was able to discern its true nature. It wasn't an unthinking object. It was sentient, intelligent, and even a little sarcastic, though none of that stopped it from doing its job, providing people with a hot cup of whatever they needed to drink. Just make sure you type in your request very carefully. What's the largest animal you can think of? Okay, that's probably too vague of a question. Your mind probably went straight to the oceans, picturing deep-sea leviathans like the mighty blue whale. Let's go a little bit closer, shall we? What about on land? What are the biggest animals that live up here with us above the water? Elephants, maybe? What about rhinos? Then again, hippos are up there too in the same kind of ballpark, all pretty huge. What about cows? They can grow pretty big, right? Especially with all the crazy growth hormones that meat manufacturers pump into them these days. Well, what if there was something out there bigger than all of those? Imagine it, some huge beast roaming the wilderness that easily towered above any creature you've ever seen in your life. This thing would be massive, striding across the world towering above the meager height of a human being. Now, imagine that this thing, whatever it was, wasn't just big, but kept getting bigger. Sure, all of this might sound like the premise for the next Godzilla or Cloverfield movie, but while Big Charlie might not be the king of the monsters, it certainly lives up to that first part of its nickname. Of course, the SCP Foundation calls it SCP-4158. Big Charlie is just the playful nickname that the owners gave it, although none of them are sure who was the first to call the creature by that name. Standing on four long legs at 3.4 meters tall when the Foundation first discovered it, SCP-4158 was about one and three-fifths times as tall as famous professional basketball player Shaquille O'Neal. But since then, well, like we said, Big Charlie is getting bigger day by day. The creature appears to be tangentially related to the bovine family of mammals, essentially making it a ginormous cow. However, SCP-4158 lacks the facial structure and features that you might expect to see on the faces at your local farm. The creature has thin, translucent skin, which is so fragile that it often tears easily, and anyone observing SCP-4158 can often see the bones and internal organs within. Ugh, gross. It possesses a large, bulbous head with a protrusion at the front almost like a beak. As well as that, its huge eyes are foggy, a milky white color which seems to suggest that SCP-4158 is, at least, partially blind. The large cattle-like mammal is incredibly skinny, almost to the point where its bones stick out from underneath its skin. Its legs are longer than the rest of its colossal body and seem barely able to support the animal's weight. On description alone, you can't help but feel sorry for the poor creature and its sorry state of living. Normally, Big Charlie is mostly calm and docile, barely acknowledging the Foundation personnel that come to examine it, feed it, or clean its containment cell. Held in a heavy containment zone, SCP-4158 is fed through a 5-meter trough on the far east wall of its cell, surviving on a diet of raw beef, hay, wood, and bricks. Not the typical grass-only eating habits you'd expect from normal cows. But according to the Foundation's extensive testing on the creature, its diet doesn't seem to be what is causing SCP-4158 to keep growing at the rate it has been. The mass of Big Charlie is in some sort of state of perpetual increase, meaning its size and weight are always growing. And it is because of this continuous growth that every week the Foundation is forced to shear off great swaths of excess meat from the creature, cleaving off its flesh and incinerating the mass, all while Big Charlie is still alive. Now, before you start dialing PETA's hotline, it's also worth mentioning Big Charlie can't feel pain, 
What's more, testing has revealed that the meat taken from SCP-4158 is USDA utility-grade beef, the kind that would normally come from older cattle. Utility-grade meat has no fat marbling, so it isn't as tender or as flavorsome as other more premium grades, but would normally be used in canned and processed food products. And despite the Foundation destroying the excess that they cut off of Big Charlie as a precaution, in theory the meat is still good to eat and possesses no anomalous properties. Then again, would you really want to eat a burger made from SCP-4158? I didn't think so. If left unchecked and allowed to grow for longer than a week, SCP-4158 will begin to form new features. Limbs, organs, and sometimes even genitals will sprout from random places all over its body. The previous record for Big Charlie's most substantial growth was when he increased to 8.5 meters tall. That's over three-fifths the height of the Hollywood sign, and over one and a half times the average height of a giraffe. At this immense size, Charlie has developed seven legs, four stomachs, three tongues, and numerous other extremities before the SCP Foundation cut him back down to size. And we mean they literally cut him back down. So what exactly is this thing? It's like a giant cow, but not actually a cow, even though its flesh is identical to beef. And it's not a destructive, rampaging monster either, showing no hostility towards humans, even when they are shearing its excessive body mass away. Could it be some kind of failed genetic experiment? An attempt to solve hunger by engineering a creature that could not only stay alive, but keep growing after having its meat cut away? If that were true, it would make SCP-4158 a literal cash cow for the meat industry. Well, we've got kind of a funny story about that, actually. Big Charlie was first encountered by the Foundation back in December 2004, in Crudson, Indiana. A number of calls had been made to the area's local animal control services, with reports of a large cow with mange roaming the nearby Highway 17. Two officers belonging to the Animal Control Department were sent out to investigate these reports, and what they found was SCP-4158, wandering aimlessly, but unlike any cow they had ever seen. The officers called local police, where a foundation plant caught wind of what they had found and called in containment specialists. The case was closed after the animal control officers were given amnestics, and a cover story was put in place about a cow with mange that was put down where it had been found. In reality, the SCP Foundation rounded up old Big Charlie and transported it to safety with little resistance from the animal. They were able to trace the creature's origin back to somewhere called Butcher's Block, a nearby slaughterhouse. The manager of the establishment, one Jeff Fine, and a single employee named Barney Mossman were brought in by the Foundation for questioning. Another employee, Rory Gildson, was also retrieved from his home after having called in sick to work that day. Barney Mossman, the first of the Butcher's Block employees to be interviewed, stated that SCP-4158 had been called Big Charlie since long before he had started his job at the slaughterhouse. According to his testimony, he knew nothing about where the creature had actually come from, only that it was fed hay, but would also occasionally eat anything else it could, including other cows. Since joining Butcher's Block four years earlier, Mossman had been told not to ask questions or to tell anyone else about SCP-4158. The morning after the huge creature had seemingly escaped, Mr. Fine had apparently angrily accused both Barney and Rory of selling him out and giving Big Charlie away to the competitors of Butcher's Block, even though they were the only slaughterhouse in the area. But Mossman was convinced that neither of them were capable of doing something like that. Rory apparently treated Big Charlie like his own child, and Fine had an even stranger relationship with the creature. Rory Gildson, the other of Fine's employees, was more helpful in shedding light on SCP-4158's origin than Barney had been. Rory explained that he and Jeff Fine had bought a pregnant cow from an unknown person nine years earlier, considering it to be a steal, a two for the price of one bargain. However, one day without warning, the calf fell out of its mother. It wasn't born like any ordinary cow, however. According to Gildson, it had ripped through the mother cow's chest and looked disgusting. While Rory and Jeff had initially thought the calf to be dead, they discovered it had tried to get back into the barn after they hauled it outside. Their original intention had been to sell the creature off for scientific study, or failing that, to a freak show. However, after their attempts to sell the calf failed, Jeff and Rory had decided the best course of action would be to put the animal down. 
They had reasoned that releasing it into the wild could have negatively affected the ecosystem. So instead, they took a bolt pistol and pushed it between the creature's eyes, then fired. But nothing happened. Rory tried again, but ended up breaking the gun instead. They slit the animal's throat, but it barely bled. Even butchering it on the spot while it was still alive did nothing. Finding Gildson reduced the calf to little more than a skeleton, but it simply refused to die. The pair of them packaged the meat they had removed with the rest, hoping no one would notice or ask where it had come from. It was a few days later that Rory realized SCP-4158 was capable of regrowing whatever was cut off of it. He and his boss even tried some, and couldn't tell the difference. They had their hands on a cow that would eat anything put in front of it, and that could produce infinite meat. The Foundation probed Rory Gildson further for more information on the creature, learning that SCP-4158 was sterile and incapable of reproducing, the only one of its kind. Rory argued that the Foundation legally couldn't take Big Charlie away, that the creature was still private property. Little did he realize he was wrong. But he, just like Barney Mossman, also knew nothing about how the animal had escaped in the first place. Finally, Jeff Fine, the owner of the Butcher's Block Slaughterhouse, was questioned by the Foundation. He repeated Rory's earlier story about the strange calf that had been born, and how it could regenerate the flesh that was sheared off of it. Fine remarked that he considered it to be a blessing. When asked about his whereabouts on the night SCP-4158 had escaped from Butcher's Block, Jeff admitted that he had been praying, but not to God, to Big Charlie. He had apparently been doing this every night since realizing what the creature could do, viewing the animal as a provider and a savior. I just felt something when I was around him. I could tell that he wanted to make this sacrifice for us. Ever since he tried to get into the barn after we threw him out, I knew he cared for us, Fine told the Foundation. I would open his pen, take off my clothes so that I was pure before him, lay down and receive his blessings. And how would he receive those blessings? By drinking the animal's blood. Yeah, Jeff Fine was a real eccentric like that. One night, when Fine had entered the pen to perform this weird ritual, Big Charlie had escaped. But his owner was convinced that there must have been a reason for this, that the animal had some sort of goal. When the Foundation staff conducting Fine's interview dismissed this idea, the slaughterhouse owner became enraged. How dare you question Big Charlie? He knows what's best for all of us. I'm done here. I don't need to keep answering questions like this. Let me out. I need to see Big Charlie. I need to see if he's safe. The Foundation believes that Jeff Fine's practice of worshipping SCP-4158 was not due to any anomalous effect caused by the creature itself. None of the Foundation personnel tasked with feeding, studying, and shearing meat off of Big Charlie have displayed any similar behavior of performing abnormal religious rituals. He really was just a huge weirdo. As for the Butcher's Block Slaughterhouse, Fine and the rest of his employees were given amnestics to forget Big Charlie had ever even existed. And the slaughterhouse was closed under the false pretense of a health code violation and its staff being arrested for malpractice. The one question that remains unanswered, however, is the identity of the individual that first sold Jeff Fine the cow that gave birth to SCP-4158. It just goes to show you, though, Sometimes you don't know where your food is coming from. If you lived in Indiana in late 2004, who knows? You might have eaten some of Big Charlie and not even realized it. Did you ever have to perform a dissection in school? Maybe you had to carve up a fetal pig or slice into a frog while nightmarish visions of Kermit and a widowed Miss Piggy danced in your head. Though it's rarely a pleasant experience, unless your tastes are on the morbid side, most biology teachers would agree that the best way to learn how something works is to take it apart. As distasteful as it can be to hold a frog's tiny liver in your hands, it definitely does give you a better sense of the pieces that make up the complete creature. But what if there was an easier way to look at the individual parts of a living being? What if you could take it apart without ever having to prep a scalpel or stain your hands with the blood of innocent frogs? Like most of the seemingly impossible things in our world, the SCP Foundation discovered something that allows its users to do just that. In fact, it can handle a lot more than just a frog, and its applications go far beyond the confines of a high school science lab. SCP-291 is a small, plain steel building with a large door on one side. The door has no handle or knob and functions similarly to a garage door. The door cannot be pried open by any ordinary means, 
and the inside of SCP-291 can only be accessed if the structure is connected to a suitable power source. Once a power source has been connected, the door races and exposes a room inside. It is small, about 4 by 2 meters. It contains a console board, a large screen, and a plexiglass container resembling a coffin. How very sinister. The coffin is large enough to contain a human under 7 feet tall. So sorry, Ferdinand the Cannibal, you're going to need to sit this one out. The coffin sits on a conveyor belt, with several tubes connected to the wall above it. On the opposite side of the room, there are holes of varying sizes, each containing a small door that can be opened or closed. Because initial observation indicated that SCP-291 was intended for some kind of human testing, a D-class test subject was selected for experimentation. The subject was instructed to lie down in the coffin and wait to see what would happen next. The display screen lit up, depicting a grid-lined image of the test subject. Buttons along the console board adjusted the image, showing the skin, muscles, and organ systems of the person in the coffin. There were no words or numbers on the screen, and all of the buttons appeared to have only two settings, on and off. When one of the researchers pressed the first button on the console, the tubes above the coffin began pouring a blue liquid into it. The test subject reacted with confusion, but did not experience any adverse effects. They quickly lost consciousness, indicating that the liquid was some sort of sedative. The liquid continued to pour into the coffin until the vessel was completely filled, at which point it congealed into a thick gel. The test subject's breathing and heartbeat slowed to a stop, and the conveyor belt suddenly creaked to life. The coffin was carried, test subject inside, through a small door that immediately locked behind it. The small room was filled with the sounds of gears turning, machinery clinking, and motors whirring. The display screen was taken over by a large rectangle, resembling a traditional loading screen. After 30 minutes, the process was complete, and the back door of the room unlocked itself. When the researcher walked through the back door, they found another room with a conveyor belt and a row of two dozen lockers. Each locker was opened, one at a time, and its contents removed for examination. Inside each, the research team found a different portion of the test subject's body, in a block of some unidentified clear substance. The body was divided in the lockers into these separate parts. Brain, lungs, and diaphragm, heart, digestive system, reproductive organs, left eye, right eye, upper left torso and arm, upper right torso and arm, lower left torso and upper leg, lower right torso and upper leg, lower left leg and foot, lower right leg and foot, lower left arm and hand, lower right arm and hand, neck and head, upper skeletal system, lower skeletal system, lymphatic and circulatory system, and skin. Phew, a miracle of the human body, right? boundless in its fascinating complexities. Each block of body parts was placed back in its designated locker, and the second button on the console was pressed. At this point, the doors to the organ locker sealed themselves shut, and the sound of the machinery working filled the small space once again. This continued for a duration of approximately 45 minutes. When the machinery went silent, a new plexiglass coffin emerged into the main room, with the test subject inside. He looked identical to how he had looked at the start of the experiment, with no evidence that he had previously been disassembled. The blue liquid slowly evaporated from the container, and the test subject opened his eyes. The lead researcher conducted an immediate interview with the reassembled subject, who reported no memory of the process after initial exposure to the blue liquid. They insisted that the process had been like a good night's sleep, which honestly makes us pretty eager to take it for a spin. A medical examination determined that there were only a few changes to the test subject during the disassembly and reassembly. When they returned to consciousness, the test subject's stomach was empty, they were naked, and all of their hair was gone. With this new understanding of SCP-291's anomalous properties, the Foundation decided to continue their experimentation. With each new test, the experiments became more creative and, unsurprisingly, more depraved. First, a D-class subject was placed in the coffin and disassembled. Then, instead of placing the various body parts in their designated lockers, the vital organs were removed from their storage before reassembly was attempted. This resulted in the equipment shutting down completely. A researcher pressed the third button, which forced a hard reset of the entire process, causing all of the blocks of body parts to eject via an exit hatch. During the next experiment, non-vital organs were removed before the subject's body was reassembled. The appendix and gallbladder were left out, and when the subject regained consciousness, these organs were still gone. 
However, there was no visible damage or scar tissue in their place. They were simply gone, as if they have never been there in the first place. So, if body parts could be removed from a test subject, could new body parts be added? Could existing body parts be replaced with different ones? A D-class subject in need of a skin graft following a flamethrower-based accident was placed in SCP-291. Once taken apart, a portion of healthy skin donated by another, somewhat unwilling D-class subject was placed in the locker, along with the skin already present there. Once the subject was put back together, the healthy skin had replaced the damaged skin with no adverse effects. Repeat attempts at this test showed that it was effective for limb transplants, heart transplants, and kidney transplants with a 0% failure rate across all tests. After determining that SCP-291 could be used for an untold amount of good, making organ donations easier and safer than ever, the Foundation naturally had to pivot to something more useless but interesting and likely horrifying. After all, it's not like they could ever just make anomalous technology available to the public, right? Two D-class subjects, one man and one woman, were disassembled by SCP-291. The brains of the test subjects were swapped, and then they were reassembled. When they awoke, the subjects had the personalities and memories of the brain placed in their body. In a turn of events previously only seen in blockbuster comedies like Freaky Friday and the live-action Scooby-Doo movie, seminal piece of cinema, the subjects had swapped bodies. They were subsequently disassembled. Their request to look at their new bodies naked having been swiftly denied, and the brains were returned to their rightful bodies. After the experiment was finished, the subjects appeared mostly normal. However, they did complain of disorientation as well as mental and physical discomfort over the next several days. After going through two brain transplants in one day, though, that's really the least you can expect. After perfecting the practice of swapping body parts between different human subjects, the ghoulishly curious research team decided to take things in an interspecies direction. A variety of test subjects, including cats, dogs, lizards, fish, mice, and, of course, humans, were selected for this next round of experiments. Twenty tests were performed using these new subjects, and only three of the experiments were successful in transferring body parts from an animal of one species to another animal of a different one. Attempts to swap body parts between mammals and reptiles or fish proved disastrous. When a fish and a human were both disassembled and the fish's gills were placed with the human's body parts, neither creature survived the reassembly process. The human awoke with a new set of gills embedded in their neck and immediately began gasping for the oxygen they could not take in. Within minutes, they had suffocated. The fish's fate was even worse. It did not reassemble so much as it became a pile of goo, scales, and two floating eyeballs. Experimentation with a human and a lizard yielded similar results, turning the lizard into a puddle of organic matter and killing the human test subject after only a few minutes. As disastrous as the failed cross-species tests were, the successful ones were almost as bad. Trial 001 involved a cat and a human. Not wanting to attempt too much at once, the research team opted to just swap out one organ, the left eye. Both subjects survived the transfer and were able to use their new eye. The human subject reported full use of the cat's eye, with improved night vision in addition to trouble seeing color. The cat did not enjoy its new eye nearly as much as the human subject, and had clawed its human eye out of its head by the end of the following week. In Trial 007, a successful brain transfer was performed between an adult human man and an English Mastiff. The man in the Mastiff's body expressed discomfort with walking on all fours and asked to be returned to his body as soon as possible. The Mastiff in the man's body adjusted to bipedal locomotion in a few hours, but was disassembled after urinating on a researcher's shoes. The final successful trial, and the most unnerving, was Trial 016. A female D-class test subject's reproductive organs were swapped with those of a pregnant Labrador retriever. An ultrasound conducted after the transfer indicated that the Labrador fetuses survived the procedure and could conceivably be carried to term by the human subject. Several members of the research team began to take bets on whether or not she would end up giving birth to puppies, but the transfer was reversed within the day. So we'll never know what exactly would have happened. Perhaps that's for the best. Personally, we hope the Foundation's Ethics Committee gives some of these scientists a very stern talking to about their behavior on this one. When not in use for testing, SCP-291 is to be disconnected from any power sources. At least two personnel are positioned outside of its containment at all times, standing guard, and these personnel must be swapped out every week. 
When it is not connected to any power sources, SCP-291 is considered harmless, though it should still be treated with caution. The main entryway remains closed and locked when there is no available power source, but the door can be opened manually from the inside in the event of an emergency. Any disassembled organisms are stored in a locker in the containment facility, labeled with a sharpie marker in order to keep track of what specimens are stored there. Whether this is the same sharpie used to label food in the break room fridge is unknown, but just like Dr. Di Ramiro's ham sandwich, it's best to leave these items untouched. Any personnel found to be responsible for missing specimens will be transferred to another project and receive a strongly worded email. Do you like scary movies? If you're a fan of horror, there have probably been quite a few times where you found yourself yelling at the movie screen, don't go up to the attic, don't split up, don't check out the noise in the basement, run out the front door. You know the characters can't hear you, but when the story is engaging enough to make you care about their well-being, you can't help but try and give them a hand. After all, you'd want someone to save you from a machete-wielding maniac stalking through a summer camp you took up your new counselor job at. If someone was watching you hide in the closet, listening for a masked killer's footsteps with a kitchen knife in your hand, you'd want them to give you a heads up when the killer was getting ready to chop through the door with an axe. Of course, the characters in your favorite movies never listen, because, you know, that's how movies work. But in 1985, a young man returned a VHS tape entitled Return of the Suburb Slasher to his local video store with a peculiar complaint. The main character of the movie stopped mid-action to look at the camera and beg for his help. The video store clerk laughed him off and refused to give him a refund, though he did eventually give in and offer store credit after the man began to cry. He decided to take the tape home and watch it, just to see what all the fuss was about. After all, he'd never seen someone cry at a horror movie like that. So he sat down on his favorite beanbag chair, pushed the tape into the VCR, and pressed play. Apparently, his shell-shocked customer had at least remembered to be kind and rewind. The movie told the story of Heather Campbell, a young woman planning to host a party at her family's home in a classic suburban cul-de-sac while her parents were out of town. In equally classic slasher fashion, this party would take place on the 10th anniversary of a series of grisly murders in the same neighborhood, committed by the mysterious suburb slasher. As the party kicks off with loud music, teenage debauchery, and lots of drinking out of red plastic cups, the killer appears to pick off the group of friends one by one. Like other classic slasher victims, your Michaels and your Jasons, the suburb slasher also covers their face, wearing a black burlap sack over their head that masks all identifiable features. The first 90 minutes of the movie were fun but basic. A canoodling couple gets decapitated here, an unnecessary shower scene is cut short by a stabbing there, the sort of thing you'd expect. But at about 97 minutes in, something impossible happened. Heather walked into the living room, finding her friend's dead body strewn across it, and let out a scream that measured up to the bests in the genre. The teen scream queen then began to run as the killer appeared to chase her. She made her way into the basement of the house, locked the door behind her, then she turned to the camera, tears in her eyes, shirt spattered with blood and said, Hey mister, I don't know you, and I don't know why you've just sat there watching this without doing nothing, but please, I'm begging you, help me out here, what can I do to survive this? At first the clerk thought he was under the influence of some mind-altering substance, but the only things in his system were popcorn and store brand soda. Now this was really happening. He stared open mouthed at the screen, where Heather watched him expectantly. He was too stunned to speak. After a moment of silence, Heather sighed dejectedly, shaking her head, and turned back toward the stairs. She slowly walked back to the basement door, unlocked it, and pulled it open. There the killer was waiting with his expressionless burlap mask. The clerk's eyes widened and he cried out, NO! But it was too late. The film suddenly cut to black, and with a whirring sound, the VCR spat the tape back out. The clerk sat there, staring at the tape. What could he do with it? Should he make a copy, send it to someone else and pass the curse along? Should he try to watch it again? He wasn't sure he could bear to see Heather looking at him with those same pleading eyes. Then he remembered an ad he had seen in the back of his favorite comic book. Seen something you can't explain? A brush with the unknown keeping you up at night. We're looking for stories of the strange and unusual. Write to us now. Maybe they could do something he couldn't. He put the tape back into its cover, placed it in an envelope, and mailed it off the next day. 
A few days later, the package reached its intended recipient, an undercover branch of the SCP Foundation tracking anomalous activity via a series of ads in comic books and video stores to tap into one of the most underutilized resources in the world, nerds. The tape was designated SCP-5733, and Heather and the Mass Killer were designated SCP-5733-2 and SCP-5733-1, respectively. After an initial viewing confirmed its anomalous properties, a research team headed by Dr. Carpenter began to perform a series of tests. Testing was open to all Foundation employees, subject to approval by Dr. Carpenter. Approved personnel would be placed in a Site-73 multi-purpose room with a VHS player and a television. The staff member would then watch the movie and attempt to engage with Heather and help her escape. For the first test, D-Class 1973 was selected. When Heather turned to the camera and asked for help, he asked if she had a car. When she confirmed that yes, she did, he instructed her to sneak back upstairs find her car keys, leave through the back door, and drive as fast and as far away as possible. She successfully retrieved the car keys, but when she reached the car, she saw that the tires had been slashed. Heather began to panic, but 1973 talked her through it, telling her to smash the window of a neighbor's car and unlock the door. She complied, and 1973 instructed her on how to hotwire the vehicle. The car started, and with a triumphant laugh, she sped out of the cul-de-sac. Just as her car began to pull away, the killer emerged from the back seat, wielding a kitchen knife. Heather screamed, and the tape cut to black. For the next test, D-Class 1944 was selected. He began by telling Heather to find her father's shotgun, seen earlier in the film, and use it to take out the killer before they could get to her. She snuck up to her parents' room and found the gun, only for the killer to appear in the doorway behind her. She aimed the gun and fired, but nothing happened. The killer opened their hand, dropping the shotgun shells on the floor. She was close, but the killer was one step ahead. She screamed as they approached with the knife, and again, the tape cut to black. After several tests were conducted with D-Class subjects and no adverse effects were reported, aside from the obvious trauma of failing to save Heather's life, testing was opened up to all Foundation staff. Assistant researcher Felissa Baker volunteered. She believed her extensive knowledge of the slasher genre would give her the tools to help Heather strategize. After speaking with Heather about her skills, which mainly included party planning and babysitting, Felissa determined that Heather should seek outside help. With Felissa's help, Heather made her way out of the house and over to the home of her next-door neighbor, Mr. Loomis. When she got there, the door was open and the lights were off. It didn't look great, but she didn't really have much of a choice but to go inside. She made her way to the bedroom where Mr. Loomis and his wife were lying in bed. She tried to wake him, but the camera zoomed in to reveal his throat had been slashed. The shape in the bed next to him sat up and was not in fact his wife, but the suburb slasher instead. As the figure raised their signature kitchen knife, the screen went to black. SCP-5733 became a competition of sorts among Foundation staff. Each volunteer proposing their knowledge would help them get Heather to safety. Assistant researcher Nick Younglin-Doskowitz proposed telling Heather to call for help, giving her a secret phone number for the SCP Foundation circa 1983, the time in which the movie was set. However, when Heather reached the phone, it had been destroyed, smashed to pieces. Next to it was a note written in blood that said, The only foundation here is fear. Then the killer appeared behind Heather, and the tape went to black. Somehow, the killer knew about the SCP Foundation. Perhaps in a manner of speaking, the call was coming from inside the house. Next, field agent Malcolm Pleasance and Donald McDowell were selected due to their extensive knowledge of hand-to-hand -hand combat. They attempted to teach Heather various fighting and self-defense techniques, while she survived on the limited supplies available in the basement. She eventually left the basement, and when the killer appeared, began to fight them. After 23 minutes of combat, she knocked the slasher to the floor and grabbed the candlestick to finish them off. As the agents watching began to celebrate, a second version of the suburban slasher appeared behind her, lunging forward. Just before the new killer made contact, the tape cut to black. During this test, the slasher seemed more adept at combat than it had been before, as though it could hear the advice being given to Heather. With other techniques failing, field agent Tilda Joan Bennett was brought in for a test, selected due to her expertise in thaumaturgy. She instructed Heather on basic offensive and defensive thaumaturgy, before guiding her out of the house and into the front yard. When the slasher appeared brandishing their knife, 
Heather was able to sign a protective glyph and defend against the knife's blow. She followed this with a wind spell that pushed the killer further away. Heather began to run down the driveway, making a break for survival, when the slasher suddenly performed a freeze spell that rendered her unable to move. Heather's wide, panicked eyes stared down the barrel of the camera in a silent scream as the killer approached her, recovered the knife in hand before the tape went to black. Eventually, Dr. Carper volunteered to conduct a test. He instructed his research team to prepare a list of options for Heather's survival, divided into four categories. What to take from the basement, where to go once leaving the basement, how to exit the house, and how to escape the cul-de-sac. He was not informed about any of these options, but rather had them printed out and placed into plastic bowls on the day of the test. There were also three cards created and placed face down, reading face, body, and legs. When Heather addressed Dr. Carpenter, he informed her that he would be randomly selecting instructions for her and asked that she follow them exactly. The first slip of paper instructed Heather to grab a pair of garden shears from the basement and climb the stairs back into the main house. Next, she was told to go upstairs to the bedroom, then downstairs into the dining room. She complied and there was no sign of the killer so far. Third, Dr. Carpenter told Heather to run back upstairs, out of the bedroom window, onto the roof, and then jump down into the garden. Then it was time for the next step. He told Heather to jump over the fence into the neighbor's garden and run down the street until she could find help. As Heather made her way down the road, the slasher broke through the front door of her house but did not chase after her. Heather continued running down the road for 20 minutes as the trees and lights began to dwindle. The surroundings began to grow darker and darker until they resembled a void. Dr. Carpenter instructed her to keep walking. She could make out lights and houses in the distance. She ran toward the neighborhood, but stopped suddenly and began to panic. She was back in her own neighborhood, in front of her own house, and the killer was waiting for her. As Heather demanded to know what to do, Carpenter flipped over one of the three cards. It read, Face, and so he told Heather to attack the killer's face with the shears, then the killer's legs, then his body. The killer dodged her attack, grabbed the shears, and pushed her to the ground. As Heather looked up at the killer, his face could be seen through the torn sack. It was Dr. Carpenter. Heather screamed, and the tape cut to black. Talk about a third act twist. The movie itself did not create the killer, but somehow the viewer did, and it also made the killer more creative. After this incident, all testing on SCP-5733 was suspended, and attempts to help turn Heather from victim to survivor were halted. Searching for answers, the Foundation looked into Crystal Elms Productions, the production company listed on the videotape's cover. No record of the production company, the film, or any of its cast could be found. Several months after testing on SCP-5733 was suspended, another tape was found. Because, let's face it baby, these days you've gotta have a sequel. The new tape was titled, The Suburb Slasher Strikes Again, and was purported to be produced by Crystal Elms Productions in 1985. It was designated SCP-6733. Unlike its predecessor, this tape was only tested once. A member of D-Class personnel was first shown SCP-5733 up until the point where it becomes anomalous, and was then shown SCP-6733. He was left completely alone in order to watch the contents of the tape. The following was what was on it. Dr. Malcolm Baines entered the testing chamber to find D-1974, or Jamie, sitting across from the television set. He introduced himself and ran a series of cognitive tests. He asked Jamie what he thought of the film and he said, eh, It was pretty much your standard slasher film. There's a group of teens who just graduated high school and go to a local camping site by a lake to celebrate. One of them mentions it's near the site where the killer, the slasher, was shot dead by police a year prior after a rampage. Dr. Baines clarified, asking if this was a reference to the first film. Jamie continued, It's not really clear, they all think it's a joke, apart from the main girl. She said her dad's a police officer and she's seen video evidence of the attack. No one references any of the characters from the first film though, and they don't show up in this one either. The slasher's the only constant. According to Jamie, the main events of the film revolved around a lakeside camping trip and quickly began to go wrong. Dr. Baines inquired about the nature of the slasher's kills, and Jamie elaborated, He's still got a kitchen knife, same weapon as the first film, so he stabs a lot of them. It's pretty gory for the time it was made. He slashes up someone's face, then the nerdy guy gets stabbed through the eye. That one's pretty good. The camera gets sprayed with blood. One of the teens gets his head crushed wide open. Dr. Baines asked Jamie how the scenes made him feel, and he responded, I 
There's some good jump scares and the tension's fairly high at points, but it's a little dated. I've seen scarier, but I've also seen worse horrors. Only one part of the film stood out to him. He described it. So, the girl and her best friend, the one that's been looking out for her this whole time, enter into a cellar. The slasher creeps up from behind and grabs the friend, tears his head clean off his neck. The slasher then chases the other teen to the other side of the lake. He's advancing on her. The camera's set on the water of the lake. It's a wide shot. You've got the lake water line parallel to the top and bottom of the shot, so it splits the screen horizontally. She's fallen over, crawling away from him. As he advances on her, the camera zooms in. Slowly, though. It takes its time, and he does too. There's music at the start of the scene, like deep, dark synths. This stops as the camera moves closer, though. I forgot to say, it's, it's a long scene, longer than five minutes. Maybe it was ten? I don't know, it felt longer than ten. So, the slasher's approaching her. We're, the viewers, approaching the shore. And then the music stops, and it's just his footsteps and her pleading. And, and she's pleading, man, she's... There's these big inhales of breath stifled by the mucus running out of her nose. She's babbling, but it gets to the point she's not even saying words, just making noise. As Jamie continued, he began to grow increasingly distressed. The camera's real close to the shore now, and the slasher stops. He turns his head and looks straight at the camera. You can't see his eyes, but you know he's looking straight at you. And he just stands there, staring. Eventually, the girl crawls out of the frame, or the camera zooms past her, I, I can't remember which. It just keeps zooming in on his face. Where his face should be under the hood, the girl keeps screaming off camera, and then there's this guttural ripping noise, and the screaming stops. It just stops, but the camera keeps moving. You can see the individual droplets of blood splashed across him. You can see the fabrics that make up his hood. His face soon takes up the entire shot, and then... black. No credits or nothing, the tape just cuts to black and was pushed out of the player. Dr. Baines pushed a bit, asking if there was anything anomalous he could be forgetting. Then Jamie thought of something. The girl, her friends, all of them, I, I don't think they had names. Jamie became increasingly disturbed by the film over time, calling Dr. Baines into his dormitory to ask him if they had shown him a snuff film. After falling asleep, he had a vivid dream of the lake, crawling alongside it recalling the deaths of his friends at the hand of a masked killer. When he woke up, he saw a shadow outside the window of his room. It stood there, silent and unmoving, all night. It only vanished when the sun came up. The next night, surveillance caught the image of a humanoid shape running through the forest, but the guards found no trace of it. Dr. Baines returned to Jamie's cell to find him deeply distressed. He repeated over and over that the slasher was coming for him. Dr. Baines dismissed this concern. Once Jamie was alone, he stared into the mirror as the temperature began to drop. You're here, aren't you? He said. A gloved hand punctured through the mirror, spraying glass everywhere. On the other side, there he was, the suburb slasher. Jamie fled his dormitory and ran for his life as the slasher followed him. Security officer Lauren confronted the slasher, but they lifted him up by the neck and stabbed the familiar kitchen knife through his head. Jamie continued to make his way through the facility the slasher following and leaving a trail of destruction and bodies in his wake. Then, he reached Dr. Baines, who was confused by his behavior. Dr. Baines insisted that he needed to get to the basement, but terrified, Jamie resisted him. The two men scuffled, and Jamie shoved Dr. Baines hard, sending him careening into the wall. A lighting rig fell from the ceiling, landing on Dr. Baines. Several strangers ran into the room, calling for a medic on set, and asking for production and lighting to come back and reset everything. Off screen, a director yelled, CUT! The slasher's face appeared, taking up the entirety of the camera, and the tape cut to black. This version of the tape's events was created after the tape was watched by D1888 in a testing session with Dr. Carpenter. There has never been a Dr. Baines in the SCP Foundation's employ. Somehow, this second tape creates a localized destabilization of reality. It is unknown how many times it has actually been tested. So be careful what horror rentals you decide to watch. You might just find yourself in the middle of the action, and no matter what you think you know about surviving a slasher film, there will be no escape. You can run, but you certainly can't hide. Okay guys, so to wrap this video up, I really don't think this cursed episode of this show was real. 
It's obviously just a really good scary fan animation, and the fact that the creators behind it didn't come out and claim ownership of it sooner, allowing it to be reposted and re-uploaded so many times, is really what got people thinking was legit. That being said, it's still a good attempt at what a cursed lost episode would look like. So shout out to those animators, man. Anyway, I've been the Goat Hellholder 98 be sure to like this video, subscribe to my channel down below, and hey, if you know about any more lost media you want me to cover, leave it in the comments and I'll check it out. Oh, and be sure to follow my socials at hellholder98. I go live most days and post updates about new videos on my story, so go check it out. Alright, until then, I'll see you somewhere down the line. The moment his finger pushed the button to stop the camera recording, the practiced false smile dropped from Holden's face. It was hard not to feel down after he'd finished filming a new video, not thanks to any post-creativity slump, but the more depressing knowledge of just how much of an uphill battle this whole thing was. It felt like yesterday when Holden had first gotten into the creepier side of the internet. He never ventured into anything illicit or outright illegal, mind you, but there was a distinct corner of the web that had pulled him in when he was still at school and just starting to spend more time online. This part of the internet was filled with scary stories that were mostly fake or made up for likes, but that could have been real. There were unsettling animations, short clips that were hand-drawn to give people the creeps and keep them up at night. Not to mention a whole archive of public safety announcement videos, terrifying workplace and road safety warnings that used to be broadcast on TV, and were as petrifying than the most acclaimed horror movies. Speaking of things that were broadcast to TV, that had gradually become Holden's specialty. One of his friends had sent him the link to a fictional account of someone who had supposedly uncovered an unaired episode of a Saturday morning kids cartoon, or so this person claimed anyway. They went on to describe bizarre imagery, so intense and terrifying that it was unbefitting of a show for children. Then the person who made the original post explained how they got into contact with the show's creators via email to ask them about this cursed episode. The showrunner responded stating that the episode the poster had allegedly seen didn't even exist. To Holden, it didn't matter if the story was real or not. That wasn't the point. What was far more important was that it felt real. To him, it was plausible, even possible, that there were pieces of media out there in the world that had never seen the light of day. Episodes of TV shows or entire movies that were so wild and out there that they could have been banned and buried long before the dawn of the internet, wherein there was a record of everything and nothing was ever really lost. The idea of uncovering those lost pieces of media became Holden's primary hobby. He'd come home from school, throw his backpack onto his bed, and then sit in front of his computer for hours without even changing out of the clothes he had been wearing all day in class. But all the time he spent trawling through forum threads, following and messaging collectors on social media, listening to theories and coming up with his own, eventually it began to encroach on other things. Much to his mom's disappointment, Holden's grades took a rapid decline, and it wasn't long before he was failing his classes bad enough to not make the cut to continue on at school. But as much as it upset his mother, Holden really didn't mind. He was already thinking way beyond high school, and he knew he didn't need grades to be able to do the one thing he wanted to do with his life. Holden set up his own channel, with the plan to start uploading videos under his new online alter ego. And before long, Hell Holder 98 was born. He centered his whole internet persona around lost media, discussing which popular rumors were true and which were fictionalized for likes and clicks. It started out with a few discussion videos, where he would simply sit in his bedroom, a camcorder opposite him as he spoke. But before long, Holden was adding more and more flair to his content, learning how to edit on his computer, adding clips or screenshots he could find of supposed lost TV episodes to give his videos some credibility, a very necessary quality when trying to determine if certain things were real or not. Each video he finished, he had another two topics to a list of ideas he kept, planning to just perpetually churn out content until he eventually had a huge hit that went viral. Although the one thing he didn't realize until it was perhaps too late was that social media success didn't happen overnight. In fact, it didn't happen over many, many nights either. No matter how often Holden promoted his channel on his social media profiles, or how many new videos he uploaded, he couldn't seem to get any to land well and get boosted by the algorithm. At least that's one of the things he attributed the problem to. He pointed the finger of blame at anything that he could. One day, it was that the algorithm was suppressing his channel and boosting others who had already got more subscribers. 
The next, it might be his slow internet connection had led to one of his videos going live at a time when the site had low traffic. The one possibility that Holden didn't stop to consider was that maybe his genre of content was too niche, but that the days of the internet's interest in lost media had already peaked back when he was still in high school. Nevertheless, he kept trying, making content day in and day out, working under the assumption that if he just made enough videos, then one day he was sure to blow up. That would be his big break, his ultimate win, a video that did well enough to garner thousands, if not millions, of views. But the more time he devoted to Hellholder 98, the only number that seemed to be at all increasing was the number of videos he had posted, each one barely garnering view figures that were above a single digit. To make matters worse, getting help with growing his online brand was next to impossible. Every now and then, he would post on forums asking for advice, or if anyone wanted to collaborate so he could gain some exposure from creators with bigger followings. Those posts were often met with a slew of apathetic, snide responses, or comments telling Holden to just, quote, make better content, as if that was solid, specific advice. On top of that, his mom had outright refused to support her son's chosen career path, citing his failure at school as the main reason. Speaking of, any friends Holden previously had at school had all moved away in the years since, going off to pursue college and other higher education. Some were even starting their new and exciting professions. The old saying said, it's lonely at the top, but Holden was just as lonely down at the bottom, posting his content in total obscurity, as if he was just shouting into an empty void with no one around to hear. The few people Holden did still consider his friends were all as chronically online as he was, most of them fellow lost media collectors. After interacting with them in the common threads of various forums, the handful of like-minded guys were as close as Holden had to people actively supporting his channel. The collectors would usually give him pointers or topics to discuss in videos and contributing to the single-digit view count underneath his uploads. Although to him, it wasn't nearly enough. He didn't want just his friends to see his videos. He wanted an audience, a fan base of his own. It was late, the light of the computer monitor illuminating the dark of Holden's bedroom. Hunched over his desk, he was clicking and dragging clips into the timeline of a video project, trimming them down to make the whole thing better paced, snipping out bad takes where he stumbled over his words or misspoke. It was while editing that Holden noticed another screen lighting up on his desk, accompanied by a vibration, his phone. He reached for it, seeing a notification popped up on the lock screen. It was from Goth, one of the lost media collectors, and it read, Dude, urgent, found something that you can make a video on. Hold inside. It was late, and he was already focused on editing this current video tonight. If he got it finished, then he could go to sleep. What do you know about the Deathly videotape? Goth asked in a second message, before Holden even had a chance to open it first. The what? He replied bluntly, before sending another text saying, Can't this wait until the morning? I'm trying to edit. If you don't act fast, it'll be gone forever, came the response only a second later, followed by a link. Lethargically, Holden tapped the hyperlink Goth had sent, his phone opening up its browser and displaying the web page. It was a buy and sell website. One of those places where people offloaded junk they didn't want anymore to strangers for a bit of extra cash. The page in question showed a few grainy photos taken on a phone of a small rectangular object in someone's hand. What is that? Holden asked. It's a videotape, bonehead, Goth fired back. Although they'd never met in person, Holden always got the sense his friend was a little older than he was. Looking back on the seller's ad, it was for a second-hand Sony Color Collection 60-90 to minute mini-DV videotape, a type of cassette used in a lot of old handheld recording cameras. So what? Holden asked in another text. Look, there have been rumors for ages about something called the Deathly Videotape. Goth replied in a series of rapid-fire messages. It used to be all the rage on a lot of old lost media forums, the real nasty ones before they got shut down. Supposedly, there's a recording on this tape of some kind of live show. Except when you put in your VCR and press play, you see something horrible. Nobody even knows if it's real or just a legend. How do you know this is the same tape? Holden queried. By now, he had typed out the same link on his computer and was looking at the for sale page on the bigger screen while he texted back and forth with Goth. Read the item description, he answered. Holden's eyes scanned down the page, finding a short message from the seller. To anyone interested, I'm giving this old mini DV tape away. I don't know where I got it or why I watched it, but I wish I hadn't. It had ruined everything for me. It's impossible to enjoy anything else now that I've seen what's on it. Let me make this clear, I am not selling this tape, I'm giving it away free of charge. I hope that getting rid of it will help. 
Sounds ominous, Holden texted. If you're so sure if this is the Deathly videotape, then why don't you get it? Keep reading, Goth responded. Underneath the item description was another note that the seller had written. Please note, I am unable to leave my town at present, nor can I mail this tape to anyone even if you pay postage. Collection only. If you're interested, please contact me at the following address. Below was an address. It was in Holden's hometown, only a few streets away from where he and his mom lived. This could be it, dude. Came another slew of messages from Goth. You buy this tape and make a video recording, then you might finally go viral. But you better be quick before someone goes and picks it up thinking it's just an ordinary tape. Holden looks back at the address, double-checking where it was. At most, it'd take a quick walk there and back, he thought. And if this tape was as elusive as Goth said it was, then owning it would mean Holden would be the only one who could make a video featuring it. After messaging the seller the night before, Holden found himself rushing through his quiet neighborhood to the address. All night as he tried to sleep, he kept thinking of the video he was going to make, how it could finally put him on the map, and at long last, bring him the e-fame he'd been working towards. Wrapping his knuckles against the front door, he was met by an older man who stood on the other side. He was walking with a crutch, with a few bruises and stitched up cuts on his face. The second that Holden explained he was there for the tape, the man reached to an unseen shelf just inside the doorframe and thrust the rectangular cassette into his hands before shutting the door as quickly as he could without it hitting Holden square in the face. He stared at the tape in his hands, though through its transparent green plastic case, he could see a hand-scrawled note. I know you'll ignore me if I tell you not to watch this, it read. So if you do, then on your own head be it. Having spent the rest of the day looking up exactly what he'd need to play such an old outmoded recording format and convert the footage to digital so he could include it in his video, Holden had retrieved his mom's old VHS player from the attic, wiping the thick layer of dust off of it. It took a while for him to get everything ready to go, not just finding the right adapters and cables to hook the VCR up to his TV, as well as linking that to his computer, plus angling his camera right, and making sure the ring light he'd bought for filming was putting enough focus on his face. After the substantial prep, Holden took a deep breath, summoning up the faux excitement and stage smile, before he hit the record button on his camera. What's up guys, it's Hellholder98 here. Now today I've got a real treat for you all. So my friend Goth, shout out to him, told me that a while ago, there was talk about something called the Deathly Videotape. We found a mini DV tape that we think might be that very same tape, so we're gonna watch it and see if it's legit. Dropping his persona as his face turned away from the camera, Holden punched the play button on the VHS player, his eyes glued to the TV screen as the camera's lens was fixated on him. Okay, nothing so far, he observed, met with nothing but a blank, black screen. Suddenly, after 12 seconds of nothing, the playback started instantly, and Holden started relaying what he was seeing on the tape to the camera. There was no sound, either because the recording on the videotape was filmed in that way, or Holden had improperly figured out how to hook it up to the VHS. The video itself showed a recording of Sesame Street Live, and for the most part just seemed pretty underwhelming. Characters were up on stage, their puppeteers managing to stay out of sight as they entertained their young audience. After two and a half minutes, Holden was starting to feel like he'd gone to all this effort over what seemed to just be someone's old, unwanted home video. Just as he was considering turning off the camera and throwing the videotape in the trash, at almost the three minute mark, something weird started happening on the stage. The actor playing one of the bigger characters seemed to be having some trouble, instantly trying to pull off his cumbersome costume, much to the distress of the kids in the audience looking on in horror. But it wasn't just the illusion that had been broken. The actor was trying to get out of his costume because he was choking. He dropped to his knees on stage, clawing at his own throat before finally falling face down, totally still, asphyxiated, dead. Over the next almost 20 seconds, the same thing started happening to another three of the characters on stage all of them violently choking while the children in the audience screamed and cried silently on the inaudible tape. Then, at three and a half minutes, the video cut out. Holden was unsure how to react, at first a little creeped out, only to be somewhat bemused. He played it down for the camera, remarking that the video seemed tame compared to some of the more graphic fake content he'd seen. But the whole time, even after rapping, recording, sitting awake all night to edit his reaction video, blurring out the parts that would break the terms of service, he had no idea what he'd seen was actually real or not. Finishing the final edit just as the sun was coming up, Holden hit upload and crawled into bed while his video was uploaded. The buzz of a text message from Goth awoke him, 
Dude, I told you this video was going to make it big. Without even replying, Holden booted up his computer and opened the page for his newly uploaded video. The view count was already in the thousands and climbing, comments pouring in underneath, mostly from people debating whether or not the contents of the tape had been faked. Holden punched the air in excitement. He'd finally done it. But as the video kept playing, he heard a retching sound coming from the computer's speakers. He turned to look back at his earlier self, filmed only the night before. Except what he was seeing play out on screen now wasn't what he remembered happening last night. It couldn't have, because the Holden in that video was choking. That wasn't possible. He was alive and watching his own video right now. But somehow the footage was shown him dying, his airway blocked, face turning red, then blue as tears streamed down his cheeks. In the video, Hellholder98 fell down, dead from asphyxiation, and watching it made Holden feel sick. To make matters worse, none of the comments under the video seemed to have witnessed the same ending. Holden even texts Goth to ask if the same thing had happened, but he described the ending exactly as Holden remembered filming it. But afterwards, it didn't stop happening. Everything he watched ended the same. Every clip online, every TV show, every movie. Holden couldn't even read a book without some characters, fictional or otherwise, keeling over and choking to death, just like the characters on the tape. He barely had time to acknowledge the hits his reaction to the deathly videotape were getting. He was too busy trying to figure out why he couldn't stop seeing people dying the exact same way, even himself when he watched back his old Hellholder 98 videos. Reacting to the deathly videotape garnered a respectable 3 million views, but Hellholder 98 never uploaded again afterwards. His channel went silent, remembered only as a one-hit wonder, until the video and the entire channel were taken down. Holden was never reported missing. The Foundation made sure of that when they came by to collect SCP-583 and place the videotape into containment. We've covered a lot of SCPs on this channel, but trust us, none of them have quite the bite that this one does. We know you like the more intellectual anomalies, and this will give you plenty to chew on in that regard. While the SCP Foundation wants to keep SCP-5940 a secret, here at SCP Explained, we're gonna give you the tooth, the whole tooth, and nothing but the tooth. <clears throat> uh, truth. I meant truth. This SCP, thankfully, isn't as existentially threatening as a lot of the other ones we cover, but just because it won't send you on an express trip to the pearly gates doesn't mean it won't wreak havoc on your pearly whites. Open wide and say ah, because today we're getting into an anomaly that affects each and every one of us. Tell us, have you ever felt anxious about your teeth? Ever had that weird dream where all your teeth fall out or even worse, someone pulls them out? Does the thought of us taking a hammer to your teeth or them rotting away someday and making you need dentures make you shudder and cringe? Don't be ashamed. The answer to this question for most people would be a resounding yes. And that's because of humanity's shared psychodental trauma. Don't know what that is? Well, that's fine too. After all, the Foundation has taken pains to hide all of this from you for fear that even knowing about it might incur further psychodental stress. It's that kind of subtle but constant creeping dread you experience in a dentist's waiting room, knowing it's been too long since the last time you came in. And now you're fully anticipating him saying something like, well, it's a real mess in here, I'm afraid we're gonna have to take them all and I'm gonna charge you double just because they look so unpleasant. If that feels grimly familiar to you, then you know exactly what we're talking about today. The SCP Foundation searched long and hard to find the source of this peculiar collective trauma, which, ironically, is a major factor in people not actually visiting the dentist more often, and has found the source in question to be as ancient as it is strange. To best explain exactly what we're dealing with here, we need to take a trip to the North Pole, though sorry to tell you that today's SCP is not, in fact, Santa's workshop. It's actually the northernmost point of inaccessibility, a part of the world that's nearly impossible to reach, simply by virtue of being the cluster of arctic ice pack furthest away from any landmass, always moving and shifting. But if through some means you were ever able to make your way up there, you would find an impossibly large pair of maxillary incisors, which in layman's terms is a giant pair of front teeth. So while there may not be Santa's Grotto up there, if all you want for Christmas is your two front teeth, then buddy, you're in luck. 
Incidentally, these two giant teeth embedded into the ground and dubbed SCP-5940 by the SCP Foundation are connected to the two front teeth of every human being on Earth. Think of it as almost a pair of giant voodoo dolls, but their effects on each individual human are relatively mild. That's because the effects are actually distributed across all humans, and the more humans there are, the less damage to the enormous pair of teeth will affect each of us. The problem is humans have eight incisors. They're the two sets of four front teeth on the upper and lower jaw, and this pair of teeth covers only two of them. What about the rest? Well, next on our roster is SCP-5940-2. Let's join intrepid scientist and explorer Dr. John E. Namel, who has no affiliation with the SCP Foundation, on his quest to find them. Dr. Namel and his small team brave brutal colds and obscene treks through ice and snow to finally discover this grand creation near the southern pole of inaccessibility, the point of Antarctica furthest away from the southern ocean. When he and his men finally arrived, they gazed upon the incredible pair of teeth in awe, a mighty set of mandibular central incisors, otherwise known as the front teeth on the bottom jaw. The Foundation believes that the only way to truly solve the problems that SCP-5940 poses is to remove the various teeth from the areas where they're currently lodged. However, the Foundation doesn't yet possess the technology or resources to properly dislodge any of these behemoths. However, the psychic anticipation of the impending tooth removal has caused the psychodental trauma of people all over the world to skyrocket in the meantime. In a sense, it's like the entire world is sitting outside the dentist's office waiting for a prognosis and hoping that when the dentist pulls out their pair of surgical pliers, they at least have the decency to give us a hit of the laughing gas first. However, the Foundation has discovered an interesting fact in the meantime. The effects of the teeth on the global population can be slightly mitigated by enacting certain forms of concussive trauma on them. And to perform this act for the greater good of the Earth's psychodental condition, Dr. John E. Namel and those accompanying him made the ultimate sacrifice. Knowing, on a subconscious level, what they must do, they began to turn their equipment into a kind of makeshift diving board above the giant incisors. Once the board was complete, the adventurers each took turns jumping off of it, gaining speed as they rocketed down towards the teeth below. As each of them hit the sharp upper edges of the teeth, they were cut in half, leaving a smear of red against the shining white calcium. The two halves of their bisected bodies fell down into the piles of frozen bones on either side of the teeth's base, all that remained of prior brave heroes who'd made their final pilgrimage to the site of SCP-5940. While none of these various expeditions were in any way officially related to the SCP Foundation, the Foundation nonetheless extended honorary Foundation stats of merit to those who decided to take the plunge for the collective psychodental health of their fellow man. For SCP-5940-3, we have to go deeper, literally. It's at the bottom of the ocean. Namely, it sits below Point Nemo, also known as the Oceanic Point of Inaccessibility, the furthest point away from land in the entire world's oceans. This next absurd pair of teeth, some mandibular lateral incisors, lurk below the churning ocean waves like a… well, there's nothing really like a giant pair of underwater teeth, is there? Thankfully, the position of these teeth have been serendipitous. Not only does their remoteness make them much harder for civilians to just stumble upon, but Point Nemo has always been a popular spacecraft graveyard. This means that during tests and sometimes even actual missions, the return trips are often piloted towards Point Nemo to prevent the risk of any errant spacecraft pieces from landing in populated areas and causing damage or death. Remember we mentioned earlier that the Foundation encourages repeated concussive attacks against the teeth to ward off their psychodental effects? Here, the pieces of spacecraft blasting into the water towards them fulfill that role. At the latest measurement, 126 of the 263 spacecraft ditched at this pole since 1971 had successfully collided with this particular pair of teeth, giving them perhaps the weakest output of psychodental trauma of any of the SCP-5940 instances. And while the furthest point in the ocean from any major land masses may seem about as remote as it gets, the last instance of SCP-5940 easily blows it out of the water. Well, not literally. But if it did, that would be a wonderful example of a problem taking care of itself, wouldn't it? The last instance of SCP-5940, SCP-5940-4, a pair of maxillary lateral incisors, live on the dark side of the moon. Yep, dentists and Pink Floyd fans of the world rejoice. You're probably wondering, while the first three pairs of teeth clearly grew on Earth, why is the fourth a pair of more 
lunar incisors. Studies performed by the foundation on the soil around the base of the fourth set of teeth prove that they actually did originate on Earth. They believe to have split from Earth during the incident which formed the moon. This means that these teeth are literally older than the moon, and this also makes them billions of years older than humanity. So these giant teeth don't look like our incisors. Our incisors look like these giant teeth. So now we finally understand this ridiculous threat to our collective psychodental health. Move over, SCP-682, and step aside, Devour of Worlds. Get the hell out of my face, Scarlet King. We can't deal with any of you small-timers until we solve the global psychodental health crisis posed by SCP-5940. Which elite heavy hitters have the Foundation put on the case to deal with these enamel nightmares? Meet the Department of Psychodentistry, a joint venture formed from the collaboration of the Psionics Division, a task force that specializes in Psyche SCPs the Department of Memetics, and most importantly of all, the Dentistry Division. You may be thinking, why does the SCP Foundation even need a Dentistry Division? That seems like a waste of time and resources. And if you're thinking that, you're not only wrong, you probably have horrible teeth. The Dentistry Division is the first and last line of defense that the Foundation has against a plethora of toothy anomalies. Like SCP-5852, a strange phenomenon that causes human teeth to grow out of the bodies of cicadas. Or SCP-2450, a condition that causes hyperdontia, the excessive development of teeth all over the bodies of mammalian creatures, with the infection being spread, appropriately, through bites. And, of course, SCP-478, a predatory moth-like creature that enters the bodies of victims under the age of 25 and attaches itself to the soft palate in the upper nasal cavity. From there, it would promote the unchecked growth of teeth on the soft palate of the victim, but that's just where it starts. Teeth develop all throughout the mouth, nasal cavity, esophagus, and even the interior of the stomach, where the digestion of the teeth leads to excruciating pain. Next time your entire body is filling up with teeth due to SCP-478, you'll really regret underestimating the value of the humble dentistry division. So, what does the new Department of Psychodentistry propose to do with SCP-5940, the ultimate in tooth-based anomalies? Thankfully, they have a plan that'll unfold over the next 79 years, known as the Absolute Tooth Field in all uppercase letters. It's a three-pronged plan that's sure to fully neutralize this dental menace. You see, there's one thing we haven't told you. The psionic relationship between SCP-5940 and the incisors of all of humanity isn't one way. While the giant teeth and what happens to them can affect our teeth, what happens to our teeth can also affect the nature of SCP-5940. And that little fact is the key to the absolute tooth field plan. The first part of the plan involves using memetics to make humans shun birth control globally, accelerating population growth to 4.2% per year for the next 79 years. This will lead to a population of 200 billion humans by the year 2100. The second part will be using memetics to encourage every human to somehow mechanically remove all of their incisors. And the third part will be the most complicated of all trying to get all these 200 billion humans to remove the same incisors at the same time. The Department of Psychodentistry estimates that this will create the sufficient psychic force to finally pull the various SCP-5940 instances from their moorings, and thus healing humanity's collective psychodental trauma. It is a brilliant plan to take out a dangerous anomaly, and surely 1 trillion 600 billion human incisors is a small price to pay. In the summer of 2007, in the heart of a forest in Northern California, hundreds of people were gathered for a yearly art and music festival. It was meant to be a celebration, a weekend filled with creative expression, dancing, and sure, probably some illegal substances. But it was all set to be a mostly wholesome affair, and one that attendees had been looking forward to all year. On the evening of the festival's first night, after a day of painting, performance art, interpretive dance, and folk pop fusion, the organizers put together a massive bonfire. Everyone gathered around, roasting marshmallows and vegan hot dogs, and breaking out their acoustic guitars for a sing-along. It was all going well, and they were heading into the third refrain of Kumbaya, when a group of friends adding logs to the fire noticed something odd. Some of the flames at the edge of the fire pit were moving in a different direction than the rest. While most of the flames flickered upward, some tilting slightly with the direction of the wind, these flames were moving sideways against the wind, stretching themselves out towards the grass. 
It seemed bizarre, impossible, and they wondered at first if perhaps the brownies they had eaten earlier had more than just chocolate in them. But then, the flames kept moving, taking on a familiar shape. They were dancing orange and yellow flames, there was no doubt about that. But they also seemed almost like fingers. The fingers extended outward, grasping for something. Attached to the fingers was a hand, then an arm. Another hand joined it, twisting into the grass, which dried and crackled at its touch. One of the friends, a young woman named Flower, attempted to alert one of the event staff, but they were too busy trying to get their marshmallow to the perfect shade of golden brown. Unable to get any help, she watched helplessly as the fiery hands dragged a head, a torso, and the rest of a humanoid body behind them. It looked like the shape of an ordinary man, with the glaring exception that it was made entirely out of fire. It stepped out of the fire pit and began to take slow, halting strides toward the gathered crowd. Now everyone took notice of what was happening. First, they froze in shock, staring at this being of pure flame, unbearable heat raining off of him as he moved closer and closer. When he reached out a hand toward Flower, and the arm of Flower's dress ignited in flames on contact, the first scream broke through the silence. When they marketed this year's event as Burning Man in the Woods, this was not what they had in mind. But there he was, just the same. A man made of flames tearing through what was meant to be a peaceful and happy event with no dangers beyond exhaustion, dehydration, and maybe a noise complaint or two. Instead, the crowd scattered in every possible direction, running for their lives. It was already too late for poor Flower, who fell to the ground shrieking in agony as the fire engulfed the organic material of her dress and the flaming man pulled her into its deadly arms. Her screams went quiet, drowned out by the crackling roar of the fire as it fed on her flammable body. Once Flower was nothing but a pile of bones and ashes, the entity began to walk slowly, purposefully, through the woods with its arms outstretched. It brushed its fingertips over everything it passed, every tree, every stump, every plant or scrap of fabric torn off of a branch. The fire began to spread like, well, wildfire. By the time the first festival goers made it out of the forest and into the nearby town to get help, dozens of acres of forest were ablaze and over 50 people were dead. The fire department was deployed to the forest, where they were able to contain the blaze after hours of work. Meanwhile, word of the man made a fire that destroyed the art and music festival reached the only people qualified to deal with such a creature, the SCP Foundation. They deployed operatives embedded in the local police force, who joined the fire department under the guise of providing reinforcements. Once the blaze was contained and the area was largely safe to enter, they followed the path of the fire and tracked the being responsible for all of the destruction. They found it, shrunk to the size of a small child, huddled in the fire pit where it all began, as if it was hiding from the fire hoses. Then they apprehended the being, later designated SCP-457. SCP-457 is comprised of unknown materials, though obviously it is made up of something flammable. Whatever it is, it is made up of something invisible and impossible to detect by any known scientific means. The only visible aspect of the entity is the flames it produces, which tend to make up a humanoid shape as long as it has enough fuel to reach that size. If it does not have enough fuel, it shrinks in size, becoming as small as the single flame atop a lit match. In its smallest form, it is indistinguishable from any other small flame except for the occasional display of independence, such as jumping to other fires or flammable materials, which it can then use to grow larger. When it is large enough to take on a human form, SCP-457 displays human-like intelligence and is capable of communication through writing, which it does by burning letters into surfaces with its flames, or even through speech. Though it lacks the anatomy to produce a traditional voice, it produces coherent sounds via pressurized, superheated air, as well as the crackle of its flames. If provided with enough fuel to grow beyond humanoid size, the entity can split into two or more beings, depending on how much fuel it is given. However, this split state does not last, as the separate instances of SCP-457 will attempt to attack each other until they are the only one left standing. SCP-457 seems to want nothing more than to consume more and more fuel and spread as far as it can. It has shown a troubling ability to learn and adapt, 
purposefully breaking and interfering with sprinkler systems in the building and setting up elaborate traps for personnel it does not like. Dr. Smythe, head of the research team assigned to SCP-457, conducted an interview with the subject on a rare day where it was feeling cooperative in order to better assess its psychology and motivations. Dr. Smythe entered SCP-457's containment chamber, carrying a fire extinguisher in case of any hostility on the part of the entity. He stood on the other side of the blast-shielded window for extra protection. It crackled pleasantly in the corner, seeming to welcome him inside. He asked if it was capable of or willing to speak. It answered, yes. He asked how it felt about being confined. It responded plainly, dislike, no fuel, no air. When Dr. Smythe reminded the entity that it had enough air and fuel to survive, it argued that it could not burn and had no fuel. To clarify, Dr. Smythe asked, are you saying that you cannot grow? At this question, SCP-457 moved back and forth through the small section of the room, as if pacing and looking for something. It said, grow, need, must grow, and when asked how it felt, it simply said, hungry. As the questioning continued, the entity approached the window and stretched a hand made of flame toward the glass. For a moment, it stopped responding to Dr. Smythe. In order to get the being's attention back, he casually brought up the subject of water. At the very mention of it, SCP-457 let out a high-pitched scream and pressed itself against the window in a threatening gesture. Dr. Smythe warned it that it must move away from the window or it would be doused in water. It moved back, but screamed and hissed for several more minutes, offended and upset. SCP-457 resumed its pacing at a more aggressive speed and intensity. All the while it repeated, want fuel, want air, want burn, want burn, want to burn, again and again, getting louder and louder as it moved. Dr. Smythe was perplexed by this behavior, noting that there was no way out and wondering what it could be trying to accomplish. At this point, the interview took a turn for the disastrous. Somehow, SCP-457 was able to damage the sprinkler system and a section of the fuel injector that had been providing it with a small stream of fuel. With the nozzle broken open, several gallons of gasoline came flooding out, allowing the entity to grow to an incredible size in a sudden, massive, destructive blast. Exploiting a weakness in the blast shielding, SCP-457 was able to escape its containment for several minutes, burning its way down the hall of the facility until the larger sprinkler system activated, sending it hissing back to its cell. There it was apprehended by a team of guards and herded into a new, higher security cell. It is unknown how exactly the entity became aware of the weaknesses in its containment chamber, but this incident revealed that it is a highly intelligent being capable of problem solving. However, it learned this information and figured out how to exploit it. The Foundation realized that more extensive measures would need to be taken to keep it locked down and keep the general population safe. Due to the dangerous nature of SCP-457's corporeal form, highly specialized containment procedures have been put in place to keep the flame from spreading. The entity is kept in a 5x5-meter chamber with at least 9 inches of fireproofing in place, including asbestos and perlite. The observation window is blastproof and resistant to extremely high temperatures. The room's opening is made up of temperature-controlled and airtight chambers that can be sealed in the event of an escape attempt. The room itself is kept at a high humidity level and a drain has been installed on the floor. With a sprinkler system in the ceiling and emergency hoses that can be operated if additional water is needed. A small portion of the room is free from water, but only enough so that SCP-457 can maintain its shape and protect itself from moisture. Any personnel that enters SCP-457's containment unit must wear Class A temperature-controlled and flame-resistant suits and must enter in groups of three. Two of the three members of each group must be armed with blast shields and fire extinguishers. Personnel are not permitted to enter the containment chamber for any reason other than providing daily fuel or fixing any issues with the room or its sprinkler system. In some ways, its containment procedures are reminiscent of a particularly spicy variant of SCP-173. If the entity attempts to attack any personnel, it can be deterred via the application of fire extinguishers or hoses until it backs down. If it escapes from containment, further sprinkler systems will be activated throughout the facility in order to contain the fire. The highest priority, aside from keeping the entity contained, is keeping it fed. Because it needs constant fuel in order to survive, 
The Foundation is currently prioritizing finding an infinitely renewable source of fuel. Though many have been proposed, including the use of other SCPs such as SCP-2689 and SCP-124, no source has been officially approved yet. In the meantime, they keep the burning being fed and happy, or as happy as it can be. It will never be truly satisfied until a day arrives where it can be permitted to spread as far and wide as it wishes, to burn and feed and engulf everything in sight. Let's hope that day never comes, but if you start to feel unusually hot, if the walls seem to suddenly blacken around you, and you hear the final crackles before the hissing tongues of flame lick at your bubbling skin, well by that point, it'll already be too late. In 1961, the SCP Foundation discovered a town that was completely devoid of all life. Not long before their arrival, Darrington, North Carolina had been a community with high aspirations, a deeply religious township of devout Christians, many of whom were seeking greater prosperity from their lives. But now their home was a ghost town, with no sign of any prior Darrington resident to be found. Where in the hell had they all gone? It hardly seemed like the population of an entire town would all simultaneously decide to up sticks and leave to pastures new. But then again, maybe the citizens of Darrington hadn't left at all. Perhaps they weren't even really still human, and had taken up residence somewhere much darker, like underground. This is the story of one of the earliest known instances of a phenomenon now known under the designation of SCP-3089, or to use its alternative name, that old time religion. When the SCP Foundation arrived in a desolate Darrington to find the townsfolk had all vanished, they immediately began an investigation into the exact hows and whys, the answers to what exactly had happened here. After all, while not a huge place, Darrington was home to nearly a thousand residents, and that many people don't just disappear, if they even had disappeared and weren't just dormant. But what the Foundation uncovered was a gruesome discovery that led them to not only demolishing the entire North Carolinian town, but purchasing all the land around it to keep the area under permanent observation. Prior to the demolition, however, the Ministry of Sevenfold Blessing had been one of the oldest buildings in Darrington, much like most town churches. And it was while searching the offices of this church that the Foundation cleanup crews discovered their first piece of evidence the initial clue about what had happened to this deserted town. They recovered a series of cassette tapes, each with a recording of sermons that had been given within the Ministry of Seventhfold Blessing. These were all delivered by one pastor, Bartholomew Jenner, the first having been recorded on August 17th of 1959, two years earlier. My friends, I want to talk to you about what the Bible offers tonight, Pastor Jenner began in the first of these recordings. I want to talk to you about what you are owed. I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to those of you who are struggling right now. To those of you who have hardship and pain. Maybe you've heard that the Bible only nourishes the spirit. That God only provides for our immortal souls. Well, my friends, I'm here to tell you that this is simply not true. Pastor Bartholomew Jenner seemed to be focused on the discussion of very real, relatable problems. After all, what person hasn't felt unsatisfied with their life at one point or another? And this was apparently no different for the people of Darrington. Many of you can think of places in your lives where you have not yet risen, where you are not yet victorious. Marriage, finances, hell. But do not fret, my friends, God wants you to rise. He has cleared a path for you. It is one littered with his earthly treasures. To claim them, you only need to shed your old selves and be reborn. The pastor was merely using the shared faith of the township to help reaffirm that their struggles were not the be-all end-all of their lives. Or at least, that's how it first appeared. But the religious practices taking place in this first recording would soon take a bizarre turn, making it clear there was something far more sinister, even cult-like, going on in the Ministry of Seventhfold Blessing. Now, if you would, some of the ladies from the mayor's office were kind enough to collect these cicada shells. Pass along, each of you take one. Yes, the children too. Be careful, very careful. They are fragile. Each of you take one and hold it in your left hand. Yes, the left hand, not the right. Your left. The shells of dead cicadas hardly seem like common fare for a sermon like this. Although as the recording continued, 
It was easy to understand that Pastor Jenner intended these discarded insect carapaces to be something of a metaphor, even if they were pretty gross, especially to some of the younger members of his congregation. He explained to the Darrington residents that these cicada shells were meant to be symbolic of whatever hardship the citizens were currently struggling with in their lives, whether it was work, a marriage, or an ill family member. Then came the next part of this unorthodox practice. The pastor instructed everyone in the congregation to picture themselves holding their biggest problem in their left hand. Now I want you to squeeze your left hand. Squeeze it into a fist. Feel that problem cracking like old dried out paper. Feel it crumble to dust, Jenner told them. And the residents of Darrington did so, crushing the cicada shells until there was nothing left. Everyone open your eyes. Don't you feel better? Stronger. This is what is offered. Our hardships are like the shell. We shall cast them aside even as they crumble. God has cleared a path. Needless to say, the Foundation agents that recovered the tapes of Pastor Jenner's odd sermons weren't exactly sure what to make of them. And as unusual as they were, the recordings did little to indicate where the townspeople of Darrington, North Carolina had disappeared to. But as they listened further, what they found was even more unsettling than an entire congregation of people crushing cicada shells. In the second recording, dated December 19th of 1959, Pastor Jenner was once again presiding over his congregation. He had just finished quoting a passage from Matthew chapter 25, verse 30, which related to a biblical tale known as the Parable of the Talents. In this story, a master puts his servants in charge of a differently sized portion of his wealth while he is away then judges them based on whether or not his servants make a profit using his money. The third servant, who had received the least talents, meaning an amount of money, was punished for burying his share in the ground. Cast out into the outer darkness, to face weeping and gnashing of teeth. It was after making mention of this unprofitable servant that Pastor Jenner went on to address even more of the bizarre, almost ritualistic practices he had been introducing to his sermons. Now, some of you have expressed concerns over the new sacraments. A few have even called them sacrilege. And yet, have we not prospered? Have these same naysayers, these same doubting Thomases, not profited from our good works? The pastor declared. I have shown you how to heal the sick with the Lord's prayer and the blood of an unbaptized child. I have shown you how to see your future in the stemming entrails of a quivering crow. I have shown you the path to glory but I cannot make you follow this path. I can only show it to you. It is you and you alone who must follow it, who must rise and shed your old self. Shed your old self. The words immediately called to mind the image of the cicadas, insects that discard their outer carapaces and emerge anew, bugs that also burrow into the ground and wait, lying dormant under the earth for years at a time, all before they emerge, rising up again, so they, can spread. It was becoming clear that Pastor Jenner was certainly deviating further and further from the church's normal religious practices. His bold and blatant descriptions of what sounded like ritualistic sacrifices were shocking enough to hear, speaking of using blood and entrails to bring the town the prosperity it sought. But if that wasn't bad enough, the worst was still yet to come, contained within the third and final recording. Unlike the previous cassettes, most of the sermon from June 7, 1960 was almost completely unintelligible, and without any visual evidence to go along with it, it was hard for the Foundation to make out exactly what was going on. It began with another quote from Matthew, this time chapter 28, verse 6, which made mention of the resurrection of Jesus, that he had risen, and that people should come and see where the Lord lay. Not a metaphor, my friend. Pastor Jenner explained before urging his congregation to join in some kind of formation. Step forward, mothers behind their daughters, fathers behind their sons. Turn to face the, uh... The recording became unintelligible again after that point, with only a few more words being audible. The pastor seemed to have gathered the townsfolk of Darrington, presumably for some new form of ritual. He encouraged the town's children to close their eyes and pray, before reminding the congregation that God sacrificed the life of his only son, Jesus. Frighteningly, it appeared that Pastor Jenner was implying the adults of Darrington should do the same. One of the next fragments of his sermon that could be deciphered declared, Lamb is slaughtered to feed the lion, the son is slaughtered to feed. Between more and more noise interfering with the recording, Pastor Jenner could be heard saying, The pact is complete. This world 
shall be our paradise, before he encouraged his congregation, or those who were left, to dig deep and wait. Then came perhaps the most horrifying part of the tape. The remainder of the recording lasted 30 minutes, comprised of pure static. Or the Foundation agents listening to it assumed at first that it was just interference, but further audio analysis seemed to suggest that the long, continuous mass of hissing wasn't static at all. It was the chittering sound of insects, like the noise made by cicadas. For a time, the incident at Darrington left the Foundation baffled. There seemed to be no clear answer as to what had happened. Not one of the town's residents were anywhere to be found, and on top of that, there were no bodies. No remains of any kind to speak of. If they were dead, there would at least be some kind of trace. And then there were all the questions raised by Pastor Bartholomew Jenner's strange sermons. Why did he seem so focused on enacting rituals? Did any of his methods really benefit the town? And why did he place so much emphasis on cicadas, of all things? Answers were few and far between. Although almost six decades after the Foundation discovered the desolate town of Darrington, a new development would come to light. To be more accurate, it was 56 years later. On the 11th of January, 2017, a Foundation agent named Daniel Mitchell was patrolling the area that had formerly been Darrington, North Carolina before the Foundation had demolished all traces of the town. By this point, the SCP Foundation had long thought that they had figured out exactly what SCP-3089 was. They had even encountered it emerging in a number of different forms in both 2007 and 2015. However, it was what Daniel Mitchell happened across during the routine monthly patrol that revealed the horrifying truth. At the outskirts of the area where the town had once been, a series of sinkholes had opened up at some point between the previous monthly check and this one in early 2017. And if you think that these sinkholes caused a disturbance in the earth and uncovered all the bodies of the former residents of Darrington, you'd be wrong. It was far, far stranger. The Foundation conducted a full-scale examination of the sinkholes around the demolished North Carolinian town. And these weren't just a few patches of loose ground that had sunk through. The geological survey the Foundation carried out quickly revealed that these sinkholes led to an extensive network of tunnels underground. They extended several hundred kilometers outwards, practically covering the entire underside of where Darrington had been. The tunnels seemed far too big than any other created by any natural means, but the entire network also appeared too rudimentary, too imperfect to have been carved using any modern excavation technology, like a large drill. Plus, if any equipment like that had been on site, the Foundation would have noticed, as they kept the area monitored. It was almost like something had been burrowing through the ground, only to eventually crawl back up to the surface, resulting in the sinkholes. What's more, the Foundation's geological tests suggested that the network of tunnels was almost four decades old. That would have placed the date of their creation about 10 years after the disappearance of everyone in Darrington. Naturally, the Foundation immediately launched a mission to explore more of the tunnels. Before even completing a full sweep of the underground space in its entirety, they had made another discovery. Contained within the tunnels was over a whole ton of organic material that had been mostly preserved without decomposing too much. The SCP Foundation began gathering samples for testing, finding most of this material to be severely desiccated dermis tissue. That is the dense layer of skin beneath the epidermis, and it had all been entirely dried out. But that wasn't all the testing uncovered. According to genetic analysis, the tissue had two distinct types of DNA present. The first being easily identified as human genetic material, which made sense. Despite the material lacking in moisture, the dermis tissue didn't match the skin of any other mammal. But then, there was the other DNA present. Combined with the expected human DNA was the presence of something else that the Foundation researchers had quite some difficulty finding a match for. Eventually, they determined that this genetic material entangled with the human DNA belonged to the Cicadata Montana, better known as the New Forest Cicada. Cicadas, again. Cicada DNA mixed with human DNA, discovered in a large network of underground tunnels, all beneath the same town where a pastor had his congregation crush cicada shells in their left hands during one of his sermons. Ten years before the sinkhole incident, the Foundation was alerted to a particular YouTube channel by the name of Kai Sanchez Positively Rich. 
On the surface, Kai was one of the many online grifters preaching about how easy it was to quickly achieve an obscene amount of wealth by simply believing in yourself. Usually, if not always, these types of people were trying to scam their audience of loyal subscribers into investing in some kind of illicit money-making scheme or any number of other cons, promising their followers easy money that never came. But Kai Sanchez's channel was slightly different, so much so that the foundation had to contain his entire audience, deeming them to have been affected by SCP-3089. The video that caught the foundation's attention was an hour-long upload from Kai, entitled, Seven Secrets to Ascend the Ladder of Prosperity. There was that word again, prosperity. The same thing Pastor Jenner had promised his entire congregation in Darrington, and the similarities didn't end there. In his video, much like the pastor during his sermons, Kai Sanchez encouraged his audience to visualize their success in order to achieve it. He implied that the human consciousness could impact reality. For example, if his viewers just imagined themselves having a bigger bank account or looking more attractive, then these things would manifest themselves into the real world. One of Kai's secrets to ascend the ladder of prosperity was as follows. Visualize your ascendance. Reimagine yourself as someone who can reach the top of that ladder. Shed your old identity, tear it off, throw it aside like dead skin. You won't need it, not where you're going. The resemblance to Pastor Jenner's sermons was uncanny. Kai's video even encouraged that his audience leave scraps out to lure stray cats into their homes, and then, once they had one, to take a knife and well, you remember what happened in Darrington. But Kai Sanchez made sure to specify, remember to hold the knife with your left hand. Another online community was tagged by the foundation for similar teachings. This group of insular men were trying to apply the same methodology primarily to attract women. However, they also reasoned it could be used to improve their own financial status and physical stature, all done through visualizing and believing that doing so would make these things improve that having faith would grant them prosperity. This disturbed community even tried to use bug rattlers to emit frequencies to aid in attracting women. Contained within these rattlers were the preserved remains of cicadas. Male cicadas have timbals, structures on their outer shell that emit a loud hissing, chittering noise that they often use to find a mate after spending so much time dormant underground before burrowing up to the surface. And if you've been paying attention, you might be able to guess exactly where this is going. SCP-3089 is a phenomenon that occurs within communities of people who are seeking some form of prosperity. Whether that community be a town, a group of like-minded people online, or any other group of collected individuals, the particular type of prosperity these people are all seeking can be anything from spiritual enlightenment to financial success. The SCP Foundation does not yet quite understand exactly how SCP-3089 starts, only that the communities affected by it will attempt to achieve their chosen material success through the application of rituals, like visualizing what they hope to overcome and achieve, and practicing sacrifices. In short, these people have to believe these acts will grant them what they want. They need to be willing to go far enough to do unspeakable things. They need to have faith. Although what they don't realize is, some things can feed on that faith. They can harvest it. Before these communities realize the terrible things that they have done, or who exactly has tricked them into performing these rituals, they'll begin to undergo a horrific transformation process, known as SCP-3089-B. It begins in the chrysalis stage. Members of a community that have been affected by SCP-3089 will experience a declined state of metabolism, now classified as an instance of SCP-3089-A, their brain activity, heart rate, and body temperature will all begin to lower. Over a period of between three and six hours, these people will then suffer a change to their epidermis, the outer layer of skin. It starts to harden until it has formed a dense, brittle substance, like a shell. Next comes the second stage of SCP-3089-B, metamorphosis. Internally, SCP-3089-A individuals will develop a number of tetromas, a type of germ cell tumor that can contain several different types of tissue, such as hair, muscle, and bone. During the next two or three weeks, these tumors will expand and dissolve the person's soft tissue. Then there's the final stage, emergence. An instance of SCP-3089-A will exit its dormant state that began in the initial stage. Once they have awoken, 
then something exits the outer epidermal shell. It will not communicate. Some will retain remnants of internal organs, such as eyes or lungs. However, these are vestigial, no longer serving any purpose. The brain functions deviate from any normal human patterns. Having completed the process, this thing will attempt to burrow down into the soil via any means at its disposal. An outer shell digging into the soil. The tunnels underneath Darrington, the genetic material uncovered below. Dermis tissue with two types of DNA, a mix of human and cicada. There is something out there. It is preying on people's faith, their longing for prosperity. Then when these communities are presented with someone who can take advantage of that faith, like Pastor Jenner or Kai Sanchez, they find themselves encouraged to push their faith to its furthest limit. And then they are rewarded by becoming something else, something nightmarish. The question is, when they wake up and crawl back out from their tunnels, leaving a sinkhole in their wake, where do these cicada creatures go? Russell's back was pressed against the wall, his shuddering hands gripping the fire axe. The low emergency lighting filling the corridor indicated the lockdown was still in effect, although that was simultaneously a blessing and a curse. Sure, it meant that thing couldn't get out, hopefully, but it also meant that Russell was stuck in the wing of the facility with it. He had no idea if anyone else was left. He hadn't seen what had happened to Carpenter. Maybe it got him, or perhaps he had managed to give it the slip at the last second. There was no way of knowing for sure. It had all started so simply, so innocently, and with such noble intentions. If he had known it would lead to all this madness, Russell would have never put his name down on the request form. The SCP Foundation had been working on a way to neutralize or cure SCP-610 for what felt like forever. To one team of scientists, the infamously so-called flesh that hates was a fascinating organism. It was a highly contagious sarcic skin disease, isolated entirely within the small area of Siberia. That on its own wasn't enough to pique the interest of the research team led by Dr. Carpenter, including his hand-picked star researchers Russell and David, along with their assistant Clennon and Dr. Bodden an expert on infectious diseases who had recently joined their efforts to provide his specialist knowledge. What did captivate all of them, however, was what SCP-610 did when it infected a human being. The disease would trigger aggressive and uncontrollable mutations within its infected and could virtually rewrite their entire physiology in a heartbeat. The flesh that hates was capable of transforming a person's body into a horrifying fleshy mass of limbs and matter that barely resembled a human being anymore. And in addition, the infected individuals would retain some level of awareness, attacking any uninfected person with extreme hostility. There had long been chatter among some other research teams studying SCP-610 about devising a way to weaponize the disease. If they could somehow create a variant that didn't turn people into monsters, or at least cause the fleshy abominations to die shortly after mutation, then the Foundation or another interested party could deploy the flesh that hates as a biological weapon. Dr. Carpenter had long abhorred the idea, instead searching for a way to completely reverse the effects of an SCP-610 infection. It may have been idealistic, perhaps even naive by some standards, but the rest of his team was behind him in the pursuit of that noble goal, although not one of them knew it would soon cost them their lives. Hitting speed bump after speed bump in their research, the team were beginning to lose hope. Researcher David was the most outspoken in how tired he was of seeing the same results, yelling in frustration that the flesh could not be cured by conventional means. However, it was that outburst that gave Russell the idea. They had tried treating SCP-610 like a common virus, as if it was any other form of disease, largely thanks to Dr. Botton's input. And granted, that approach had taught them a lot about the flesh's ability to contaminate a subject from a single cell. But this infection was anomalous through and through. Could the solution to eradicating it for good lie not in a medical cure, but in another SCP? Russell brought this hypothesis to the rest of the research team, and each of them had suggestions for other anomalies they could potentially use to cure a subject of the flesh that hates. We could get SCP-049 to take a look at the infected patient, Clennon suggested. Oh, might work. 
Carpenter mused. Although even if he cures someone, he might also kill them. He has his whole deal about ridding the world of the pestilence could prove to be a problem. Uh, there's always 682, David said dryly. Have the reptile eat up all the SCP-610 infectees and voila, problem solved. Oh, real helpful, David, researcher Russell retorted. And what are we gonna do when SCP-682 adapts to the flesh? You really want an infected immortal lizard on the loose? Gentlemen, please. Dr. Botton spoke up. We're forgetting one obvious option. I propose we submit a joint formal request to use SCP-914 for this experiment. Unanimously, the group all agreed that this was the best course of action. SCP-914, or the Clockworks, was a giant machine with two booths marked Input and Output. Although the Foundation still couldn't fully comprehend exactly how SCP-914 seemed to take any object placed within it and disassemble, recreate, improve, or destroy the item depending on its current setting. There was one issue, however. A prior failed experiment, wherein a D-Class was placed in SCP-914, had led to some pretty disastrous consequences. As a result, ever since, no organic matter was to be placed within the clockworks, a rule that the team's experiment with the flesh would breach. Still, they pressed on, each of the five researchers signing their request to utilize SCP-914 before it was submitted to the Foundation higher-ups. Within hours, the request was denied. But the team was determined that SCP-914 could be the key to solving the Foundation's long-standing issue with SCP-610. Dr. Carpenter repealed the decision, urging the higher-ups to reconsider. He argued that this flouting of the no-organic-matter rule was necessary to potentially rid the world of the flesh that hates. After a few days of consideration, the request was finally, fatefully, granted. The team went to work immediately, requisitioning two test subjects, both of which had suffered SCP-610 infections and were horribly mutated. The pair of them were deemed a potential hazard to every member of Foundation staff on site, and as a result, the entire wing of the facility where the clockworks was housed had to be evacuated for safety. Dressed in biohazard suits to protect themselves, the researchers used an electric cattle prod to coax the first flesh specimen into the input chamber of SCP-914. This was the test run. They wanted to see if the clockworks would actually be able to affect those infected with SCP-610 at all. Plus, they needed a failsafe just in case something went wrong. And luckily, the machine had just the thing. Russell asked Clennon to set the clockworks to rough, and with a click and whir of its numerous gears and gyros, SCP-914 came to life. Instantly, the infected test subject was completely obliterated. The setting had reduced it to atoms, disintegrating it on such a microscopic level that there was nothing left in the output chamber. The second infected creature seemed to bristle with anger, but didn't attack or become aggressive, as it too was prodded towards the clockworks. Next, perhaps out of fear that their theory might be wrong, the team agreed to set SCP-914 to its one-to-one -one setting. Sure enough, the machine recreated another instance of a specimen infected with the flesh that hates, replacing the previous one. We all know we're stalling, researcher David piped up. Let's do what we came here for. Set the clockworks to course. Nervously receding a nod from Dr. Carpenter, Clennon stepped forward to switch the dial on SCP-914 to the course setting. This was the primary reason the team had all agreed to use the machine on a flesh specimen. This setting could disassemble any item placed in the input booth, separating it into its base components. Botton had suggested the use of SCP-914 based on the theory that, if it worked correctly, the clockworks could extract the flesh that hates from its infected host, rendering them free of the disease. The machine made a colossal amount of noise as Clennon hurried back to a safe distance with the others. But as it was powering up, seconds from activating, Dr. Carpenter noticed something. The color drained from his face as he saw it. None of the others had noticed from a distance that the dial hadn't been set to course. Instead, it pointed to very fine, the highest refinement setting 914 had. What the hell have you done? Carpenter yelled at Clennon before the machine suddenly activated. What stepped free from the output booth stunned the researcher. It was a man, a seemingly ordinary human, who had presumably been infected by SCP-610 some time ago. He stepped nervously out of the machine, looking confused for a moment as a pair of Foundation security guards cautiously approached him. We did it, Russell said in awe. Suddenly, 
fleshy tendrils burst forth from the man's arms, latching on to the approaching guards. They screamed in agony, their bodies melting, become a bloody, misshapen mass that stayed attached to the humanoid creature at the center. It was like they became a part of it, the guards' arms and legs forming additional limbs as their forms were reconstituted and repurposed as part of a monster that was now crawling on its six legs towards the research team. In a blind panic, the group scrambled for the entrance, the head of the infected man splitting open down the middle, opening up into a wide, snapping pair of jaws. Panting hard as he ran, his breath fogging up the clear faceplate of the biohazard suit, Russell ran through the door, hearing someone close behind. He stopped for a moment, looking back to see the creature on the other side of the door starting to spill through the doorframe like a liquid. Running faster around a corner, Russell came to another halt in the common area. A third security guard following just before a thick steel security door came slamming down, sealing the creature on the other side. The other door didn't hold it! What good is that going to do? Researcher David yelled. More to the point! Dr. Carpenter said, turning and marching towards Clennon. He launched a furious punch at the assistant, knocking him to the floor. Why did you set 914 to very fine, Clennon? The enraged doctor shouted. You're the one who unleashed that abomination, you maniac! What? Clennon replied, fearfully trembling. I, I didn't, I swear I didn't. It said course. I'm sure of it. You expect us to believe that was a mistake? Gentlemen, we need to focus on the situation at hand, the security officer interjected. Regardless of who's responsible, we need to inform the Foundation higher-ups. There's an emergency lockdown, Russell replied. It would have triggered the moment the SCP-610 specimen got free. You've trapped us with a monster, Clennon, Dr. Carpenter spat. Hold on, Researcher David spoke up. Wasn't it Botten's idea to use 914 in the first place? The common area fell silent as everyone turned to look at Dr. Botten. Did you plan for this, Doc? David pushed. Botten chuckled. Need I remind you, my friends, that we all agreed to use the clockworks, did we not? All of our names are on the request, he answered. Besides, accusing me, David, that's rather rich coming from you. What's that supposed to mean? The researcher fired back. Beckoning his finger, Botten encouraged the rest of the team to follow him across the common area, to where a row of lockers stood, each door bearing one of their names. He gestured to the one labeled David. Go on, Botten added. Shooting him a dirty look, David barged past the disease expert and opened his locker. Not one among the group expected what would fall out. It was an old leather-bound book, symbols carved into the front cover. Instantly, thanks to the work studying SCP-610, the researchers all knew a text on sarcasm when they saw one. It had been long known that the flesh that hates was often described in texts revered by sarcic cults, who worship death, decay, and disease. What the hell, David? Russell exclaimed, picking up the book and examining it in disbelief. You're a sarcist? Carpenter asked, the fury in his voice already elevating. No, I'm not! Researcher David protested. I I've never seen that before! It was in your locker! The doctor yelled. You're one of those cannibal cultists! This was your plan! To refine the flesh for your twisted, death-worshipping religion! It certainly seems that way, Botten interjected. After all, Researcher David did seem frustrated at our earlier results. Impatient, even. <laughs> you! David pointed at the doctor. You planted this in my locker! You're here a sarcist, Clennon repeated in a nervous stammer. You made me turn the dial to very fine. You made that thing appear. You made me your accomplice! Anger tears streamed down his face. Clennon's hand reached for the security officer's gun and went to draw it, planning to shoot David on the spot. But as he went to pull the weapon from the guard's holster, it wouldn't budge. It was then that Assistant Clennon stared in horror at his hand. His fingers had fused to the guard's leg. The officer gave a twisted grin as his torso burst open, tendrils of flesh latching onto Clennon and assimilating him. Just like it had done before, the flesh creature broke down its victim's body, making it a new part of itself, a grotesque mass of limbs and bloody matter, littered with the discarded faces of those it had infected. The research team looked at it terrified, their stomachs turning, disgusted at the growing, growling abomination of bodies fused to one another. Oh, you're beautiful. Russell heard a voice whisper behind him. He turned to see Botten, looking at the SCP-610 creature and smiling. Researcher David was the closest, and the creature lunged at him, pulling his leg out from under him. Screaming in fear, the researcher fell onto the ground and was dragged towards the flesh. It pulled him in, his body stretching, skin tearing and bones snapping as he became part of it. 
a new set of limbs added to the monster. Dr. Carpenter went to try and pull him free, but it was already too late, and he stepped back, knowing that if he touched it, he would be infected too. The sound of running caught Russell's attention, and he spotted Botten making a break for it. Grabbing Dr. Carpenter by the sleeve, the researcher pulled him in the same direction, partly running away from the flesh as it assimilated David, and partly chasing the Sarkic saboteur. The pair of them quickly caught up to Botten, leaning over himself and panting breathlessly. Thank God you two made it, he wheezed after the run. I can't believe David could do this to unleash this nightmare upon us, Russell thought to snap at him to scream how dare he keep lying, but Botten's back was to him now. He'd never get a better chance. There was a cabinet on the corridor wall containing a fire axe for emergencies. As carefully and quietly as he could, Russell fished the axe out of its case whilst Botten and Carpenter were looking away. We should get the foundation to lift the lockdown, Botten was saying. They need to let us out and then- oh! Oh! He let out a blood-curdling scream mid-sentence as the axe blade wounded him. Russell pulled it back, standing over the doctor as he fell to the floor in agony. Russell, have you lost your mind? Carpenter exclaimed. No, doctor. He's the cultist. I have no idea how he tricked Clennon, but that flesh creature exists because of him, the researcher answered. From the floor, unable to move thanks to his injury, Dr. Botten began to laugh. It took me years to infiltrate the Foundation. So much time waiting to gain access to that blessed flesh, he glowed. And now you've helped me to refine it, to create its ultimate form. You want to kill me? Go ahead, Russell. Oh, my life doesn't matter. For once that creature is free, it will bring about a new age of flesh, and Grand Carcist Iron will reward me for the role I played in unleashing it. David was right, Carpenter realized. But you, you planted that book on him to throw us off. Doctor, we need to think of something, researcher Russell interjected, axe still in hand. Nobody knows more about the flesh that hates than us. There must be a way to kill that thing. Otherwise, if it gets out of this lockdown, it could spread to everyone in the Foundation. What about fire? That's been effective against 610 infectees before, right? Yes. Yes, but... The doctor desperately tried to think. This new being we've created. He created. Russell argued, looking at the grimacing, wounded Botten. We cannot deny the role we've all played in this researcher, Carpenter argued. And we have no idea if it possesses the same weaknesses as the flesh before its refinement. But we have to try, sir! The researcher protested. Of course, I agree. The sickening sound of a slithering slick mass was rapidly approaching. Still laying on the floor in pain, Dr. Botten had been dragged to the middle of a junction, with Carpenter and Russell hiding around either corner. Suddenly, Botten started hollering as the flesh came into view, practically calling it to him. Oh, look at you! He exclaimed. You're better than I could have ever hoped for! Looking down at him with the faces it had collected, the creature stabbed one of its disgusting appendages through Botten, drawing its body into its growing form. I am honored to give my life so that the age of flesh may begin, the doctor said weakly, through the pain as he was infected. From around the corner, Carpenter had taken the sarcic text and set its pages on fire with a cigarette lighter. Turning to the creature, he hurled the mass of burning paper at it, hoping it would be enough fire to spread to the flesh while it was assimilating Botten, who they had left there as bait. The fiery book collided with the monstrosity. As Russell peeked around the corner, he saw the flesh retreating from the flames, Botten's body now added to it. For a moment, it seemed like the creature was afraid of the fire, but slowly it drew nearer and nearer to the book. With ease, it stamped down the flames with Botten's leg, dousing the fire and suffering no damage to it at all. Gripping the axe in his hands, Russell went to charge the creature, only to feel something push him back. Dr. Carpenter had stopped him. Run! He yelled. Instantly, Russell turned and raced down the corridor, the sound of fleshy tentacles whipping through the air. He dared not look back, just in case the monster was right behind him. Eventually, he reached another corner and slammed his back against it, hands shuddering as he held on to the fire axe. He had no idea what had happened to Carpenter. Maybe it got him, or perhaps he had managed to give it the slip at the last second. Russell! Came a hushed voice from around the corner, one the researcher recognized. He turned to see Dr. Carpenter approaching him, sneaking like he was trying to avoid being heard. I think I've managed to give it the slip, the doctor whispered. For a second, Russell backed up, his hands tightening around the axe handle. This might have looked like Dr. Carpenter, but was it? Are you really you, doctor? He asked. Of course I am, Carpenter replied. You don't think that... I'm not that monstrosity. Russell raised the axe defensively, only to notice the sadness in the doctor's face. Unable to bring himself to swing, even to find out, 
The researcher lowered his weapon. Carpenter looked grateful. Come on, let's get them to lift this lockdown, he said. I'm sure an MTF can step in and take care of our mistake. As the pair of them cautiously made their way towards one of the locked doors, Dr. Carpenter reached out a hand to place it on Russell's shoulder. Even before she was a fully-fledged doctor, Kate Barker always had a fascination for the outdoors. Growing up, being out among nature felt like she was connected to the wider world, one part of a larger whole. She intuited from a very young age that the Earth had a system in place, full of millions if not billions of parts that all worked together in the hopes of achieving perfect balance. Humans, animals, and insects. Right down to the germs that were so small they couldn't be seen unless under a microscope. And then, of course, there were the plants, trees, flowers, and all manner of other flora that provided the world with so much more than making it look beautiful. And it was so much so that a young Kate wanted to devote her life to helping maintain our beautiful little blue and green planet and understand every part of it. The way she did that changed as the years went on. As a child, it was learning how trees take in carbon dioxide and water, then use the sun's energy to feed themselves and produce oxygen through a process known as photosynthesis. Then, in high school, Kate was writing and giving presentations on the importance of protecting the environment and conserving wildlife, trying to convince her classmates to see the world in the same way she did. By the time college rolled around, that protection took on a seemingly more proactive form, standing out on picket lines in protest when the college announced it would be chopping down its nearby woods to expand the campus. Eventually, she was made Dr. Kate Barker and awarded her PhD in Botany and Plant Science. She thought that would be when the real work began. Having climbed her way up to achieving her degree was only the first step. The next would involve working tirelessly to keep the world's greenery alive. After all, Kate had studied for years, learning about anything and everything to do with plant life, their different functions and structures, how each species had evolved and could be classified, and how they all formed part of the planet's ecosystem. Unfortunately, even for those with the noblest of intentions, the harsh, unforgiving laws of reality can tend to get in the way. In Kate's case, that came in the form of being snapped up for a job at a genetic research company. Sure, on the one hand, she did get to rely on all the information she had learned on her way to earning her PhD, but on the downside, all Kate got to use her knowledge for was receiving and tending to various plant samples. Getting asked occasionally to run tests on said samples was about the pinnacle of excitement in her job. Somehow, despite working with plants, Dr. Barker couldn't help but feel further away from nature than she had ever been. That was until an unusual specimen was brought to her department for analysis, something unlike anything Kate had seen in all her years of research and study. Although she didn't know it at the time, this unique plant would bring Dr. Barker closer to nature in a way she could never have imagined, because it was a sample of SCP-306. Of course, at the time, and even after the plant's anomalous properties began to take effect, Kate was completely unaware of this. When it was first brought to her lab, it seemed like just an ordinary fungus. No one had been able to successfully identify it, however. But if anyone could, Dr. Kate Barker was perhaps the best qualified person. Where was it found? She asked the lab technician as he handed her the sample secured in a sealed airtight container. Pretty close to here, apparently, the lab tech replied. Louisiana swamps are always full of mushrooms and stuff like this, right? Yes, that's true. There are quite a few different fungi native to Louisiana. Kate answered instinctively, like her brain was on autopilot. She was more focused on examining the sample in the box than the conversation. Uh, thing is, no one knows what kind this is, or if it's dangerous. I heard a rumor the locals used to call it frog rock, but apparently that was an older name for it, the technician added, garnering a little more than a mumble of agreement from the doctor of botany. Kate placed the clear perspex container near the window, letting the natural light of the outdoors give her a better look at what was inside. It was a portion of a dead tree, its bark soggy and darkened from the swamp water. Growing out of its side was a cluster of the mysterious fungus in question, looking more like pustules or a cyst, a tumor growing out of the dead wood, as if it had drained the bigger plant of all of its life. Kate's next few hours were spent taking samples of the fungus, keeping her hands and face covered as she scraped away parts of it to examine under her microscope. There was little abnormal about it on a cellular level, nothing in testing to suggest that the sample was toxic or directly harmful. All Kate could decipher about the plant was that it was related to a certain genus of fungi, known as Trichophyton, 
which includes the same parasitic varieties of fungus that can cause athlete's foot, ringworm, and similar infections in humans. Still unable to fully identify the species, Kate decided to take a closer look at how it was growing. Putting the container behind a safety screen, she opened it up and began to pull apart the sodden tree bark with her gloved hands. There was definitely some kind of mass underneath the bark, what Kate initially assumed to be the wood of the tree that the fungus had taken root to. Nothing could have prepared her for how wrong she was. As the bark split apart and crumbled away, it revealed what was underneath, a cottontail swamp rabbit. The fungi took on even more of a tumor-like appearance when Dr. Barker saw that it was actually growing out of the rabbit's back, having actually taken root within the poor creature's body. As much as the sight of it was profoundly upsetting, even a little sickening, the scientists and Kate knew that this was all just part of nature taking its course. Once she got over the initial shock, it was even a little fascinating. Her botanical expertise was second to none, and through that knowledge, she knew that more fungi grew in damp conditions, but she had never seen any genus grow from the biological matter of another organism dead nor alive. Could this mystery species grow in any biomass, even in a human being? Worried about that possibility, Kate went to store the SCP-306 sample until further testing could be conducted. As she placed it back in the container, her hand nudged one of the fungi's bulbs, causing it to expel a wisp of tiny spores. Not that she could see them, of course. They were microscopically small, but as they drifted through the air, the spores were drawn to Kate, up and towards where she was steadily breathing. The minute the spores slipped undetected into her airway, Dr. Barker immediately began coughing, feeling a disgusting, earthy tang at the back of her throat. She couldn't stop spluttering, instinctively raising her hand to cover her mouth. Her rubber gloves were still covering her fingers, coating in even more invisible residue from the fungus, and now Kate was unknowingly breathing in more. Excusing herself from work from the rest of the day, Dr. Kate Barker went home feeling sicker and sicker as every minute passed. A fever was rapidly climbing, limbs were shuddering, and still she couldn't stop coughing and spluttering as she tried to expel a foul, lingering sensation that refused to leave her throat. But those weren't even the worst symptoms. Two days had come and gone since the incident at the lab, and Kate still hadn't returned to her job. How could she? She felt awful and looked far worse. Large lesions had started appearing on her skin, rapidly turning into warts. Just looking at them made Kate's stomach turn, and on a few occasions, poking at them and feeling these alien lumps on her skin caused her to vomit. Every night she would go to bed, her body rapidly switching from sweltering hot, then becoming cold enough to cause Kate to shiver uncontrollably. At first it looked like the lesions were clearing, falling away from her skin soon after they had fully formed into warts. But the fleeting bit of hope that gave her was quickly wiped away when new ones started to grow in their place. This didn't just feel like the flu, or any other type of sickness for that matter. It felt painful on the deepest, tiniest level. During what little restless sleep she did get, Kate kept having nightmares about doctors looking at her cells under a microscope, watching them changing into… something else. It had been over two weeks since she had first been exposed to SCP-306's spores, and still, she hadn't been well enough to get back to work. Each time Kate had called the Human Resources Department to inform them that she still wasn't any better, they always came out with the same advice. Drink plenty of fluids, try to eat, and keep your strength up. Dr. Barker hadn't stopped eating or drinking, albeit at a very slightly reduced rate. Her appetite had been sapped, along with most of her energy, although she had noticed that she dropped a significant amount of weight in an alarmingly short amount of time. Three weeks later, Kate flicked on the bathroom light and barely recognized herself. Not only was she no longer at a healthy weight, but her skin. Something was very wrong with her skin. She had developed an abnormal pigmentation, a yellowish-greenish hue, almost like she had somehow developed jaundice. But to the touch, it felt a strange, almost rubbery texture. In fact, if she hadn't felt so sick, Kate would have noticed that her skin wasn't absorbing water the way it was used to either, displaying the same type of permeability as the skin of most amphibians. Two months had gone past, and nobody at the research company had heard a word from Kate. She wasn't answering her phone. A few of them were asked to go to her apartment to check on her, but she never came to the door either. None of them had any idea what had happened. They certainly didn't know about the changes that her body had undergone, and none of them painlessly either. 
The constant pain Kate had been feeling had gradually built and built, until it felt like parts of her body were twisting and contorting against her will and in unnatural ways. With the grinding feeling of her bones pulling each other as they shrank, her limbs were racked with unbearable agony. At the same time, her stomach had shrunk to the point where she wasn't even able to eat anymore. The same reduction was occurring to the rest of her organs, too. Heart, liver, lungs, brain. Everything was getting smaller, shrinking organs imprisoned within the skeleton that was also decreasing in size. Then, one morning, the pain had seemingly stopped. After a night spent screaming in sheer agony, tears streaming down her face, Kate woke up on the floor of her apartment under a pile of her clothes. But as she awoke, she instantly noticed something. Everything looked bigger. The whole room towered above her like she had been reduced down to the size of something much smaller than a human. She tried opening her mouth to say something, anything, but her lips couldn't form words anymore. Her arms felt strange, too, like their reach was somehow much shorter. The same with her legs that were now tucked under her body, her tiny, rubbery-skinned body. SCP-306 had turned her into a frog. It took Kate almost an entire day to figure out how to properly move around, first needing a long time to emotionally process what had happened to her. If she had still been able to, she would have been sick and cried endlessly, wailing on the floor. Instead, when she tried to make any noise, a tiny croak was all that emanated from the back of her hoarse throat. But before she could find a way to leave her apartment, something else found their way in. From way down on the floor, the men in their white hazard suits looked colossal, impossibly tall. Kate tried her best to dodge between the thick soles of their heavy boots as they came crashing down towards her from above, each one having enough force behind it to crush her in an instant. She leaped out of the way of one descending boot, only to be caught mid-air in a glass container. As the lid screwed tightly shut, sealing her inside, Kate was lifted up and saw a patch of the hazmat uniforms of the men that had come to take her away, a black circle with three arrows pointing in towards its center and an outline surrounding it. The Foundation put her in a glass tank with eleven other frogs, each of them looking almost identical to Kate, all climbing over each other fighting for their own space in the tiny enclosure. From the moment she arrived, Kate could see the same thing in their gaze as they could see in hers. Sadness unmistakable even in those dark, beady little eyes. These were people, or at least they had been human beings at some point, but now anything on the outside that had made them unique, their individuality, had been taken away, and their minds had all been locked inside the same frog-shaped body as Kate now found herself in. Over the next few months, the Foundation had their scientists running a series of tests on the frogs, who were now all categorized under the collective designation of SCP-306-1. Even though she was unable to speak, Kate recognized their methodical scientific process, how they would test one or two of the frogs at a time, note the results, then change a variable and repeat the test to see if there were any changes. It was the same process she used to go through every time a new sample arrived at her lab. Watching the researchers reminded her of her old job, the life she'd worked so hard for, and was cruelly reminded that it was all gone now. Nobody would ever know where she went. She'd never be able to go out amongst nature in the way that she had always loved. <laughs> Kate had long since figured out the root cause of her transformation. A while after she had started to feel sick, she'd wonder if that strange fungus had anything to do with it. Seeing all the Foundation scientists and guards in their hazmat gear, only handling the other frogs with thick rubber gloves seemed to prove her theory right, and suggested that she and her fellow amphibians were still infectious. Still, she currently had no way of communicating with the Foundation personnel about what had caused her to change, although they seemed as if they already knew. Most of the tests involved the researchers putting Kate and the other frogs into mazes or making them solve puzzles or memorizing commands. Naturally, having once been human, they all picked it up quicker than the researchers expected. From their perspective, these frogs were displaying an extremely advanced form of intelligence. Gradually, the testing progressed, and the Foundation's researchers began attempting to teach the frog specimens to read and write, all skills that they had already possessed, even if some of them needed some time to learn how to hold a pen in their new sticky fingers. Kate herself was made to complete an IQ test, scoring 127 points. Now that she had a way to communicate with these scientists through writing notes, she and the other SCP-306-1s were asked their names. That was the moment the Foundation realized what they were. 
These weren't just frogs, but human beings who were now trapped in the bodies of frogs. Perhaps inspired by this human-to-frog transformation, or possibly as some cruel joke, one of the Foundation researchers, who went by the name Thompson, brought in a children's book and presented it to the collection of SCP-306-1 specimens. At first, Kate enjoyed the simplicity of the stories, and it seemed her fellow frogs did as well, but gradually they all grew depressed. Maybe one of the stories featuring a prince being turned from a frog back into human form, while the twelve remaining specimens had yet to be presented with a magical cure for their condition. Or perhaps seeing something as simple as a children's book reminded some of the frogs of all they were still to do in their old lives, like starting families, and now they wouldn't get the chance. Kate and some of the other frogs began writing notes to Thompson and another of the researchers who had been feeding them, Phyllis. They did their best to be reasonable with the Foundation, but also communicate how desperately they wanted to be set free. You have no right to keep us here, Kate wrote, under the towering stare of Phyllis and Thompson, feeling for the first time in a long while that she was actively doing something to make a difference in nature. We need to be out in the world. We need to be free. If she had more space on the paper, she would have tried to note down suggestions of places the frogs could be introduced, where they wouldn't pose any risk of disrupting the local ecosystem. The swamps of Louisiana, where the SCP-306 fungus had been found, were one such idea that came to mind. But much to Dr. Kate Barker's disappointment, she and her fellow frogs would only cause the fungi's infectious properties to spread, meaning their pleas with the Foundation fell on deaf ears. There was no other choice, nothing else they could do. They needed to break out. As night fell, Kate organized the frogs, gradually writing out instructions for how they were going to escape, communicating with them the same way she had with the researchers. Only this time, the others listened. Even if they couldn't be human again, they didn't want to live the rest of their short lifespans being locked up and tested forever. Kate marked down the time that Thompson and Phyllis usually fed the frogs and drew up a detailed strategy. If she could hide for long enough under the others, it might make it seem like one of the specimens was missing. The next day, researcher Thompson and researcher Phyllis arrived to feed the SCP-306-1 specimens, accompanied by security guards as always. While her colleague went to collect the feed for her to administer, Phyllis did a count of the frogs, 11. She counted again, only to get the same result. There was one missing. As she leaned closer to the tank, Kate trusted her fellow amphibians above to follow the plan. In a flash, the mass of frogs had leaped from their containment and pinned Phyllis to the ground as one. The room erupted into chaos. People turned frogs leaping in all directions as they scattered and made a mad dash for freedom. A gunshot rang out from one of the security guards trying to subdue the creatures, only for the stray shot to catch researcher Thompson in the neck, killing him. Leading the charge on her tiny rubbery legs, Kate jumped closer and closer to the exit. It was so close. If she could just get far enough away, she might finally be free to get back to nature. The tiny carnivorous snowmen are relentless, sharp fangs dripping with blood as they crawl en masse towards the mobile task force, opening fire on them with their assault rifles. Who would have guessed that a mere hour or two earlier, a young boy was joyfully playing around in the snow here? How had things gone from frosty to freaky so fast? Let's rewind the clock. There was a chill in the air, that lingering, biting cold that would gnaw at your exposed skin if you dared to step outside in anything less than a thick, warm coat for protection. The ground was still coated in a heavy snowfall, a holdover from Christmas just past, weather that had refused to let up well into the early days of the new year. Everyone reaches an age where the cynicism of life, the weight of expectations that keep you anchored in the real world, they all coalesce to rob you of the childlike wonder of the snow. As you get older, the snow loses its novelty. It becomes a source of inconvenience, something that you need to shovel off the driveway to take your car out. Whereas, turn the clock back to youth, and it's like a tiny miracle. It coats your whole world in a clean blanket of freezing frost turning the ordinary into a wonderland. Robert and Michaela Anderson were glad that their son Michael was still at an age where he could enjoy the snow. After all, Michaela getting to take her son out in his sled or seeing him hurling snowballs at Robert was able to provide them with a little bit of warmth during the freezing cold, snowier months in Missouri. Optimism was never enough to melt the snow, however, and maybe that's what drew in those creatures, the snowmen. 
It was early 2019, not even a full two weeks into the year. By now, Michael had gotten used to the fact that after Christmas and New Year's Day, a begrudging return to school would soon follow. As much as it clearly brought down his mood, nothing lifted his spirits like still getting to be out in the snow. And after a long day of helping his mom take down the tinsel and pack up the lights while his dad disposed of the tree, Michael was itching to go outside. Please, mom? He begged as a box of decorations was placed back in the attic. His hands clasped together in a pleading gesture. Please, 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 just five minutes. I, I won't go further than the front yard. Michaela sighed partly from exhaustion, but a smile crept onto her face. It was hard not to find her son's love for the snow endearing. All right, but only for five minutes, she insisted firmly. And I want to see gloves, hat, and a scarf, not just a coat, mister. With the speed and excitement that she and her husband had long since lost, she watched Michael race off to gather his warmest winter coat. Remember when we were like that? Robert heaved a sigh as he appeared from chopping up that dried out, dehydrated remains of the Christmas tree. No, do you? Michaela replied with a light chuckle. Before long, Michael had donned his gloves and coat, almost a size too big. His scarf was almost wrapping up his entire head, save for the little bobble hat that poked out at the top. Robert opened up the front door, and his son stepped out into a world that had been whitewashed with clear, cold snow. Given that the Andersons lived on a small street in Grain Valley, there weren't many other people around, especially not with another flurry of snowfall moving closer in the clouds up above. But it wasn't the next snowfall that the residents of Grain Valley, Missouri should have been worrying about. It was the previous one, the one that had already fallen and what was now hiding among the snow in the Anderson family's front yard. Having few other kids his own age to play with and not being allowed to venture too far from the front porch, Michael was content to spend his precious time outdoors making snow angels or practicing throwing snowballs. He had long been trying to get one to clear the roof of the small house he and his parents shared, leaving a few scattered patches of snow embedded on the roof shingles. A few meters from the front door stood a snowman, Granted, that was hardly a rare sight at this time of year, especially in the cold weather, but what was so unusual about it was that Michael hadn't remembered making a snowman recently. His parents hadn't let him out in the snow on his own since the start of the new year, given how badly the downfall and icy winds had been for the first week of January. Sure, somebody else could have made it, taking a pause as they passed by the Andersons' front yard, although not Michael nor either of his parents had spotted anyone doing that. The snowman itself was featureless, the white of its ice-cold body smeared with mud and dead leaves, debris that had been packed in with the snow used in its crude construction. It was featureless, too. Whoever had made it hadn't gone to the effort of giving it a face, nor draped an old scarf over it or given it a hat. It just stood there, but not like any other snowman. There was nothing welcoming about it. In fact, it was, fittingly, cold. Given how far away it stood, it was almost as if it was watching the house. Curiously, Michael began to approach the snowman. Being only nine years old, his imagination was immediately running with the possibility that this snow and mulch construct could be alive, much akin to the likes of Frosty the Snowman. Little did young Michael Anderson know that he wasn't far away from the truth. Although this particular snowman wasn't quite the happy, jolly soul, from the much-covered holiday song. He hadn't got that much closer to the snowman when he heard something move nearer to where he stood. There was the rustle of leaves and the snapping of small twigs coming up from a bush next to him. Michael couldn't see what it was, but it was far too low to the ground and too close to the house for it to be a bird. Maybe a possum or raccoon had gotten trapped in the thin branches and was now scrambling to try and free itself. Diverting from approaching the snowman, he walked closer to the plant. As he did, the rustling got louder, more frantic, almost hungry. There wasn't just one creature lurking out of sight beneath the leaves, but lots of somethings. Robert and Michaela had been sitting indoors watching the TV when they heard a spine-chilling scream coming from outside. Instantly, they were both up on their feet, racing toward the front door. Robert threw it open and Michael dashed inside in floods of fearful tears. What happened, sweetie? Michaela asked, concerned, brushing snowflakes from her son's coat. Are you okay? Did you slip? Through crying and sniffling, shaking uncontrollably with how afraid he was.